G.I. Joe was the fully posable modern army figure. It said so right on the packaging. What do armies have a lot of? Tanks. Yeah, welcome. G.I. Joe would have plenty of tanks, right? Well, not as many as you would expect. Sure, they gave us lots of vehicles that were almost like tanks, but not quite. But G.I. Joe's true tanks were few and far between. This week we are going back to the beginning, 1982, to remind ourselves that this is the heart of G.I. Joe. Everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here. This is the show where we review every vintage G.I. Joe toy from 1982 to 1994. And this week we are looking at an original, an innovator, a classic. We're going to look at G.I. Joe's first tank, the Mobat. This is also a redo. I reviewed the Mobat a long time ago, and I think I can do a better job of it now, so I'm taking another crack at it. Reviews of 1982 toys are never very popular. That first year of G.I. Joe may seem kind of dull compared to later years. There was a lot of green. There was a lot of green. But it made Hasbro a lot of green, if you know what I mean. It's important to always remember our roots. By knowing where we came from, we can better understand where we are and where we're going. For me, looking at 1982 is getting back to G.I. Joe's roots. It's a search for the heart of G.I. Joe. I have a lot more information in this review than I did in the first one. I can show you a lot more than the Mobat. I can show you a mini Mobat, and a micro Mobat, and a model Mobat. That's a lot of M's. HCC 788 presents, again, the Mobat Tank. This is the 1982 and 1983 G.I. Joe Tank Commander, codenamed Steeler, and the Mobat Tank. This figure and vehicle set were available first in 1982. They were re-released in 1983 with some slight modifications. They were also available in 1984 and were discontinued for 1985. The Mobat is motorized and battery-powered and will really move on real rubber tank treads. In 1982, the Mobat included the Straight Arm Steeler version 1. I will explain what Straight Arm means in the articulation section of this video. In 1983 and 1983, in 1984, the tank included Steeler version 1.5, the so-called swivel arm figure, which had updated articulation. Steeler version 1.5 was available as a mail-away offer from Hasbro Direct from 1986 to 1990 without the Mobat tank. Surplus figures were sold at the 1994 G.I. Joe convention. The Jocon Steeler had a special convention file card and a convention command ring. Steeler was available in one form or another through nearly the entire vintage era. Despite this, there were no other versions of Steeler in the vintage G.I. Joe toy line. There were a few post-vintage versions. We're going to take a close look at Steeler later in this video, but I'm going to set him aside for now so we can take a closer look at the Mobat. 1982 was the first year of the new G.I. Joe, so the Mobat was G.I. Joe's first tank. In the later years, they had a habit of giving us vehicles that were sort of like tanks, but not really tanks, such as the 1980s. 86 Havoc. They did give us a few proper tanks, though. Precious few. In 1983, there was an approximation of a tank, the 1983 Wolverine with Driver Cover Girl. As much as I like this vehicle, it's not exactly a tank. It's more of an armored missile platform. The replacement for the Mobat in 1985 was the G.I. Joe Mauler and Driver Heavy Metal. Like the Mobat, the Mauler was motorized and battery powered. It's also larger and has has more features, it is in many ways an upgrade from the Mobat. Also in 1985, G.I. Joe introduced a mini tank, the Armadillo. It was not motorized and had fewer features, but it was also more affordable and it gave kids a chance to have a G.I. Joe tank at a lower price point. Mobat is an acronym for Motorized Battle Tank. The name is intended to showcase the motorized feature of the toy. Of course, any real tank would be motorized, so 
it would be unnecessary to point that out. On the blueprints, it's referred to as Super Duty Battle Tank, in parentheses Mobat. And in the first issue of the G.I. Joe comic book published by Marvel Comics, on the back cover... It's referred to as multi ordnance Battle Tank, codename Mobat. The Mobat was designed by Wayne Luther for Hasbro, the same person who designed the Sky Striker. As for a real-world inspiration for this tank, there isn't a single exact match. The main body is similar to the M60 Patton tank. The turret may be based on the prototype MBT-70. Mark Belomo's Ultimate Guide to G.I. Joe says it's based on the M60 and M48 Patton, and that may be true, but that turret looks a lot like the MBT-70. The designers at Hasbro like to base G.I. Joe vehicles on real experimental vehicles. The Vamp had a similar kind of inspiration, so I wouldn't be surprised if the designers borrowed a turret from the prototype MBT-70. The mold for the Mobat was used one other time in the U.S. during the vintage era. It was used for for the Sears exclusive CAT, the Crimson Attack Tank. It was a Cobra vehicle instead of G.I. Joe. Outside the U.S., it was used for an all-black Canadian exclusive Cobra tank. There was a version of the Mobat released for Action Force in the U.K., the Z-Force Battle Tank. It was in a lighter shade of green, and it included the Z-Force version of Steeler. The Mobat was made into a miniature die-cast vehicle produced by Aviva in 1983. The color is not quite right, but it does capture a lot of the details of the toy pretty well. The die-cast Mobat may seem small, but there was one made even smaller. In 1991, there was a Micro Mobat that was part of the G.I. Joe Micro Vehicles collection. The Mobat was produced as a model kit by Revel. Revel did three model kits of early G.I. Joe vehicles, the Mobat, the Vamp, and the Ram Motorcycle. They were very similar in appearance to the toys, but they were in a slightly smaller scale. These were produced in 1982 according to the copyright stamp. This Revel model kit is pretty awesome. I just got it shortly before filming this review. The pieces are all here and it's unassembled. I'm considering doing an on-camera build of this. I have the instruction sheet and the blueprints for the Mobat and I will be referring to this when I talk about some of the features on the toy. These blueprints are kind of unique in that it also includes features of the figure's visor, and it's very unusual to have the figure's accessory on the blueprints. In the Marvel miniseries G.I. Joe Order of Battle issue number four, there is a page for the Mobat in which some of the features are described, but the information in here is different from what's on the blueprints. For example, under armament it says it has a 90 millimeter anti-tank cannon with 105 rounds, whereas on the blueprints, it says it has a 130 millimeter cannon slash sensor web. Where there is a difference between order of battle and the blueprints, I will refer to the blueprints to describe the toy. Let's take a look at the parts and the features of the Mobat. The Mobat's main body is in green. It looks like kind of a medium green to me. It's not exactly an olive drab green. It looks a little darker than that to my eye. It's hyper detailed and looks really great, but it can only fit one action figure. It has no foot pegs, it has no space for a driver, it only has space for one gunner, or in this case the tank commander, and he has to stand up with half of his body outside of the tank. If we move the turret to the side, we can see a couple small hatches and what the blueprints call a viewport right here. Now these hatches are far too small to accommodate an action figure, and even if they were large enough, the battery compartment for the vehicle is directly under these hatches, so there's no space there for an action figure anyway. This is where the driver should sit, but you can't fit a figure in there, so you just have to have Steeler drive the tank from the top turret. On the front starboard side, these blocks here are what the blueprints call track repair kit and spare tracks, and they are molded to look like the treads on the tank. So if the treads were damaged in battle, you could use these and pretend to repair it. There's a massive amount of detail on the body of the tank including this tow cable which is molded in and non-removable and I'm really glad it is because on later vehicles such as the Wolverine the tow cable was removable 
and this became a frequently lost or broken part. There's a tray with some molded in tools, including what looks like an entrenching tool, and there's another tool kit on the other side with what looks like uh, wire cutters and a wrench. These minute details really add to the character of the toy. There's an armored skirt on each side that helps protect the tank tread as well as anyone inside the tank, and I think that looks great. It really beefs up the look of the vehicle. Behind the turret there are some vents and an engine turbine, all exceptional details which I love. At the very back there is a grill and a universal tow hitch. This can be used to tow one of G.I. Joe's weapon systems and in 1982 the obvious choice would have been the HAL heavy artillery laser with operator Grand Slam. Uh, you can just connect it to that universal tow hitch. I think the Howl looks great with the Mobat. It has a subtly contrasting green color, and it can add some firepower as well. The main turret, the cannon, the top turret, and the machine gun are all in that same green color, and this is where a little color variation may have helped. Now, I like the color, but uh, changing the color up a little bit may have helped bring out some of those amazing details. The main turret will rotate 360 degrees. The cannon will scrape the body of the tank, but it will turn. The cannon can elevate a little bit, but not very much. And the barrel of the cannon can collapse for more convenient storage. This main cannon, the blueprints describe as a 130 millimeter cannon, and attached to it is this box with a black sticker in the front. And the blueprints describe this as a tungsten spotlight slash laser guidance. On the aft starboard side of the turret, there is what the blueprints describe as the main hatch. It is obviously non-functioning. You can't open that. It's only molded in. And even if you could, it's too small to fit an action figure in there anyway. At the very tippy top, there is what the blueprints describe as the command turret with drive controls. And it has a cup in which the action figure stands. You just place an action figure in like so. And at the bottom, there is a divider between the figure's feet. Uh, it has a couple control knobs, and these knobs are short and small, and you can't really place them in the action figure's hands. You can place the hands on the control knobs, but they're not really designed to go in the hand. At the front of the command turret is a 50 caliber machine gun, and the tip of this gun is removable, and this is a frequently missing and easily lost part. This machine gun tip has a slot, and there's a variation of this in which the slot continues all all the way down to the base. This one has a slot that stops about halfway. This slot lines up with a notch on the machine gun post. You just line that up and press it on, and that's how you attach it. It doesn't snap in place though, so it's easily removable, and that's why this thing gets lost so frequently. The machine gun does not elevate at all, and there's limited rotation on that command turret, but there's a reason for that. This command turret is used as the control for the motorized mechanism, and I will demonstrate that later in this review. Let's take a look at these real treads that will really move this tank. They are black, or you might call this a very dark gray. They are rubbery, and they roll along these green bogies. And there's a variation on these treads that we need to look at. The earliest releases of the Mobat had treads like this. They're still made out of that same black rubbery material. There's a track along the inside for the teeth on the drive bogey. But there's a risk that these treads will slip in rough terrain. Later releases, probably in 1983, changed the treads and put notches on the treads all the way down. Uh, and those notches run through these teeth on the front and the back bogey, and this would prevent those treads from slipping. Because these treads now feed through these teeth, both the back and the front bogies have been updated as well uh, to accommodate that feature. These updated treads are no doubt more functional, but I prefer the look of the older treads. It's just a cleaner look, 
plus the extra treads on the body of the tank more closely match these older treads than the newer ones. On the underside of the tank, there's no real detail at all. Located at the front is the battery cover. To remove it, there's a tab at the front. You just press down and forward at the same time, and it will slide forward and off. There are some variations on this battery cover as well, so you may run into that. And the battery cover has a connector attached to it, so the tank will not operate without the battery cover. Behind that cover, there is space for two D-size batteries. These are really large batteries, uh, but they can pop in like so. And then to replace the battery cover, uh, you just have to make sure you line up these uh, slots with those notches and uh, line them up and then press back and down until it clicks into place. Those batteries add a lot to the weight of this tank. It is a lot heavier. The Mobat is pretty to look at, but it's time for us to take this outside and see if it can move. Let's demonstrate how the motorized feature works. I have two D batteries in the battery compartment, and this is a good opportunity to remind everyone to not store the vehicle with the batteries in. Uh, the batteries could corrode the connectors and then your tank won't work anymore. So make sure you take the batteries out when not in use. Use. To control the motor, you just use the top turret. By pushing the turret forward, you will cause the tank to roll forward. So just push it forward, and there it goes. You can also control the direction. You can cause the tank to turn right by turning the turret to the right, or to the left by turning the turret to the left. And my tank has a harder time turning left. Oh, hold on. There it goes. To stop it, just put the turret back in the center position and that will stop the tank. The Mobat will also move in reverse. Just push the turret back and that will cause it to move backwards. And it has directional control so you can move it, you can turn it as well in reverse. Let's look at the Mobat's ability to climb over obstacles because it is advertised as having super climbing action. Uh, here's where we run into a slight design flaw. Uh, because of the battery cover in the front, it doesn't have a lot of clearance for the tracks in the, tr in the front. So if you roll it toward an object, it will it'll get stopped. Unfortunately, it can't really climb very well going forward. It does still have super climbing action though, because it has more clearance for those treads in the back. So if you roll the Mobat toward an obstacle in reverse, like so, it will climb over it pretty well. It actually climbs quite well in reverse. It may seem amazing that G.I. Joe got a motorized tank in the first wave of the 1982 relaunch, but the Mobat was relatively featureless compared to toy tanks of earlier decades. For example, the Tiger Joe tank. That thing had all the features of the Mobat and then some. It had a wired remote control, it had an automatic rotating machine gun, it had real firing shells, it was big enough to roll over your mom's car. The Mobat seems basic by comparison. I'm sure cost was a factor, G.I. Joe vehicles needed to be affordable to the average family. Even so, I can't help but imagine what the Mobat would have been like with more of Tiger Joe's features. Now let's look at Steeler. His name is likely inspired by the football team, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Steeler's birthplace is Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, so it would make sense for him to be named after his hometown team. Version 1 was released in 1982 and was a straight arm figure, meaning it had arm articulation only at the shoulder and elbow. Version 1.5 was released in 1983 and had swivel arm battle grip. There was a new point of articulation, a swivel at the bicep. He also had a new slimmer waist piece. I must point out this figure is very fragile. It's made of light green plastic and the light green plastic that was used in 1982 is notoriously brittle. Steeler doesn't have quite the bad reputation as Zap, but I have seen arms snap off just from moving it. Don't move this figure around any more than necessary. 
I will not place the figure on a stand or move the joints to show articulation. The hands on the 1983 figure are not quite as bad as the 82 figure, so I don't mind putting a weapon in his hands carefully. But on that 82 figure, I would not do that. As you can see, there's already a thumb snapped off on this one. Let's take a look at Steeler's accessories, and let's start with his helmet, because his helmet has a pretty amazing attachment. I'm going to remove the helmet carefully without putting any extra pressure on the plastic of the figure. And the helmet has this large black visor. I'm going to remove that because I'm going to look at that in a moment. I want to look at the helmet for now. Uh, the helmet is light green. Um, it's the same helmet that came with Zap from the same year. And it was reissued a few other times later. The helmet is very plain and standard. It has holes in the side. And that is for attachments like the visor that was included with Steeler. There are pegs on the visor that fit in the holes on the side of the helmet. And there you go. Now there's a visor attached, and that's a very hefty visor. It's really big. It's almost the size of the helmet itself. The visor is dark gray, almost black. It is very well detailed, and when attached to the helmet, it can be down over Steeler's eyes, or it can be flipped up. There's information about the helmet on the blueprints for the Mobat. This is a headset, helmet slash binoculars slash camera. It has an infrared lens, zoom control knob, shutter release button, and motor drive. His final accessory is his Uzi submachine gun. It is in dark gray, almost black plastic, and it is very well detailed. This is, in my opinion, the best Uzi in the vintage era. It looks very realistic, almost exactly true to the real weapon. This is the same Uzi that was issued with Snake Eyes from the same year. They just reissued it. They didn't change it. Uh, but there is a variation. Some of those Uzis had sights that were narrow, and others had sights that were wider. Let's take a look at the articulation on Steeler. And I'm not going to move these figures around to show the articulation. There's a good chance I would break them. So instead, I am going to use short fuse from 1982 and 1983. These figures had the same articulation, but more sturdy plastic. So it's safer to show the articulation using these. Both figures could turn their heads left and right. They could not look up and down. No ball jointed neck. They could swing their arms up to the shoulder and swivel at the shoulder all the way around. They had a hinge at the elbow that allowed them to bend their arm at the elbow about 90 degrees. And on the 1982 figures, that's all the articulation they had at the arms. Starting with the 1983 release, there was a new point of articulation, a swivel at the bicep that allowed him to swivel his arm all the way around. These were O-ring figures, meaning the figure was held together with a rubber O-ring that looped around the inside. That allowed him to move at the torso a bit. He could move his legs apart about so far. He could move his leg at the hip about 90 degrees and bend at the knee about 90 degrees. Let's look at the sculpt design and color of Steeler. Many of Steeler's parts were reused from other 1982 figures. There was a lot of parts swapping that year. A lot of figures share a lot of the same parts. Steeler had more unique parts than most other 1982 figures, though. His chest, back, and arms were unique. On his head, he has brown hair. Not much detail on that hair. He has... A a plain expressionless face. In fact, I think he looks kind of bored. Same head on the 1983 figure, but on my 83 Steeler, the brown hair is slightly darker. This head was used several times. In 1982, it was used for Flash, Short Fuse, and Hawk. And in 1987, it was used for Starduster. On his chest, he has a green shirt with a collar that's partially open. You can see his gold undershirt. He has a black strap across his chest and over his left shoulder, and he has a black pistol holster on his chest with a gold pistol in it. Those black strap details do continue to the back. As noted, this back piece and the chest piece are unique. They were not reused for any other 1982 figures. It's not very realistic to have him wearing a gold undershirt, but the gold paint was supposed to make the figure look kind of special. He is the driver of the premium vehicle 
that year. His arms feature long green sleeves, and he has gold bars painted on his upper arms. That represents his rank. He is an officer. That gold paint is not very robust and will rub off very easily, so be cautious about that. On the 1982 figure, on the forearms, there are molded on pockets, one on each side, and he is wearing black gloves. That was changed a bit for the 1983 figure. He no longer has the molded on pockets on the forearms. He has unpainted cuffs, and he still has those black gloves. These arms were reused in 1983 on Wild Bill, the pilot of the Dragonfly helicopter, but Wild Bill's arms do not have any paint on them, so those gloves, instead of being black, are just green. On the 1982 waist piece, there is a wide belt with an H on the belt buckle, and I believe this is a Hasbro brand stamp. On the 1983 figure, there's an updated waist piece that's a bit slimmer, the belt is a bit more detailed, and on the belt buckle, instead of an H, there is the shape of a house, and that looks like Hasbro's logo. His legs are light green, that same light green as the upper half of the body. He has black painted pouches on the outside upper legs, and he has black standard boots. These legs were the same from the 1982 to 1983 figure. Those were not updated. Let's take a look at Steeler's file card. This file card was printed on the back of the box for the Mobat. There is nothing on the other side. It's just blank. It has his faction as G.I. Joe. It has a portrait of Steeler here. It says he is the tank commander, codename Steeler. His file name is Ralph W. Pulaski, primary military specialty armor, secondary military specialty artillery transportation, birthplace Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, and grade is 01. 01 is a second lieutenant, which is the reason for the gold bars on the figure. In 1982, as an officer, he was the second highest ranked member of the team, right behind Hawk, the leader of G.I. Joe. Despite this, Steeler wasn't given any leadership opportunities. That may have been because of his attitude, which we will read about in a moment. This paragraph says, Steeler comes from a blue-collar, middle-class background. He put himself through college on an ROTC scholarship and work as a heavy equipment operator. Familiar and proficient with all NATO and Warsaw Pact AFVs, that's armored fighting vehicles, graduated Army School top of class, special training cadre X AFV project, artillery school, AFV desert exercise, covert ops school, qualified expert M16, M1911A1, MAC-10, and Uzi. Good thing they got the Uzi in there since that's what the figure comes with. This brief character profile at the bottom says young, reckless, often clashes with authority and parentheses superior officers, but he's one tough soldier. If he's clashing with superior officers, that may be why he hasn't been promoted and why he's not a leader on the team. I'd like to know more about his working class background. That wasn't addressed very much in media. That territory was covered more through his teammate Clutch. I like the story of a working class guy who worked his way through college and became an officer. I just want to hear more of that story. Looking at how Steeler and the Mobat were used in G.I. Joe media, both Steeler and the Mobat first appeared in the G.I. Joe A Real American Hero animated miniseries in 1983. Neither had many animated appearances, but Steeler was used more than the Mobat. By 1983 and 1984, there were a lot of new toys to sell, so the Mobat got pushed to the background. Steeler's look was changed for the animated series. He was given blonde hair and a light green shirt. Steeler's most prominent animated appearances were in Worlds Without and Parts 1 and 2, in which he and a handful of other Joes find themselves in an alternate universe where Cobra controls the United States. In a famous scene, Steeler has a panicked freakout when he discovers the dead body of himself from the other universe. Worlds Without End Parts 1 and 2 are often cited as favorite episodes of the animated series, and Steeler was an important part of that. In the G.I. Joe comic book series published by Marvel Comics, the Mobat had a more prominent role, especially in the early issues. Steeler had more appearances too, though his appearances became more sporadic as the series went on. There was even a whole issue dedicated to Steeler and the Mobat called Tanks for the Memories. Despite having a larger role in the comic, Steeler doesn't have a moment as memorable as Worlds Without End. Looking at the Mobat overall, it is both brilliant and lackluster. It is substantial and vacant. It is special 
and ordinary. The Mobat was the premium vehicle in 1982. It was special because it was motorized. It wasn't a cheap toy tank that you would just push around. It would really move. Creating the Mobat required extra effort and engineering. On the other hand, without batteries, the Mobat is a big green paperweight. It doesn't have a way to free roll without the motor engaged. You may not always want to use the motor. You may not always want to keep batteries in it. If that's the case, you'll just have to drag it along the ground. It had the extra feature, yet not enough features. No removable engine cover, no hatch, no seat, no foot pegs, no space for a second figure. The details on the Mobat are exceptional. You could stare at it for an hour, taking in all those minute details. It would have been easy to just make a plain tank with some armor plates on the outside, but they went the extra mile with the Mobat. It has tons of technical detail and it looks great, but it is all green. It's all the same green. There's no color variation at all. There's no paint to pick out those details. From a distance, it looks like just a big block of green. Those intricate details are lost. Steeler is a nice figure, one of the better figures of 1982. He at least had a few unique parts. He had gold paint, he had the holster on his chest. The light green and black paint is a nice contrast. It's too bad Steeler didn't get more attention, and didn't get a second vintage version. I like both the Mobat and Steeler. They're from an era when G.I. Joe knew what it was. It was an era before ninjas and aliens and mutants. It certainly isn't all of G.I. Joe, but if you want to see the roots of G.I. Joe, if you want to see the heart of G.I. Joe, look at the Mobat. That was my review of Steeler and the Mobat. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to take next week off. That's right, two weeks off in September. I can do that. I'll probably still give you some kind of video because that's always what I do. I never really have a week off. I haven't had a real week off in six years. If you like G.I. Joe and you'd like to see more G.I. Joe reviews, make sure you subscribe to this channel. You can find me on social media, on Facebook and Twitter, and I have a website, hcc788.com. If you'd like to support the channel further, I have Patreon. Patreon really does help keep these videos coming. You can get some special perks there, like a sketch by me, a secret codebook to help you decode those messages you see in the videos sometimes. You can get your name in a video like like the people you see scrolling by right now. These guys, these guys make these videos possible. On this channel, 2020 is the year of the 90s. I've been reviewing a lot of 1990s G.I. Joe toys. We've spent the last few weeks in the 80s, but in two weeks we will definitely be getting back to the 90s because that will be the beginning of Ninja Month. I'll see you then. And until then, remember only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe. There is one character you know even if you know nothing else about G.I. Joe. He has been a Hollywood star, a comic book hero, and immortalized in plastic more than any other action figure. He is the man in black, Snake Eyes. Hello everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here. This is the show where we review every vintage G.I. Joe toy from 1982 to 1994. This is a review I wanted to get to for a long time. I have reviewed version 1 Snake Eyes before, twice actually, but those were early videos on this channel and they weren't very good. I want to take another crack at it. Snake Eyes is popular. So popular he has been overexposed. There have been way too many Snake Eyes figures. At times, he has overshadowed the G.I. Joe team. That wasn't always the case. In the beginning, he was just a guy. He was one among the 13 original Joes. What made him special? Snake Eyes may be silent, but we're going to talk a lot about him. HCC 788 presents Snake Eyes. This is Snake Eyes, G.I. Joe's Commando from 1982. As you can see, we have two action figures here, so we will be looking at the 1983 release as well. Version 1 was released in 1982 as part of the first wave of G.I. Joe action figures when the line was relaunched that year. It was only available in 1982. In 1983, it was replaced with version 1.5. All the 1982 version 1 figures were reissued in 1983 with updated articulation 
articulation. The version 1.5 figure was also available in 1984 and was discontinued for 1985. At some point, Snake Eyes was available through Hasbro Direct. This figure was designed by Ron Rudat for Hasbro. The all-black color was a cost-cutting choice. There are zero paint applications on this figure. The money saved on paint sprays could be applied to other figures, such as 1982 Stalker with his camouflage. The characterization of Snake Eyes was done by Larry Hama, the writer of the Marvel comic book. There were six versions of Snake Eyes in the vintage era and dozens of post-vintage versions in every scale. Snake Eyes is the most popular G.I. Joe character. Version 2 was released in 1985. This is the most recognized and replicated design. This version has the visor, a sword, and the wolf companion, Timber. No later vintage versions of Snake Eyes included the wolf. Version Version 3 was released in 1989. This is lesser known, but still a classic with the black and silver. A very good looking figure. Version 4 was issued in 1991. This is a departure from the classic black, adding blue and gray. This version has a lot of fans, but I am not one of them. This doesn't look like Snake Eyes to me. Version 5 was released in 1993 as part of the Ninja Force subset. It was still mostly black with blue highlights. It also had an action feature which limited the articulation. Version 6 was issued in 1994, which was the final year of the vintage G.I. Joe toy line before it was cancelled. It was part of the Shadow Ninjas subset. It was a reissue of version 5 with a color change. Gimmick. 1982 Snake Eyes is listed as a Commando. Actually, the first four versions are all listed as Commando. In the G.I. Joe comic book series, it is revealed that Snake Eyes is a ninja. Is he a Commando or a ninja? I don't know why he has to be one or the other. He is both, and both are important to the character. Commando is a person or unit that specializes in raids in enemy territory. Originally, Commando was used to denote a specialized unit not individuals in that unit. The usage of the word in military parlance originated with the Boer-mounted infantry in the First and Second Boer Wars. A ninja would bring a lot of relevant skills to the role of commando. Snake Eyes is the strong, silent type. In fact, he doesn't speak. An injury on an early G.I. Joe mission disfigured his face and destroyed his vocal cords, so he is unable to speak. He only spoke one word in the comic book, we will get to that later. Snake Eyes is closely associated with the Cobra Ninja Storm Shadow. These action figures are obviously intended to be enemies with the black versus white, but their connection was deeper than that. They are members of the same ninja clan, the Arashakage. I'll cover that in depth when we talk about Snake Eyes' media appearances. The comic book also portrayed Scarlet as a love interest for Snake Eyes. In the animated series, Scarlet was paired with Duke. I am definitely on Team Snake Eyes. The origin of Snake Eyes starts before the creation of G.I. Joe. Larry Hama was developing a special forces unit for Marvel Comics called Fury Force. It was supposed to be led by Nick Fury's son. The comic book was never produced, but some of the ideas were implemented in G.I. Joe. The character Spook evolved into Snake Eyes. Snake Eyes wears a mask, but that wasn't always so. Larry has said he based the look of young Snake Eyes on Bob Light, someone he knew in Vietnam. The name Snake Eyes refers to a pair of dice both landing on one. It is the lowest possible roll and is considered bad luck. Snake Eyes has lived up to his name. Snake Eyes' name is metaphorical. It doesn't have anything to do with snakes or dice. Don't take his name too literally. I'm looking at you, writers of the Snake Eyes G.I. Joe Origins movie. Oops, too late. There were many, many post-vintage versions of Snake Eyes released, and I have one modern era version of the figure here. This is version 28 from 2007. It was in the G.I. Joe Battle Pack with Duke, Scarlet, Roadblock, and Gung Ho. The first thing I notice about this figure is it is gray, not black. That's an odd choice, but the design is clearly meant to evoke that version 1 commando look. For accessories, he includes an Uzi, which is appropriate for 
Snake Eyes and a callback to the version 1 accessory. Not a bad Uzi 2. It looks okay. A little bit modified, uh, just changed a little bit. There's no rear sight and there's also this folding stock on it, but still looks pretty good. He also includes an explosives pack with a strap that goes around the figure, and this is another callback to the version 1 accessory. It's well sculpted with texture and buckles. It even says explosives on it and there's some paint application. That's nice. We rarely got paint on vintage accessories. These modern era figures were able to have more working sheaths for knives and holsters for pistols. This one has a removable knife on the right leg and a removable pistol on the left side of the belt. The final accessory that's intended to be removed is this figure stand. These modern era figures had figure stands with the name printed on them. These modern era figures are slightly taller than vintage figures, averaging closer to four inches rather than three and three quarter inches. He also has updated articulation, so a ball jointed head. Uh, the arms have comparable articulation to the vintage figure, but added wrist articulation, so you have a wrist swivel. You have the chest cut, so there's articulation at the torso. And on the legs, you have double jointed knees, and you also have ankle articulation. The vintage figures did not have that. The sculpting is also updated. In some ways, it's more detailed. In some ways, it's less detailed. The top half of the figure depends on this strap and belt piece for most of the details. That is removable. You can remove it. It is on the figure in the package, so you're not really intended to remove it. And if you do remove it, you will lose most of the detail on the top half of the figure. Standing it next to the vintage figure, the vintage figure is simpler but more elegant, and it's actually black instead of gray, so it's easy to pick the vintage figure over this modern version. Snake Eyes jumps into the 6-inch scale. There have been many Snake Eyes figures in the 6-inch G.I. Joe classified series. This one is most inspired by the version 1 figure. It also includes the wolf timber, and the head of a second wolf that he has murdered. This is actually an alternate head for Timber, so you can pop on his mean face. I've already done a full review on this figure, so I won't go too much into it. The accessories are pretty good. He has an Uzi, or a submachine gun that's like an Uzi, close enough. He also has a removable pistol and a holster on the right side, and a suppressor that will fit either on the pistol or on the Uzi. He has a removable knife on the left side. He does not have the explosives pack, but he has a couple other submachine guns. Uh, he has this one that has a removable magazine, looks a little bit like an MP5. Then he has this one looking kind of like a Nerf gun. It also has a removable magazine, and that's nice. No removable ma magazine on the Uzi, but the only way they could have done that is to make the grip thicker, and that would not fit in his hand. Now, these are fine. There's nothing wrong with these accessories, but he cannot hold all of his accessories at the same time. There's just too many weapons for him to hold, and that is a pet peeve of mine. I would have preferred the explosives pack and leave off one of these submachine guns. This figure has classified series articulation, which is generally pretty good, somewhat limited at the torso because of this vest and belt piece, but like the 2007 figure, it needs this extra piece for most of the detail on the top half of the figure. The head articulation also seems kind of weird. I mean, he can look around and he can look up pretty well, but this is as far as he can look down. It just seems like it's obstructed a little bit, and it seems like he should be able to look down more than that, but that's as far as it goes. The rest of the articulation is mostly similar to the 2007 figure, but we have a couple extra points. We have double jointed elbows, we have swivels at the wrists, and hinges at the wrist. On the legs, we additionally have a swivel at the thigh cut, we have the double jointed knees, we have a swivel at the boot cut, and we still have the ankle articulation. The design of this figure is obviously inspired by that version 1 figure. On his head he has what almost looks like a hockey mask with goggles. There's a lot of detail added here and that is necessary for this scale. This scale must have additional detail and articulation, which it does. There are also a few reused parts from other action figures and that is also 
also reminiscent of the version 1 figure. This is a pretty good looking figure. This is not my favorite classified Snake Eyes, but it's a pretty good one. Let's get back to the vintage figure and look at Snake Eyes' accessories. He didn't come with many. In fact, he only had two, but let's start with the most important one. That is the Uzi. It is in dark gray plastic. It is based on the real Israeli submachine gun. There's a variation on this accessory. Some of them have thin sights at the front and the back, and others have thick sights at the front and the back. It's a very small difference, and you may not even notice. This same accessory came with 1982 and 1983 Steeler, the driver of the Mobat tank. There is another variation of this accessory in a lighter gray that came in a Battle Gear accessory pack in 1983, along with a lot of reissues of other 1982 accessories. You can see it right there, and compared with the one that came with the figure, it is in a lighter gray. Version 2 of Snake Eyes from 1985, I've also included an Uzi accessory that is very similar to the one from the 1982 and 1983 figure. One way to tell the difference is the 1985 accessory has a thicker barrel. The only other accessory is the explosives pack. It's a very simple accessory. It's a pack. It looks like it has three segments and blasting caps and a strap to go over the figure's shoulder or around his body. As with the Uzi, there is a variation on this explosive pack that came with the battle your accessories pack and it is also in a lighter gray that's it for accessories on version 1 and 1.5 snake eyes he has no backpack snake eyes travels light he only has what he needs to infiltrate enemy territory and do his job he doesn't need anything else weighing him down let's take a look at the articulation on version 1 and 1.5 snake eyes and the articulation is the main point of difference between these two figures version 1 had the articulation that was standard for a gi joe figure in 1982 so he had a swivel head he could turn his head from left to right he could lift his arm up at the shoulder and swivel at the shoulder all the way around he had a hinge at the elbow so he could bend his arm at the elbow about 90 degrees no other articulation points at the arm this is where version 1.5 was different in the articulation department 1983 figures had what they called swivel arm battle grip in addition to the 90 degree bend at the elbow he also had a swivel at the bicep so he could swivel his arm all the way around articulation for both figures otherwise was the same. They were O-ring figures, meaning they were held together with a rubber O-ring that looped around the inside. That allowed them to move at the torso a bit. He could move his legs apart about so far. He could bend his leg at the hip about 90 degrees and bend at the knee about 90 degrees. Let's look at the sculpt design and color of Snake Eyes. Like most other 1982 figures, Snake Eyes shared parts from other figures. He had more unique parts than most of his 1982 counterparts. Let's start with his head. He has an all-black mask that covers his entire head. He has black goggles that cover his eyes and vent holes over his mouth. He has a headband on the back. This is a unique head. Some 1982 figures did not even have unique heads. The chest is all black. There is no paint. There is an elastic collar, straps on the front and the back, pouches on the top part of the front straps, a grenade on the right strap, and a knife on the left. This chest is shared by 1982 Grunt, Breaker, Stalker, and Hawk and their 1983 re-releases. The arms are all black. They feature long sleeves, square pockets on the outside upper arms, elastic band cuffs, and black gloves. This is all unpainted. These arms are shared by Grunt, by Short Fuse, by Hawk, by Stalker, and by... Zap. Here's another difference between the 1982 and 1983 figures. In addition to swivel arm battle grip, the 1983 figure has the pockets move from the side of the arm to the front of the arm, and it has added detail. These updated arms are shared by versions 1.5 of Grunt, Short Fuse, Stalker, Zap, and Hawk. The waist piece is entirely black. It has a single pocket on the back. It has a wide unpainted belt with an H-shaped belt buckle. The belt buckle is probably a Hasbro 
Pro brand stamp. The 1983 figure has an updated waist piece. It is slimmer with a more detailed belt, and the belt buckle now looks like the old Hasbro logo. The 1983 figure still has the single pocket in the back. The version 1 date stamp says copyright 1982. On version 1.5, it says copyright 82-83. They're using a two-digit year. In 1983, they didn't know about the Y2K bug. That's why on January 1st, 2000, this waist piece rebootied. The waist piece was used on all the 1982 male Joe figures. It was standard. The legs on version 1 and 1.5 are the same, so we'll just take a look at one of them. They are, of course, all black and unpainted. On the right upper leg, there are two pockets. On the left upper leg, there is is what appears to be a dynamite bomb with a timer. The legs have stirrup boot covers with straps around the calf, and of course he has black boots. The upper legs are unique. The lower legs are reused from Flash and Grand Slam. This figure has a lot of reused parts and a lot of unpainted details, but this is the rare instance when it is an asset rather than a problem. Making this figure all black is inspired. It is monochrome, but it still looks right. The black plays into his specialty and makes him mysterious. It's the perfect blank canvas to create a great character. Let's take a look at Snake Eyes' file card. The file card has his faction as G.I. Joe. It has a portrait of Snake Eyes excellent artwork that really brings the character to life. His specialty is Commando. His codename is Snake Eyes. Hasbro can't seem to decide if Snake Eyes should be hyphenated or not. There's no hyphen in this name, but on the version 2 file card, there is. Then the hyphen disappears again on the version 3 and version 4 file card. And then on version 5 and on version 6, the hyphen is back. Current hyphen status is no hyphen. His file name is classified. His primary military specialty is infantry. His secondary military specialty is hand-to-hand -hand combat instructor. His birthplace is classified and his grade is E5. So his file name and birthplace are classified. All the information about him before he joined the army is a mystery. This paragraph says, Snake Eyes is proficient in 12 different unarmed fighting systems, in parentheses, karate, kung fu, jujitsu, and is highly skilled in the use of edged weapons. To get to the number 12 different unarmed fighting systems, he had to include slap fighting, pinochle, and rock, paper, scissors. By that standard, I'm proficient in five different unarmed fighting systems, has received extensive training in mountaineering, underwater demolitions, jungle, desert, and arctic survival, and some form of holistic medicine, qualified expert all NATO and Warsaw Pact small arms. This bottom paragraph has a quote. It says, the man is a total mystery, but he's real good at his job. Heck, he's the best. There's no mention here of his inability to speak. Nothing about this says he's a ninja, but it hints at it. The ninja backstory is filled in later, mostly in the comic book. The file card was written by Larry Hama, the writer of the comic book series. His 1985 version 2 file card had his Vietnam and ninja backstory fleshed out, and it closely follows the comic book continuity. Looking at how Snake Eyes was used in G.I. Joe media, he was used a lot less frequently in the animated series than in the comic book, probably because he is silent. He had more appearances than you probably remember, but he was less frequently the focus of the episodes. He first appeared in the first miniseries in 1983, in the first episode. In that series, he sacrificed himself to save his teammates on a mission to retrieve radioactive crystals. He was able to escape the crystal mine, but the radiation was sure to kill him. He was cured by a blind woodsman. That's also where he he picked up his wolf, Timber. In the follow-up series, Revenge of Cobra, Snake Eyes and Duke get captured. That gave Snake Eyes a little more screen time. A little more. Snake Eyes is forced to fight Duke, but I suspect they didn't have to force him too much. Hey, I'm, all right, all right, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Uh, thank you. His role in the next miniseries, Pyramid of Darkness, was even bigger. He was paired with Shipwreck, probably because they both had animal companions. They infiltrated a Cobra base. Escaping was more of a challenge. Snake Eyes had to break dance and dress in drag. In the animated series, there is no connection between Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow. Instead, Storm Shadow's rival was Spirit. This was, again, because Spirit is a character that could speak and exchange dialogue with Storm 
Shadow. His most screen time was in the episode The Invaders. A battle between G.I. Joe, Cobra, and the October Guard is interrupted by flying saucers. A purple alien, not that one, takes Tomax and Zamot for examination, and you know they're talking about butt stuff. The Joes fire themselves out of cannons to get an October Guard headquarters. Snake Eyes and Wong from the October Guard get captured, and the Dreadnoughts tell them the entire evil plan. Snake Eyes takes over one flying saucer and shoots down the other. Snake Eyes figured out the plot because the alien had a carton of milk next to him. I didn't make any of that up except for the butt stuff. Snake Eyes was briefly in the 1987 movie. He was captured by Cobra Law, escaped, and was captured again. He didn't do much. He continued into the Deke era of the series. He was featured in the episode The Sword, which also included Storm Shadow in his Ninja Force gear. Snake Eyes was wearing his version 4 uniform. In the comic book series published by Marvel Comics, Snake Eyes was much more prominent. He was one of the main characters in the series. At one point in the 90s, he got top billing on the cover. To say he was a popular character is an understatement. He appeared in the first issue in 1982. He wasn't the most prominent character in that story. He was paired with Scarlet on a mission to rescue Dr. Burkhart. He was in most issues after that. The cult of Snake Eyes didn't start right away. He became a fan favorite character, so more stories were written for him. He was in a story arc with Quinn and Dr. Venom, which ended with the the death of both of those side characters. Issue number 21 is famous because it includes no dialogue. Silent Interlude has Scarlet captured by Cobra, and Snake Eyes infiltrates a Cobra castle to rescue her. She is resourceful and manages to escape, and fly away with Snake Eyes on a Cobra Claw. That issue also introduced the Cobra Ninja, Storm Shadow. On the final page, it is revealed that Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow have the same hexagram tattoo on their right forearms. A two-part origin of Snake Eyes was published in issues number 26 and 27. It revealed his history in Vietnam on a long-range recon patrol team with future G.I. Joe teammate Stalker and future enemy Storm Shadow. He lost his family in a tragic auto accident. After the war, he joined Storm Shadow's ninja clan, the Arashikage, only to see the leader of the clan, the Hardmaster, assassinated. The assassin had ties to Cobra. After that, he returned treated to the mountains and befriended a wolf. When the G.I. Joe team was formed, Stalker recruited his old war buddy, Snake Eyes. On one of G.I. Joe's first missions, a helicopter crash burned Snake Eyes' face and made him unable to speak. After that, he always wore a mask. Storm Shadow joined Cobra to find out who killed the Hardmaster and get his revenge. When he learned that Zartan was the man he was looking for, Storm Shadow and Snake Eyes infiltrated Cobra Island on a mission to kill him. That mission failed failed, and it left Storm Shadow apparently dead. He was still alive, but that's a story for another time. Snake Eyes, Storm Shadow, Stalker, and Scarlet formed a tight circle of friends. When Stalker, Quick Kick, and Snowjob were imprisoned in the fictional country of Borovia, Snake Eyes and Scarlet went on a secret mission to rescue them. There was no way Snake Eyes and Scarlet would leave their friend Stalker in that prison. In issue number 93, Snake Eyes' face is revealed for the first time. He wants to get surgery to restore his face. The Baroness mistakenly believes believes Snake Eyes is responsible for killing her brother, so she leads an assault on the hospital where Snake Eyes is under the knife. She takes Snake Eyes captive and shoots Scarlet in the head. Snake Eyes is brought back to the Cobra Consulate building in New York to be tortured. He escapes with some help from his buddies Stalker and Storm Shadow, but his face is burned again. Destro informs the Baroness that Snake Eyes did not kill her brother. Scarlet is in a coma, so maybe she has more in common with Duke after all. While Scarlet was in her coma, Snake Eyes spoke his only word, Scarlet. Well, that is her code name. Her real name is Shanna, but I guess they're not on a first name basis. There are many other stories focused on Snake Eyes, far too many to list in one video. In the continuation of the Marvel continuity written by Larry Hama for IDW, Snake Eyes was killed off and replaced by a new character, Throwdown. The death of Snake Eyes was covered by Codename New 2 Vero 2 in my review of Snake Eyes version 3. Snake Eyes is a tragic figure, but he is also honorable and loyal. 
that is the key to his character. He's someone we want to root for, and we feel his pain when something bad happens to him. I normally only cover media in the vintage era. Snake Eyes has appeared in nearly every iteration of G.I. Joe, so I could be here for days talking about post-vintage media. In this case, though, I think it's appropriate to look at Snake Eyes' movie appearances. Snake Eyes has been portrayed in three live-action movies. The first was G.I. Joe Rise of Cobra in 2009. He was played by Ray Park, the same actor that played Darth Maul. As you would expect, Snake Eyes didn't speak and wore a mask. Even so, Ray Park was able to imbue him with some personality. The second movie was G.I. Joe Retaliation in 2013. Snake Eyes had an even more significant role, and Ray Park did a good job of letting us feel his emotions without seeing his face. The most recent had Snake Eyes as the star. Snake Eyes G.I. Joe Origins had Henry Golding playing the title role. This movie focused on the time before Snake Eyes was silent and masked, so he spends quite a lot of time unmasked and speaking. That's okay as long as they got Snake Eyes' character right tragic, honorable, and loyal. He spent most of the movie lying, betraying the Arashikage, working for Cobra, and seeking revenge. What the hell? Looking at Snake Eyes overall, this is a very simple figure. It has everything wrong with it. It has a bunch of reused parts. It has zero paint applications. It's entirely monochromatic. It works because it uses minimal resources in the best possible way. If you're gonna go with only one color, black is the right choice. If he can have no paint, then he has to be masked. Being masked makes him mysterious. If you can't see his face, maybe you can't hear his voice either. He is masked and silent. You can do anything with a character. You can make him a ninja. You can give him a tragic backstory. Snake Eyes' design may have been a cost-cutting measure, but it is genius. It gives G.I. Joe a layer deeper than just the good guys versus the bad guys. With Snake Eyes, you have secrets to uncover. The Accessories are good for 1982. This is still my favorite iteration of the Uzi for G.I. Joe. The explosives pack is superfluous, but also unobtrusive. The Uzi is the star of the show. It is Snake Eyes' signature weapon. A Snake Eyes without an Uzi just doesn't feel right. If Snake Eyes were just a mysterious badass, that would sell a lot of action figures. He's more than that, though. Larry Hama made something special out of him. He is dangerous, but he's a good guy. He's not just on the side of the good guys, he's a good guy. He is honorable, loyal, and cares deeply about his friends. When he hurts, we feel his pain. Snake Eyes has been hurt a lot. He lost his family, he lost his face, he lost his voice. He hasn't lost everything though. He still has his friends and his teammates. Is Snake Eyes a commando or a ninja? I have never bought into that dichotomy. For me, he has always been both, and both are integral to his personality. His experience in the army was formative. His training with the ninjas completed his development. Snake Eyes is not my favorite G.I. Joe character, but he's part of why I love G.I. Joe. Snake Eyes, Stalker, Scarlet, and Storm Shadow represent what G.I. Joe is all about. With them, you get the fighter with the heart, disciplined leadership, intelligence combined with strength, and an enemy who got a chance at redemption. If G.I. Joe only had those four, it would still have a lot. That was my review of Snake Eyes, and this is my definitive review of Snake Eyes version 1 and 1.5. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up on YouTube, subscribe to the YouTube channel so you don't miss more G.I. Joe toy reviews, and share this video with your friends. That's what helps this channel grow. You can find me on social media, on Facebook and Twitter, and I have a website, hcc788.com. If you'd like to support the channel, Patreon is a great way to do it. You can get some early access and get your name in videos like the names you see scrolling on the screen right now. I'll be back soon with another vintage G.I. Joe toy review and for the next one you might need some batteries. I'll see you then and until then remember only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe. Imagine if someone told you I have a stalker. Would you consider that a good thing or a bad thing, probably a bad thing, but there is one situation where you would want a stalker, and we're going to talk about that today.
Hello everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here. This is the show where we review every vintage G.I. Joe toy from 1982 to 1994. Thanks to Hans Chow for the title card image. Really great work, I love it, thank you so much. Who is your favorite G.I. Joe? What character stood out to you? What action figure did you always include in your play battles? For me, there is one answer to all of those questions, and that action figure is the subject of today's review. Stalker was one of the original G.I. Joes from the first wave in 1982. He was a leader. He was a ranger. He was a vital character in the mythos of G.I. Joe. Today, this ranger will lead the way. HCC 788 presents my favorite G.I. Joe in his original form, Stalker. This is Stalker, G.I. Joe's Ranger from 1982. There are two figures here, which means we are going to look at two versions, depending on how you categorize them. All the G.I. Joe figures released in 1982 were re-released in 1983 with updated articulation and parts. The 1982 releases are referred to as version 1, also called Straight Arm. The 1983 releases are referred to as version 1.5, also called Swivel Arm. I will explain the differences later in this video. The Straight Arm Stalker was released in 1982 and was available only in 1982. The Swivel Arm Stalker was released in 1983 and was also available in 1984. It was discontinued for 1985. It was available through a mail-away offer in 1986 and 1987. Overstock mail-away figures were sold at the 1992 G.I. Joe convention. Larry Hama, the writer of the G.I. Joe comic book series, implied Stalker was based on his friend and colleague, Ed Davis. Ed Davis served in Vietnam on long-range recon patrol and lost the use of one eye. He was a gifted artist and a member of Neil Adams' Krusty Bunkers at Continuity Studios. According to Larry, the last anyone heard from Ed Davis, he was heading to Central America to work as a mercenary. He never returned. There are variations of these figures. The straight arm release had a thin thumbs and thick thumbs variant. The thick thumbs variant also had lighter camouflage. The swivel arm mail away and convention releases also had lighter camouflage. Shown here are the thin thumbs variant of the straight arm figure and the standard release of the swivel arm figure. There were other versions of Stalker released in the vintage era. Version 2 was released in 1989. He came with a big kayak. Version 3 was in the Talking Battle Commanders set in 1992. Version 4 was in the Arctic Commandos Mail-Away set in 1993, and Version 5 was in the Battle Corps in 1994. Stalker is billed as a Ranger. U.S. Army Ranger School was established in the 1950s. In the early 1960s, during the Vietnam War, the U.S. Army deployed Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol, or LRRP, units in Vietnam. In 1969, those units were designated as Rangers. This tracks with Stalker's backstory in the comic book. He would have graduated from Ranger School before serving in Vietnam. Ranger is denoted as his specialty, but most of the Joes would probably be Ranger qualified. Some other notable Rangers or Ranger qualified personnel for G.I. Joe would include Scarlet from 1982, Beachhead from 1986, Repeater from 1988, and although it's not specifically mentioned on his file card, Snake Eyes was probably Ranger qualified as well. Stalker is a name that has not aged well. The word stalker did not have the same negative connotation in 1982 that it does today. This makes a live action version of the character unlikely, at least with the same code name. The light green plastic used for stalker is very fragile. Something about that light green pigment made the plastic very brittle. Other figures from 1982 made with the light green plastic were also notoriously easily broken. That includes Zap and Steeler. If you have one of these figures, be very cautious. I would not move the joints very much. It would be very easy to snap off an arm just with the friction of moving the shoulder joints. I would also not put the figure on a figure stand. It would be very easy to crack the heel off. I'm more careful now with my figures than I used to be. I used to display Stalker on the Manta. I used to 
jam that foot peg into his foot. It's a miracle I didn't break it. Don't follow my example. Take care of your toys. Stalker was a popular figure and had many post-vintage and international releases. Here are but a few examples. This version of Stalker was released in Japan. G.I. Joe did not have great success in Japan, but did see release there. Thank you to Chris from Comic Tropes for sending this Japanese Stalker to me. Stalker was included in the current 2021 retro toy line. Even though these are called retro, they are made in the modern... 25th anniversary body style. They are not vintage O-ring style figures. That card art is beautiful though. Thank you to Kevin from Peg Warmers for giving me this retro stalker. In Brazil, the company Estrella released a stalker that was very similar to the US release. Thank you to Mr. Ulrich for sending me the Estrella Brazilian stalker. This is 25th anniversary stalker. It is stalker version 9 from 2007. This figure shows off modern articulation and sculpting from the 4-inch figures released in that era. Let's take a look at Stalker's accessory. He included only one. Both the 1982 and 83 releases included the same accessory. It was his M32 pulverizer submachine gun. It was in dark gray plastic. It is based loosely on the real-world Heckler & Koch MP5. This submachine gun was a popular accessory and was re-released several times. It was included with the 1983 Mail Away and 1984 retail Duke action figure, recolored green. It was released again in a dark gray, almost black color with the 1988 Tiger Force Duke. It was released a couple times without action figures, first with the 1983 Battle Gear accessory pack number one in a lighter greenish gray plastic it is distinguishable from the original because the color is much lighter it was included with the 1985 transportable tactical battle platform in a medium gray that is between the lighter gray of the battle gear accessory pack release and the original darker gray release there is also a molding difference the rear sight is flattened here are the vintage releases of this accessory this is the original this is the battle gear accessory pack version. This is the Duke accessory. This is the transportable tactical battle form accessory. And this is the Tiger Force Duke accessory. Let's look at Stalker's articulation, but this figure is far too fragile for me to demonstrate the articulation. So I am going to use a stand-in short fuse, a figure that was released the same year and with the same articulation, but with much more robust plastic. Both the swivel arm and straight arm figure could turn their heads left and right. They could lift other arms up at the shoulder and swivel at the shoulder all the way around. They had a hinge at the elbow so they could bend the arm at the elbow about 90 degrees. There was no other articulation on the arm for the straight arm figure. The swivel arm figure could do all the same things the straight arm figure could do, but also had another point of articulation. He had a swivel at the bicep so he could swivel his arm all the way around. This was marketed as swivel arm battle grip. Both releases of the figure were O-ring figures, meaning the figure was held together with a rubber O-ring that looped around the inside. That allowed him to move at the torso a bit. He could move his legs apart about so far. He could bend his leg at the hip about 90 degrees and bend at the knee about 90 degrees. Let's look at the sculpt design and color of Stalker. And first I have to point out that most of this figure is reused from other 1982 figures. For example, Grunt, also released in 1982 and re-released in 1983, used the entire body from Stalker. Only Stalker's head is a unique part. Even so, that still made Stalker special. Some 1982 figures didn't even have their own unique head. Let's look at that special head. It is the same on version 1 and version 1.5. He is wearing a green beret with no beret flash. He has black hair and a black mustache. This is one of the few 1982 heads that was not reused on another figure. For 1982, this was a really good head sculpt. On his chest, he has a light green shirt with dark green striped camouflage. This may not be as impressive as the camouflage we got on later figures, but in 1982, it was remarkable to get any camouflage. He also has black straps on the front and the back. On the front, he has pouches and a sculpted on grenade and knife. This camo pattern is probably meant to approximate tiger stripe camouflage, which was used by some elite 
elite units in Vietnam. His arms feature long green sleeves with that dark green camouflage pattern, and on the straight arm figure, he has pockets on the outside of his upper arms. The arms on the swivel arm figure are almost the same, still has the light green sleeves with dark green camouflage pattern. The pockets have been given more detail and moved to the front of the upper arm. Both the straight arm and swivel arm figures have bare hands. There is a significant difference between the straight arm and swivel arm figures on the waist piece. Both have light green plastic with dark green camouflage. On the straight arm figure, he has a thick waist piece with a wide belt and an H-shaped belt buckle. That belt buckle is probably a brand stamp for Hasbro. The waist piece on the swivel arm figure is still in light green plastic with dark green camouflage, but it is a slimmer waist piece with a more detailed belt, and the Hasbro branding is more blatant because the belt buckle is now in the shape of Hasbro's logo. Both the straight arm and swivel arm figure had the same legs, again with the light green plastic and dark green camouflage, pockets on the outside of both legs, and we finish up with some solid black standard 1982 boots. The camouflage made this figure special. Hasbro cut costs on the 1982 lineup of figures. Paint was expensive, so Hasbro tried to do as little of it as possible. One figure, Snake Eyes, was made entirely of black plastic with no paint at all. The money saved by producing one figure with no paint allowed them to add paint to Stalker. It really made the figure stand out. Let's take a look at the file card. The file card was printed on the back of the card on which the figure was packaged. This was the 1983 release because you can see the swivel arm battle grip blurb. It shows his faction as G.I. Joe. It has a portrait of Stalker with some wonderfully painted card art by Hector Garrido. There is a difference between the card art and the action figure. On the card, his beret is camouflage, not solid green. Let's talk about this beret. The green beret was worn by U.S. Army Special Forces, which is not correct for Stalker. Starting in 1975, the U.S. Army Rangers wore black berets. That is probably the period correct option for Stalker. One vintage version of Stalker did include a black beret, but it had this funky yellow band. That's not the weirdest thing about this figure by a long shot. I did a review of it. Please check it out. His specialty is Ranger. His codename is Stalker. His file name is Lonzo R. Wilkinson. His primary military specialty is Infantry. Secondary military specialty is Medic and Interpreter. He was G.I. Joe's Medic before Doc. His birthplace is Detroit, Michigan, probably a Lions fan. He's done more winning than the Lions have since 1982. His grade is E5. This paragraph says, Stalker was warlord of a large urban street gang prior to enlistment, fluent in Spanish, Arabic, French, and Swahili. Graduated top of class, basic combat training, advanced infantry training, top of class, special training U.S. Army language school, explains why he knows so many languages, intelligence school, qualified expert M14, M16, M1911A1 auto pistol, M3A1 grease gun, which I believe was outdated in the 80s and probably even in the 60s, M32 pulverizer submachine gun. Glad they fit that in there somewhere since that's the weapon he comes with. This final paragraph has a quote. It says, functions well under high stress situations, intelligent, perceptive, moves like some sort of jungle cat, silent, fast, strong. This is probably the source of his stalker code name. This is a pretty standard file card for 1982. These file cards were written by Larry Hama, the writer of the comic book series. It does not hint at the importance of Stalker to the G.I. Joe story in the future. The urban street gang background is expounded upon a little in the comic book series. It's a bit stereotypical to make the only African-American character in G.I. Joe a former gang member. That part of his background is far less important than everything that happened after he joined the army. Looking at how Stalker was used in G.I. Joe media, in the cartoon he first appeared in the A Real American Hero miniseries Part 1 in 1983. He had a moderate number of appearances in the animated series, but he was not as prominent as he was in the comic book series. He appeared in the Deke era of the animated series in his later uniform, but was rarely more than a background character. In the comic book series published by Marvel Comics, he first appeared in issue number one in 1982. He was a main character in the series. He served with Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow in Vietnam on a long-range recon patrol team. He brought Snake Eyes onto the G.I. Joe team team. 
He was a mission leader on numerous occasions. The final issue of the Marvel series, issue number 155, explains that Stalker joined the army to get away from the mean streets of Detroit, which had already killed his two older brothers. There are very few characters in the comic book series more important than Stalker. I already loved the figure. The comic book sealed Stalker as my favorite G.I. Joe. Here's an example of what I mean from issue number 39. A squad of Joes is escaping from Sierra Gordo after rescuing Dr. Burkhardt from captivity and certain death. Dr. Burkhardt is lamenting that people had to die in order to save her life. Because she's a decent human being and she doesn't compromise her principles even for her own benefit and safety. Ripcord doesn't like this and starts tearing into her, but Stalker stops him and explains that the reason they fight is not so everyone can think the same way they do, but so everyone can have the freedom to think anything they want. Stalker gets it. Not enough people get it, even today. Stalker is not just a tactical and strategic master, he also understands the why. Looking at Stalker overall, it's no secret that I love this figure. It's beautiful. It was a special figure in 1982, and it's a special figure to me and now. Stalker doesn't have the details and accessories that later figures would have. It also reuses a lot of parts, which is usually a big problem. If you compare this figure with figures that came out during the golden age of the vintage G.I. Joe era, Stalker seems a bit lackluster. I can't pretend this figure is objectively better than figures that came out later with better accessories, better sculpting, and better paint. Despite that, this figure was special in 1982. He had the beret, he had the camouflage, he had a unique weapon, he was cooler than cool. Stalker included only one accessory, that was probably another cost-cutting choice, a backpack would have been appropriate, but the accessory he came with was a great one. The pulverizer submachine gun was so cool, it got reused many times. I review a lot of G.I. Joe figures that are not very good. It's fun to dunk on a bad figure. And I do. I dunk on them like Wilt Chamberlain. Wilt Chamberlain and I have a lot in common. Or as I call him... Shorty. But most G.I. Joe figures are great, that's why I enjoy collecting them. Looking at a beloved figure like Stalker reminds me why I do this. There is no dunking on Stalker. Stalker dunks on you. If you're watching this video, you probably have some history and experience with G.I. Joe. I'll bet there was one figure that captured your imagination and drew you into the world. If it wasn't Stalker, who was it? What was the action figure that inspired you? This is the figure that inspired me. It wasn't my first G.I. Joe figure, but it was, and is, and always will be, my favorite. That was my review of Stalker. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up on YouTube, share the video, and subscribe to the channel for more G.I. Joe toy reviews. Thanks again to Hans Chow for the title card image. Really well done, great job. If you would like to help me continue to make these videos, you can support the channel on Patreon, you see the name scrolling on the screen right now? Your name could be there. You can find me on social media, on Facebook and Twitter, and I have a website, hcc788.com. Thank you very much for watching. I will see you next time. And until then, remember, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe. Ever since G.I. Joe's bazooka soldier, Zap, was introduced in 1982, fans have been puzzled by one thing. Why does he have a mustache in the picture, but not on the figure? In recent years, new information has come to light, and one person deserves a lot of credit for it. Dan Klingensmith has managed to find some unreleased items that have given us a behind-the-scenes look at the production of G.I. Joe toys. He's been publishing a book series called Three and Three Quarter Inch Joe, and these books are fantastic. The books are loaded with information and photos and concept drawings that were used Used to produce some of our favorite toys. I can't recommend these books enough. You should pick them up. Dan has a website where you can order these books, www.334inchjoe.com. A link will be in the description of this video. He gave me permission to use his photos in this video. Thanks to Dan, we can finally see Zap with his mustache, as he was always meant to be.
Hello everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here, and this is a special episode and a special vintage G.I. Joe toy review. This is the last episode before JoeCon. I will not have a new review next week. I will be at the convention, and I hope to see you there too. We're looking at Zap, G.I. Joe's Bazooka Soldier. This is the last 1982 figure to be reviewed. That's right, we've looked at all of them. There's a reason I hadn't reviewed Zap before now. It's an extremely difficult figure to complete, for reasons we will discuss in this video. I have to thank Mike Lopez for helping me get the final piece to get this figure ready for review. Thank you, Mike. You are a superhero. As many of you know, Breaker from 1982 was my first G.I. Joe action figure. I'm pretty sure Zap was my brother's first action figure. I've asked my brother about that. He doesn't remember. My memory is far from perfect, but I'm pretty sure that Zap was one of our first figures. I don't remember playing with it very much. That usually means that it belonged to my brother or it broke. Both may be true. Completing this figure was a collecting milestone for me. It was a special thrill. I still get that thrill from completing certain items that are, are hard to find, and I definitely got that thrill from this figure, and it's my privilege to share it with you. HCC 788 proudly presents Zap. This is Zap, G.I. Joe's Bazooka Soldier from 1982. I have both the 1982 and 1983 releases here. The 1982 release, referred to as version 1, was only available in 1982. The figure was updated in 1983 to add new articulation. The 1983 version, referred to as version 1.5, was available in 1983 and 1984. Version 1.5 was released as a mail-away offer in 1983 and 1987 as part of the original Adventure Team set. We have both version 1 and version 1.5 here. The biggest difference between these figures is the articulation. The 1982 release is called Straight Arm because it did not have swivels on the arms, only hinges at the elbows. The 1983 release did have the swivels on the arms. This was marketed as Swivel Arm Battle Grip. The 1983 releases are often referred to as the Swivel Arm version. The 1983 updates were not significant enough to call them second versions, but they were too significant to just call them variants. So they're referred to as half versions. Collectors call them version 1.5. There was a second version of Zap released in 1991 as part of the Supersonic Fighters subset. Besides having a drastically different uniform and accessories, the version 2 is sporting a mustache. That requires some explanation. We will talk about that at length when we talk about the figure's sculpt. He was one of the original G.I. Joe characters when the line was relaunched in 1982. As with most other figures released that year, he doesn't have any unique parts. They reused a lot of parts that year. We'll talk about that in detail. This figure is notorious among G.I. Joe collectors. It's probably the most fragile figure ever made. This light green plastic was very brittle, even when it was brand new. Few of these figures survived playtime intact. The thumbs in particular are almost always broken. Simply placing the figure's accessories in his hand would be enough to break the thumb. A figure with both thumbs intact is exceptional. I was lucky to find this one. Guess what has two thumbs and has two thumbs? This guy. I can't overstate the fragility of this figure. I don't recommend putting the figure on a stand. The heels will crack off. I do not recommend placing the accessories on the figure, except for maybe the helmet. The hands will break. The bazooka and the backpack are made of the same fragile green plastic, so you risk breaking the accessories too. This problem is generally attributed to the light green plastic. Other G.I. Joe figures released that year weren't quite as fragile. The medium and dark green figures were pretty sturdy. Other figures made of that light green plastic, like Stalker and Steeler, were also quite fragile. Zap has the worst reputation, though. Because of the risk of breaking this figure, I will not be showing the figure holding the accessories. I will place as little pressure on this figure as possible, and when I'm done looking at it, it will go back in a case. 
The 1983 release doesn't seem to have as many problems with breakage, but I'll be careful with that one too. As a bazooka soldier, Zap was G.I. Joe's first anti-armor specialist. He was eventually replaced in 1985 with the missile specialist codenamed Bazooka. Also in 1985, Footloose came with a law rocket, but he wasn't an anti-armor specialist. Much later in 1990, G.I. Joe got a more beefed up anti-armor specialist, Salvo. Salvo is one of the better remembered figures from the 90s. Contrasting Salvo to Zap, the difference is dramatic. The detail on the figures and the quality and sheer size of the accessories made a lot of progress in eight years. His direct counterpart in Cobra was Scrap Iron from 1984. Scrap Iron wasn't a bazooka soldier, but he was an anti-armor specialist. He also worked primarily for Destro, according to his file card. Instead of a bazooka, he used a big missile launcher to take out tanks. In 1989, Cobra got a bazooka man, the Heat Viper. Unlike Scrap Iron, the Heat Viper was a trooper, and he worked directly for Cobra, not for Destro. The Heat Viper also had some pretty crazy accessories. In 1990, Metalhead was an anti-tank specialist who was a replacement really for Scrap Iron. Metalhead also worked for Destro, though in his media appearances, Metalhead was pretty much a Cobra. A bazooka is a shoulder-fired anti-tank weapon. They first saw significant use in World War II. It takes its name from a musical instrument invented by the radio comedian Bob Burns. Early G.I. Joe had some specialties you'd probably recognize. They had a bazooka soldier, a mortar soldier, a machine gunner, an infantry rifleman, and in 1983 they had a minesweeper. Why these particular specialties? Well, if you ever had the small green plastic army men, you know they always included a bazooka soldier, a machine gunner, a mortar soldier, an infantry rifleman, and a minesweeper. You could look at these early Joes as big versions of those little green army men. The success of the toy line after 1982 meant they could do more with it. They could give us figures with more diverse specialties and styles, and they really did branch out. Zap probably did not get his name from the 1982 movie Zapped, starring Scott Bayo. There is an 80% chance he wasn't named after Zap Brannigan from Futurama. She's built like a steakhouse, but she handles like a bistro. There is a 75% chance he was not named after Zap Rousedower from Final Sacrifice. <laughs> that is a classic Rouse Dowerism. When I reviewed the 1982 Mortar Soldier Short Fuse, I said Short Fuse could potentially be more difficult to complete than Zap, because not only do you have the straight and swivel arm versions, not only do you have three accessories variants, you also have three file card variants. The difficulty in completing Zap, though, is not in the number of pieces, it's in the difficulty in finding intact pieces. Let's talk about Zap's accessories. Series, there's a lot to talk about here. He came with what the card contents simply called a bazooka. It's made of light green plastic. There are three versions of it. The earliest bazookas had two handles. This one is the hardest to find. And thanks to Mike Lopez for helping me with this one. The bazooka consists of a tube that has some detail on it. It has a sight and it has a shoulder brace that's represented by this loop here. There are some major problems with this two-handle bazooka. First of all, the straight arm figure couldn't hold both handles anyway, and of course the thumb would break off the first time you put it in his hand. So the weapon was quickly changed to a one-handle design. In addition to removing the second handle, they also reduced the size of the shoulder brace, but this handle was a little bit thick and would also break the thumbs on the figure. So they changed it to the final design, the thin handle bazooka. All of these efforts were made to prevent the figure from breaking, but I don't think any of them worked very well. The problem was not the size of the handle on the accessories. The problem was the fragility of the plastic on the figure. I've heard this bazooka referred to as a Carl Gustav recoilless rifle. It has some design elements from the Carl Gustav. I think it looks more like an M1 bazooka from World War II. The M1 would have been terribly outdated by the early 1980s. Ironically, changes on the M1 reflected the design progression of the G.I. Joe accessory. The M1 had two grips, like Zap's two-handle bazooka, 
The later M1A1 had only one grip. These bazookas are often broken. The sight is often broken off. The grips can break. The main body of the bazooka breaks pretty easily too. I have a whole bag of broken bazookas. If you try to complete a zap figure, you'll probably end up with a bag like this too. Next we have what the card contents call an ammo pack. It is made of light green plastic, just like the bazooka. It has molded in bazooka shells, and that's nice. It's nice to have some coordination between accessories. This is a reissue of the backpack that came with Short Fuse. Of course, Short Fuse's backpack being in medium green rather than light green. And since Short Fuse was a mortar soldier, these shells on his backpack are interpreted as mortar shells. There's a slight variation with this backpack. The peg on the 1982 backpacks were shorter and squared off. The peg on the 1983 release was longer and rounded. The screw holes where the backpack pegged onto the figure was slightly different from 1982 to 1983 as well. So if you swap these backpacks around between the 1982 and 1983 figures, they won't quite fit right. Finally, we have the helmet. This is a standard helmet in light green. It has holes in the side for attachments, but Zap didn't come with any attachments. This is exactly the same helmet that came with other 1982 figures. In 1982, this helmet came in three colors, light green, medium green, and dark green. It's considered the standard helmet. It didn't fit every G.I. Joe head, but it fit most of them. It was released in other colors later. In 1982, this light green helmet came with Zap and Steeler. Steeler, of course, had an attachment for his. The medium green helmet was issued with Breaker, Grunt, Short fuse, flash, clutch, and hawk. The dark green helmet was issued with rock and roll and grand slam. A word of warning, the color on these helmets seems to fade over time. The original color should pretty closely match the uniform on the figure, but you will run across some helmets that are the right helmet for your figure, but they just look a bit duller. Some of the medium green helmets tend to look more gray to me than green. Just to give you an idea how many times this helmet was reissued and how many different colors you could get it in. In addition to the three colors in 1982, it also came in brown, two different shades of tan, in yellow with wacky tiger stripes. The light green helmet came with and without holes on the sides. It came in kind of a burnt amber color, and we can't forget about Starduster's light blue. Identifying a Zap helmet is made more difficult by the fact that other light green helmets were issued later. Duke and 1984 Roadblock also came with light green helmets, but the mail away Duke and the Roadblock figures had helmets that did not have the holes in the sides, so that helps identify them. However, the later carded Duke action figures did have the light green helmets with the holes in the side, so that can look very much like a Zap helmet. The helmets you see here do have slightly different colors, but keep in mind these colors can fade over time. So your best bet is to try to find a Zap helmet that has not faded and closely matches his uniform color. If you were to throw all these helmets in a box and then try to find the Zap helmet, you'd have a pretty hard time identifying it. Let's look at the articulation on Zap by demonstrating on short fuse. The standard articulation on these 1982 figures included a swivel at the head. You could swing the arm up at the shoulder and swivel at the shoulder all the way around. Uh, it had a hinge at the elbow so he could bend his arm at the elbow. No swivel at the bicep. The 1983 figures added the swivel at the bicep so the arm could swivel all the way around. This was advertised as swivel arm battle grip and it allowed the figures to hold their weapons with a two-handed grip. These are referred to as the swivel arm versions. These are O-ring figures. They had a rubber O-ring that looped around the inside. That allowed for movement at the torso a bit. They could move their legs apart about so far. They could bend their legs at the hip about 90 degrees and bend at the knee about 90 degrees. Let's look at the sculpt, design, and color of Zap. And I have to say right off the bat, Zap reuses the entire body of Short Fuse, his 1982 teammate. Only the color and the head are different, but the head was reused from other figures. So I have to reiterate, Zap has no original parts. Let's talk about that head. Zap has black hair. 
This face sculpt has been likened to Sam Donaldson or Michael Ironside. I'll let you make up your own mind about that. The face looks a bit older than some of his other G.I. Joe teammates, and he has a bit of a receding hairline. This head was reused for Grunt and Grand Slam, so not even the head is unique. Grunt and Grand Slam, however, have brown hair instead of black. This reuse of heads is a problem. It makes the 1982 figure lineup look generic. It's hard for them to develop their own personalities when they all look alike. But the more generic heads were used as a cost-cutting measure. There's something that was always a mystery to G.I. Joe fans back in 1982. The figure looked different from the art on the card. On the card, Zap had a mustache, but the figure did not. When Zap appeared in the comic book series and the cartoon, he had a mustache, but no mustache on the figure. Where is Zap's mustache? Thanks to Dan Klingensmith, we have some insider information on Zap's missing mustache. Early concept drawings included a mustache, later drawings removed it. Hasbro executives considered a running change for the 1983 series, which would have included updated heads for the 1982 characters. One update was a change to Zap's head. A few rare carded samples of these figures have been found. The new head would have given Zap a fuller head of hair and most importantly, a mustache. Behold the mustache. I'm sorry Hasbro didn't release these figures. I know a lot of kids would have passed on them, but I would have picked them up. I had an affection for those 82 characters, and I always wanted them to look more like they appeared in the comic book. The generic heads always bothered me. Thank you, Dan, for your contribution to the history of G.I. Joe. The fan community benefits from it. I encourage everyone to check out his books. Zap's chest is light green with brown straps. Those straps go over his shoulders and under his arms, and then there's a brown strap that goes between them. These are the kind of straps you'd expect to see on a school backpack. He has a ridged collar, almost like a turtleneck collar, that was pretty standard for 1982. Uh, the collar on my version 1 Zap is chipped. Uh, I'm not so much concerned about that because his thumbs are intact and that's the important thing. His arms feature long, light green sleeves and he has bright green pockets on his upper arms. Those 82 releases, of course, had the uh, hinge at the elbow. Uh, the 83 releases, they added the swivel at the bicep, but that's not the only change. Those bright green pockets, they moved from the side of the arm around to the front, and they added more detail. You might notice the lower arms on the 1983 release is in a slightly different color. They may have changed the plastic uh, to make it sturdier and avoid more breakage of the thumbs. The thumbs, though, on that 82 Zap are extraordinary. Uh, to see unbroken and unrepaired thumbs on a 1982 Zap is rare, so I'm giving you an extra close-up of them. The waist piece on the 82 Zap is pretty plain. It has a wide belt, an H-shaped belt buckle, a little pocket there in the back. Uh, this was also changed for the 83 version. The 83 waist piece is a bit thinner. The belt is more detailed. Instead of having an H-shaped belt buckle, we have a belt buckle shaped like a house. Both of these waist pieces were pretty standard and used on a lot of other figures. I think these belt buckles are a Hasbro brand stamp. The early belt buckle looks like an H for Hasbro. The later belt buckle looks like a house, and that looks a lot like the old Hasbro logo. The legs are in light green plastic, exactly the same as the rest of the body. He has bright green pockets on each thigh and he has standard brown boots. These legs were pretty standard. They were reused on Breaker, Grunt, Rock and Roll, Short Fuse, Stalker, Clutch, Hawk, and Steeler. It's fair to say this figure is generic. It has no unique parts. It only has one unique accessory. But the light green does help it. He stands out among his teammates, but he still feels like he belongs. Let's take a look at Zap's file card. This file card was printed on the back of the card on which the figure was packaged. Uh, we have his faction as G.I. Joe and a portrait of Zap here with the mustache. He's the Bazooka Soldier in big bold letters. His code name is Zap. His file name is Rafael J. Melendez. This indicates that Zap is Hispanic. In that first year, the file cards added some diversity to the team, though most of the figures were Caucasian. Later figures were more diverse in appearance. Primary military specialty is engineer, secondary military specialty is infantry and artillery. 
story. Birthplace is New York City and his grade is E4. This middle section has a quote. It says, Zap is the team specialist in armor piercing and anti-tank weapons, but also functions as demolition man. Specialized education, engineer school, ordnance school, advanced infantry training. The G.I. Joe team wasn't very big in the beginning. Some team members had to fill multiple roles, like Stalker was the team medic at the time. Breaker was a computer expert, and Rock and Roll was the PT instructor. Qualified expert M14, M16, M1911A1, M79 grenade launcher, M72 law rocket, XM71A tow missile, XM47 dragon missile. This bottom section has a quote. It says, Zap is the fun-loving type. He's cool under fire. The stuff he works on could blow up at any time. This file card gives you a little bit of information about Zap's personality, but not very much. These 1982 file cards tended to be pretty sparse. Looking at how Zap was used in G.I. Joe Media, in the cartoon, he first appeared in the very first episode of the first animated miniseries in 1983. He was only a background character in that series. He didn't even get any lines until episode 4. Since Zap had a later version, he did appear a handful of times in the Deke animated series, but he had no lines and was just a background character. Looking at his appearances in the comic book series published by Marvel Comics, since Zap was in the first class of G.I. Joe characters in 1982, he appeared in the very first issue of the comic book. Some pages show him with a mustache and a beard. In the first year of the series, G.I. Joe had very few characters, so Zap was able to get a few good moments. In issue number four, he and Grunt disarmed a nuclear bomb. In issue number 10, Zap, Scarlet, and Snake Eyes were imprisoned by Cobra in their secret base in the town of Springfield. That issue introduced several important elements to the comic book. Dr. Venom, the Brainwave Scanner, Springfield, and the character that would later be known as Billy, Cobra Commander's son. In issue number 33, Zap, along with most of the other original Joes, was made a part of the administrative arm of the team. He was no longer an operational member. This was an attempt to make room for new characters. That plot point was conveniently forgotten, though. The non-operational characters still tended to pop up on occasion. There's one notable non-appearance of Zap. In issue number 50, his teammate, Flash, explores the tunnels under Springfield, but he's mistakenly identified as Zap. In issue number 82, Zap is an instructor training prospective Joes. That's not a bad issue because it gives you an idea of what it takes to become a Joe. Zap isn't a major character in that issue. Issue, though. Zap had another appearance in the Special Missions series, issue number 24. I've already talked about that issue in the review of Crystal Ball. It's the issue where the female members of the G.I. Joe team go undercover as dancers at a baseball game. It's a rare issue not written by Larry Hama. I don't think it's very good. Zap was never a major player in the comic book or the cartoon. Did he deserve better? Maybe so. He was never given a chance to develop. As more characters were added, only a handful of the original Joes became major characters. Unfortunately for Zap, the newer G.I. Joe characters were just too interesting. The older, more generic characters were pushed out of the limelight. Looking at Zap overall, is this a top-tier figure? No, of course not. This is a figure with no original parts. It was made as cheaply as possible. It looks fine for a 1982 release, but it doesn't have Stalker's camouflage or Snake Eyes' cool black uniform or Rock and Roll's ammo belts. The only thing that distinguishes Zap is his light green color. And unfortunately, the light green is also the source of his biggest problem. I cannot sufficiently express to you the fragility of this figure. If you get this figure, you can't really do anything with it. You should not put the accessories in his hand. You should not put him on a figure stand. You should not move him around very much. You could snap the arm off just by moving it. As collectors, we should try to preserve the history of these toys. Not every toy is 
rare. Not every toy is fragile. Not every toy deserves to be treated like a historical artifact. This one deserves special care. The number of intact examples is small and shrinking. If we exercise a little care, future generations will have a few intact examples to admire. Because this is such a difficult figure to complete, I have to thank, again, Mike Lopez for helping me finish this guy, and thanks to Dan Klingensmith for your special insight. That was my review of Zap. I hope you enjoyed it. This is the last review before JoeCon. I hope to see some of you there. I will be out of town at the convention, so I won't have a new review for you next week, but I may cook up a little something special special for you. Thanks to Dan Klingensmith for allowing me to use those Zap images. We hit 5,000 subscribers recently. The channel is growing strong, and I have you to thank for it. You make this a joy. It is my privilege to meet you here every week and talk about these toys that we loved and grew up with. Thank you for being awesome. As always, find me on Facebook and Twitter, support the channel on Patreon, and don't forget about my website, hcc 788 Com. I'll see you at Joe Con, and until then, remember, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe. It's true. A equals A. It's only logical. Hello, everybody. Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here, and it's time for another vintage G.I. Joe toy review. And based on my last two videos, the viewers don't seem to be quite as interested in looking at these 1982 G.I. Joes. Uh, so naturally, I'm going to do another one. We've already looked at Scarlet and Rock and Roll, so this time we're going to look at the 1982 and 1983 Breaker. Now, I have already reviewed this figure, but that video was the first video I ever did on this channel uh, and that video wasn't very good it kinda sucked so this updated review of that figure should not suck quite as much now, this figure is kind of special to me personally so rather than sitting around talking about it let's look at the toy this is Breaker, G.I. Joe's first communications officer from 1982. He was first available in 1982 in this so-called straight arm version. He was called straight arm because he had a hinge here at the elbow, but he could not swivel his arms. The following year, in 1983, he was reissued with swivel arm battle grip, which added a swivel here just above the elbow. This 1982 straight arm version was only available available for that year. Uh, the swivel arm version was available in 1983 and 1984. It was discontinued for the year 1985, and he didn't really have a replacement in 1985. However, in 1986, there was a new G.I. Joe communications specialist, Dial Tone. On a personal note, Breaker was the first G.I. Joe figure I ever got as a child. I got the straight arm version back in 1982. Let's take a look at Breaker's accessories, starting with his communication headset which pegs into the holes on the sides of his helmet like that and it has this long wire which pegs into the hole in his backpack. This communications headset does look like big 80s headphones. It has a microphone that comes down. Uh, it has some detail, has some buttons here on the top, and of course this long thin wire is just made out of the same kind of hard plastic, so that can break off. Those early G.I. Joes did tend to use these long wires coming off the accessories to connect to the backpacks, as did the 1982 Flash. He had this long wire from his laser rifle that connected to his backpack. Later G.I. Joes uh, replaced these long thin wires, these breakable wires, with removable black rubber tubing that would serve that purpose. That worked a lot better and was much less likely to break. One unfortunate thing about Breaker's headset is when it's plugged into the backpack, it does restrict the head movement a little bit. It naturally wants to pull the head to the left. In 19 in 1983, Hasbro came out with Battle Gear accessory packs, which were replacement accessories, usually made in a different color plastic than the original. And there was an accessory pack communication set 
Uh, and as you can see, it's just a slightly lighter gray than the original. The original is a dark gray, almost black, and the accessory pack version is a lighter gray. So that is something you would want to watch out for if you want an original breaker communications headset. Breaker's next accessory is his helmet, and this is a standard helmet. Uh, this is the same helmet that was issued with most of the 1982 G.I. Joe action figures. Has holes in the side there. That's where his communications headset pegs in. Uh, a lot of other G.I. Joe figures from that year had this helmet, like Grunt, uh, pretty much identical. Uh, and as you can see, the color of the helmet should pretty closely match the color of Breaker's uniform. The last, or perhaps the most important accessory, is what the contents of the card on which Breaker was packaged call a TV radio backpack. And as you can see, it is kind of lacking in detail. This is supposed to be a uh, very modern, high-tech device, but does not have have a lot of detail there. I guess this is supposed to be the TV screen on the TV radio backpack. There's the hole in which the communications headset plugs in. Uh, and that's about it. Really kind of minimal. Comparing this communications backpack to the one that came with the 1986 Dial Tone, you can see Dial Tone's backpack is loaded with details, lots of uh, high-tech wiring and things like that. Looks very futuristic, very high-tech, and by comparison, Breaker's communications backpack uh, looks kind of primitive. There's a difference in the pegs on the backpacks that came with the 1982 figures and the ones that came with the 1983 swivel arm figures. Uh, the 1982 backpacks had uh, kind of a shorter, stubbier peg here, and the 1983 backpacks had a slightly longer peg with a more rounded end. And the holes on the back of the action figures are also slightly different, such that the 1982 backpack fits very loosely on the 1983 swivel arm uh, figure. After looking at all these accessories that come with Breaker, do you notice anything missing? That's right, he comes with no weapon whatsoever. Uh, and that, I think, is one reason why Breaker was never a fan favorite. He only comes with his helmet and communication set. No weapons, no guns at all. And I think most kids would want their new army action figure to come with some kind of uh, firearm. But Breaker didn't, and so it kind of looks like he is intended for more of a support role rather than a combat role. If you have an extra M16, perhaps, perhaps from an accessory pack, or you could take it from Grunt, since Grunt gets no respect. Uh, give that to Breaker, and uh, that looks pretty good. I think that looks appropriate. Uh, there is another alternative for the weaponless Breaker uh, that I'll discuss a little bit later in this video. Let's take a look at the articulation on Breaker. Uh, the 1982 Breaker had the typical articulation for G.I. Joe figures of that year, meaning he could turn his head from left to right like that. He could lift his arm up at the shoulder about so far, and he could swivel his arm at the shoulder all the way around. He had that hinge at the elbow so he could move at the elbow a little bit. Uh, the figure was held together with a rubber O-ring that looped around the inside. That allowed the figure to move at the torso a little bit. He could move his legs apart about so far. He could move his leg at the hip about 90 degrees, and he could bend at the knee about 90 degrees. The 1983 Breaker had the same articulation, except it added a new point of articulation at the bicep. He could now swivel his arm at the bicep all the way around on both arms. That was supposed to allow the figures to hold their weapons with a two-handed grip, but Breaker did not come with any weapons. Let's take a look at the sculpt, design, and color of breaker starting with his head and his head as you can see has brown hair and he has a brown beard looks a little bit like Jesus the breaker action figure shared a head with clutch and rock and roll from that same year this is pretty typical a lot of those 1982 GI Joe action figures has shared a lot of parts among them uh, as you can see they have different hair colors and that's really the only way to distinguish the heads of these different figures allegedly Allegedly, the Breaker action figure was not intended to have a beard. Instead of sharing a head with other action figures, he was supposed to have a unique head sculpt. And supposedly, collectors have found a pre-production packaged version of Breaker with his unique head sculpt. Breaker's chest features black straps with an unpainted knife here, and what is supposed to be an unpainted hand grenade on this side. But it looks like a previous owner has 
taken some silver paint and kind of washed over that hand grenade, but that is supposed to be unpainted like the hand grenade on this swivel arm version. Those straps continue to the back in this Y pattern. The chest and back piece that have the straps that come all the way down were shared by other figures from 1982, including Grunt, Hawk, and Snake Eyes. There's a difference between the 1982 waist piece on Breaker and the one on the 1983 Breaker. The 1982 waist piece was thicker like this, and the 1983 waist piece was slimmer. Also, the belts were different, and these belt buckles look like they're both intended to be brand stamps for Hasbro. Breaker's arms feature rolled up sleeves, and those are parts that he also shared with clutch and rock and roll. You can see the difference in the 1982 and 1983 arms. Uh, the swivel on the 1983 arms was added right at that cut where the sleeve ends. These legs are pretty standard. They are shared by many of the 1982 G.I. Joe figures. It has some pouches on the sides and these are painted in silver. And then, of course, it has some pretty standard black boots. Let's take a look at the file card. This file card was printed on the back of the card on which the action figure was packaged. You can see some of the artwork from the front of the card there. You're encouraged to cut these out and keep them. It shows his faction as G.I. Joe, and it has a portrait of Breaker there. And do note that the beard on the portrait of Breaker is very faint there. almost looks like a shadow. And it may have been that this was added later. Uh, Breaker may not have originally been intended to have a beard. This says he's the communications officer and his code name is Breaker and Breaker is a slang used by CB radio operators and it's just a signal to indicate that the operator is ready to send a message. His file name is Alvin R. Kibbe. His primary military specialty is infantry. He has no secondary military specialty which is kind of odd because he is a communications expert. His birthplace is Gatling Tennessee and his grade is E4. This section says Breaker is familiar with all NATO and Warsaw Pact communications gear as well as most world export devices, specialized education, signal school, covert electronics, and Project Gamma. The Signal Corps handles all communications and information systems of the combined armed forces, so that would be appropriate for Breaker as a communications officer. Project Gamma is a special forces detachment from 1966 to 1970 that ran covert intelligence operations in Cambodia. This means by extension that Breaker served in the Vietnam conflict and if he served in Project Gamma no later than 1970 then Breaker must be older than he looks. Qualified expert M16, M1911A1, MAC-10 Ingram none of which the action figure comes with. In parentheses classified. Don't tell anyone but he speaks seven languages, nine if you include Pig Latin and Klingon. This bottom section has a quote. It says, he's efficient and self-assured and has an uncanny ability to turn adverse situations to his favor. What does this file card tell you about the character of Breaker other than just his job? Nothing, really. This bottom quote down here reads like one of those motivational posters that hangs in your supervisor's office. Taking a look at Breaker overall, the first complaint is pretty obvious. This is a very generic figure. He's really made up of parts from other action figures. He has no unique parts all on his own. And he doesn't even come with a weapon. Even though I've let him borrow one for the purposes of this video, he did not come with any firearms. So uh, he really didn't work very well as an action soldier in that first line of G.I. Joe figures, where other figures had big machine guns and submachine guns and vehicles. Breaker had none of that. Comparing Breaker with his replacement, Dial Tone, the Dial Tone figure really just goes all out with uh, paint color applications and detail and accessories, and the Breaker action figure just doesn't. That's why it's really hard for fans to be very excited about this Breaker action figure. The Breaker action figure is generic, that cannot be denied, but some collectors have complained that these 1982 G.I. Joe figures are boring. But I disagree. 
These 82 figures are wearing essentially modified uniforms of American soldiers. And people wearing uniforms very much like those were present at some of the most important events in all of human history. So generic, yes, but boring, I don't think so. They may lack the flashy colors and details of G.I. Joe figures that we would get later, but as soldiers, they represent the core of what G.I. Joe is supposed to be, and the very reason that the line was called G.I. Joe in the first place. Breaker appeared in both the G.I. Joe comic book and the cartoon, and in both of those media, he was more than just a radio man. He was also a technology nerd and a computer whiz. That gave him a little bit more to do. The Breaker action figure, as you can see, has a beard, but in the G.I. Joe comic book, Breaker did not have a beard. He was clean-shaven, and he was known for chewing bubblegum all the time and blowing bubbles. In the cartoon, Breaker did have a beard, and I think I actually prefer Breaker with the beard, uh, because in the comic book, depending on who the artist was in any given issue, if Breaker wasn't blowing his bubblegum, then he was almost indistinguishable from Grunt. So his beard makes him a little bit more distinguishable from the other very generic characters from that year. Breaker had a lot of appearances in the first year of G.I. Joe comic books, but in the later years, he kind of took a backseat uh, as new G.I. Joe characters were introduced, so you definitely didn't see him as often. However, he did meet a very tragic end, as in issue number 109, he was killed along with some other G.I. Joes. Breaker appeared in the live-action movie G.I. Joe Rise of Cobra, but his nationality was changed to Moroccan. In the G.I. Joe animated series, Breaker's role was partially taken over by a character called Sparks. Sparks was a character invented specifically for the cartoon series. He did not have an action figure in the vintage line. I much would have preferred to see Breaker more in the cartoon rather than have a character invented that sort of uh, pushed him aside. Breaker was the first G.I. Joe figure I got as a child way back in 1982, and I got the straight arm version. Now, why would Breaker be the first G.I. Joe that I would select to buy and own for myself? I've been thinking about that, and I think there are a couple reasons. First, even though there was one G.I. Joe commercial that came before it, the first G.I. Joe TV commercial that I remember seeing was the one with Breaker on the Ram motorcycle. So that was my first exposure to G.I. Joe. Secondly, I think I got this action figure with my dad, and my dad, not knowing anything about 80s G.I. Joe, may have associated the bearded Breaker with the the 1970s flocked bearded action team G.I. Joe, and so Breaker may have seemed like the main character and naturally the first one to get. Once I got the figure though, my mind was blown. Uh, before that, like a lot of other kids, I collected Star Wars, and the Star Wars action figures, they were fine, I didn't really have a problem with them, but then G.I. Joe comes out with movable elbows and movable knees, and it was just a whole new world. And after that, I'd still get Star Wars action figures every once in a while, but I was a G.I. Joe kid. As a reviewer, I have to be honest with you about this action figure's shortcomings, and it has many. But on a personal level, this figure is very special to me. It has a lot of sentimental value. This was my entry point into G.I. Joe. If not for this Breaker action figure, there might never have been a hooded Cobra Commander 788 channel. You probably wouldn't be watching this video. The course of human events may have been altered irreparably. Maybe the communists would have won the Cold War. Ever think about that? And I think it's saying something when the most generic G.I. Joe figure that was released that year still blew away any Star Wars figure that had been released before then. It just took one G.I. Joe to displace Star Wars. The other solution to the weaponless breaker that I mentioned earlier is to put breaker on the Ram motorcycle that came out that same year. Even though the the G.I. Joe comic book often features rock and roll riding the motorcycle. I think it's much more appropriate with Breaker. He can still wear all of his communications gear.
here. And while he's on the motorcycle, he has this huge Gatling gun that he can use to fight Cobra. And if he's not on the RAM, I have to admit, I just put him at the computer console in the 1983 G.I. Joe Headquarters Command Center because I don't know what else to do with him. That was my review of the 1982 and 1983 releases of Breaker. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you're thinking of getting a Breaker action figure, I hope you found it informative. If you like it, don't forget to give it a big old thumbs up on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. I've got a lot of great new G.I. Joe toy reviews coming your way. You don't want to miss them. And don't forget to like me on Facebook and follow me on Twitter. You get a lot of updates there you don't get anywhere else. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week with another vintage G.I. Joe. Joe Toy Review. Hello everybody, Hood and Cobra Commander 788 here, and at last, Cobra Month is here! Yeah! We are looking at all Cobra for the entire month of July, and we are starting with the most essential Cobra figure ever, the 1982 and 1983 version of the Cobra Trooper. I've been saving this one just for this occasion. Cobra! Take cover, we're under attack! These guys are lousy shots. They couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. Well, since I'm apparently in no danger, let's carry on with the review. HCC 788 presents Cobra. This is the Cobra Soldier, also known as the Cobra Trooper, although officially he was just called Cobra. He was introduced in 1982 in the so-called straight arm version. The figure was reintroduced in 1983 with a change in the articulation. He had a new point of articulation at the bicep referred to as swivel arm battle grip. We'll take a look at the differences in articulation later in this video. The swivel arm Cobra Soldier was available from 1983 all the way to 1985, so he was on the pegs longer than most G.I. Joe figures were. Collectors refer to the these guys as Cobra Soldiers or Cobra Troopers. They're also sometimes called Blue Shirts for obvious reasons. In public appearances, Larry Hama, the writer of the G.I. Joe comic book, also refers to these Blue Shirts as Vipers. In 1986, the Cobra Infantry Trooper, called the Viper, was introduced as an updated basic Cobra Soldier. Some fans consider the Vipers to be a separate unit from the Blue Shirts, perhaps a more advanced infantry unit. Now, Larry Hama seems to view them as the same unit with different uniforms and equipment. I like to think of them as separate troopers serving separate roles, with the blue shirts being the lowest ranked and least skilled trooper. These figures were intended to be army built, meaning kids were supposed to buy multiples of them and build a whole army. They were like the stormtroopers from Star Wars. There was nothing to individualize them, so you could buy multiples of them and pretend they're different guys. Since adult collectors also like to army build these figures, prices tend to run above average for a single complete figure. Let's take a look at the Cobra Soldier's accessory. He came with only one, the Dragonov SVD. This accessory is based on the real-world Dragonov SVD, which was a Soviet-era sniper rifle. Uh, it began service in 1963 and is still in use. It has a 10-round magazine. This is an odd choice of weapon for an unspecialized soldier. These guys are not snipers. The Cobra Officer's AK-47 may have been a better choice for the rank-and-file soldier, whereas the sniper rifle may have been a more appropriate weapon for the Cobra Officer. It'd be easy to swap these out. Based on original concept drawings that have surfaced, this is the weapon the Cobra Soldier was intended to come with. There was no mix-up. So for some reason, the design team did think this was a good accessory for this figure. Let's take a look at the articulation for the Cobra Soldier, and here's where we get into the major difference between the 1982 and 1983 version. The 1982 Cobra Soldier had the standard articulation for figures of that year, meaning he could turn his head from left to right, he could lift his arm up at the shoulder, and he could swivel at the shoulder all the way around. He also had a hinge at the elbow, so he could move at the elbow about 90 degrees, and that was all the articulation on the arm. In 1983, However, they added swivel arm battle grip, which was a new swivel at the bicep that allowed the figure to swivel his arm all the way around. This was to allow the figures to hold their weapons with a two-handed grip, and I consider it a great improvement. Beyond that, their articulation is the same. The figure was held together with a rubber O-ring that allowed him to move at the torso a bit. He could move his legs apart about so far. He could move his leg at the hip about 90 degrees, and he could bend at the knee about 90 degrees. Let's take a look at the sculpt design and color of the Cobra Soldier, and it's useful to point out the similarities 
keys to the Cobra Officer, who was released the same year. These guys look a lot alike. They are the same color. They even share similar sculpted details. But in fact, there is only one part shared between the two of them, and that is the waist piece. Other than that, all the other parts are different. On his head, we have a sculpted on helmet, a black mask that goes over his nose. He has brown eyes, which were later changed to black. This helmet looks a lot like the classic steel pot helmet. However, in the G.I. Joe comic book, it was often drawn to resemble the Nazi Waffen SS style helmet. Although the Cobra Soldier's head looks almost identical to the Cobra Officer's head, they are not the same. The Cobra Officer's helmet has a sculpted chevron that the Cobra Soldier's helmet is lacking. He has a blue shirt, hence the nickname, and he has a red Cobra emblem on it. And this Cobra emblem is slightly off-center. I don't know if you can see that. It is tilted slightly, and I don't know if this is because of poor quality control or what, but whether by accident or design, the Cobra emblem is not straight. He has black straps that continue around to his back in this Y pattern, and on this strap he has sculpted a grenade launcher with a pistol grip. We know this is a grenade launcher because on concept artwork for the Cobra Soldier, it is labeled as such. Grenade launchers with pistol grips do exist in the real world. For example, there is a pistol mount for the M203 grenade launcher, although this is not based on that. This is probably just a made-up design. His arms are blue with long sleeves and blue gloves, and on his right arm he has piano wire sculpted and painted silver. He would use this to strangle his victims. On the swivel arm version, that detail is moved from the side of the arm to the front of the arm. On his left arm, he has a couple bullet-shaped objects, which are probably grenades for his grenade launcher. On his waist, he has a black belt with some pouches and a circular belt buckle, some detail on that. The waist piece for the 1982 and 1983 version are almost identical. They are the same in structure. The only difference is the date stamp on their butts. The 1982 version says copyright 1982. The 1983 version says copyright 82-83. Again, the Cobra Officer reuses that waist piece, and it is identical as far as I can tell, even in color. This waist piece was reused for a lot of other figures. It was used for the 1983 His Tank Driver, the 1988 Tiger Force Duke. It was used on version 1 D and version 1 E of Steel Brigade. It was also used for Steel Brigade version 2, the Gold Head Steel Brigade. His legs are blue, continuing that blue uniform. On his right leg, he has a pocket. On his left leg, he has a bayonet. Uh, he has some fairly plain black boots, but most importantly, he has knee pads. These are great knee pads, and they are the first knee pads introduced in G.I. Joe. The entire mold of the 1983 Cobra Soldier was used to create the 1983 Cobra Viper Pilot and the 1989 Python Patrol Officer. I think this uniform evokes a Nazi vibe. It has a large logo, the iconic Cobra head, and you could easily picture a swastika in its place. The Cobra Soldier is not camouflage. I think Cobra intends for you to see their troops coming. They want to inspire fear upon their approach. The designer of this figure for Hasbro, Ron Rudat, said he wanted the Cobra Soldier to have a mask because he wanted the enemy to be nameless and faceless, not designating any specific ethnic group. I imagine the mask as a symbol of the submersion of the individual's identity into the collective cult of Cobra under the absolute rule of Cobra Commander. It's not to hide the soldier's identity. Who really cares who's under the mask. It's to show that his identity no longer matters. He has joined with something that he considers greater than himself. Let's take a look at the file card, and I have a couple here because I have a variant. The text is the same, but most file cards were clipped from the carded retail packaging, so you'll see some of the artwork on the flip side. This file card has a plain red backing. No artwork on the back, just plain red. There were a few ways to get these red back file cards. One was through mail order. The Cobra Soul was available as a mail-away direct from Hasbro for a while. Uh, another way was in multi-packs, which were available very early in the line. Also, the Cobra Soldier was among the figures packed with the 1982 Sears-exclusive Cobra Missile Command Headquarters, and those would have come with red back file cards. It has its faction as Cobra, and it has a portrait of the Cobra Soldier here, and I do love this artwork. I've been mesmerized by this artwork since the first time I saw it. Up here it says Cobra, not Cobra Soldier, not Cobra Trooper, just Cobra, and it has his code name as The Enemy, and of course that's not really a code name. This was done really on all of the early Cobra file cards. The Cobra Officer just says code name The Enemy, the His Tank Driver has code name The Enemy, and even Cobra Commander just has his code name as Enemy Leader. His file name is un 
unknown, and of course we're not talking about an individual. He would have various file names. His primary military specialty is infantry, secondary military specialty is sabotage, birthplace is various countries, and grade is E4 or equivalent. I think of these blue shirts as the troopers who have completed whatever Cobra considers basic training. So their ranks should be the lowest, uh, like E1 through maybe E4. Troopers that have advanced to higher ranks and received advanced infantry training would become Vipers. This section says one of the nameless, faceless legions of Cobra Command. Each Cobra, again referring to him just as Cobra, is highly skilled in the use of explosives, all NATO and Warsaw Pact, small arms, sabotage, and the martial arts. Qualified experts Scorpion VZOR-61 machine pistol, Dragunov SVD sniper's rifle, Uzi submachine gun, and M16. This bottom section has a quote. It says, Cobras swear absolute loyalty to their fanatical leader, Cobra Commander. Their goal to conquer the world for their own evil purpose. This file card depicts a fanatical enemy that cannot be reasoned with and is bent on world domination. The perfect enemy for G.I. Joe. Since the Cobra Soldier was the basic G.I. Joe enemy, he was all over G.I. Joe media. They appeared in the very first episode of the cartoon series and frequently thereafter. They still appear in the cartoon after the introduction of the Cobra Viper, and they even appear sometimes in the same episodes as the Viper, which confirms that they were not replaced by the Viper. The Cobra soldiers were notorious for shooting a lot of lasers, but never being able to hit anything. Maybe if you guys moved a little closer, that would help. Still nothing. In the G.I. Joe comic book, they appeared in issue number one, surrounded with a lot of fascist imagery. They even flashed Nazi salutes. In issue number eight, which was notably not written by Larry Hama, we get a glimpse of the Cobra soldiers' fanatical loyalty to Cobra Commander, as they choose to die, rather than be rescued and taken prisoner by G.I. Joe. In issue number 38, through flashbacks with the aid of the brainwave scanner, we see the beginnings of the Cobra army, with the earliest soldiers wearing street clothes and masks tied around their faces. They are marching under the promise of something greater. How does Cobra gain the loyalty of so many recruits? In issue number 43, we see how Wade Collins joined Cobra. Wade Collins was a war buddy of G.I. Joe's Stalker and Snake Eyes and the ninja Storm Shadow, and he eventually became a Crimson Guardsman. He was a disaffected Vietnam veteran who was searching for something to belong to. That's how Cobra would get their grip on people. They they would find people who felt downtrodden, like outsiders. They would find them at their lowest point and promise them a role in their movement. They may be a small cog in the machine, but at least they meant something. The Viper didn't replace the basic Cobra Trooper in the comic book either. The blue shirt continued to appear after the introduction of the Viper. Looking at this figure overall, even though it's kind of a plain and simple figure, it will always be a top tier figure in my book. I was super excited about this figure when I was a kid, and I still love it. Love it. This figure embodies what Cobra means to me, even more so than iconic figures like Cobra Commander and the Baroness. These blue shirts are the backbone of Cobra, and the Cobra Trooper was a monumental figure. Look at what this figure launched. It introduced an enemy for G.I. Joe, which immediately gave the Joe universe more depth. It provided a color for the enemy, blue. So if all you wanted to do with G.I. Joe was have play battles, you had your blue team and you had your green team, and you didn't have to go into any more depth than that. It gave us that iconic Cobra logo in its most recognized color, red. And that logo was emblazoned on everything. It was a visual cue that required no explanation. It became a stand-in for any enemy of the United States, particularly drawing on Nazi imagery. This idea of the brainwashed enemy that's bent on destruction was the incarnation of all of our fears. And most importantly, he introduced knee pads. When the new G.I. Joe was created by Hasbro, there was no enemy for G.I. Joe. If you look at the earliest card backs, you only see the Joes listed, not Cobra. Kirk Bozigian, who was in charge of the G.I. Joe brand at the time, just thought G.I. Joe would fight other toys in the kids' toy box. G.I. Joe would fight Star Wars, just the same way that Hasbro was fighting Kenner in the marketplace. That's really a marketing mentality. Since the marketer is fighting against Star Wars, the assumption is that's how the kids will play as well. When the concept was presented to Marvel to add their creative input, it was Marvel editor Archie Goodwin who first suggested an enemy for G.I. Joe called Cobra, similar to Hydra in the Marvel Universe. It seems so 
elemental now, but Marvel understood what Hasbro hadn't quite figured out yet. Marketing toys in the 1980s wasn't just about hawking plastic. It was about universe building. It was about using media tie-ins such as cartoons and comic books to create characters that kids would connect with and stories that would become the basis for their play. G.I. Joe followed that 80s formula to great success. In a lot of ways, it blazed the trail for other toy lines. They did it better than just about anyone else for a long time, and the introduction of Cobra was vital to that success. All right, that's enough of that. This is my video, and you guys better clear out of here. Retreat! Retreat! That was my review of the 1982 and 1983 Cobra Trooper. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you subscribe on YouTube so you don't miss anything. Like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter, comment, and share this video. You don't want any of your friends to miss Cobra Month. Cobra Month continues next week. I'll see you then. And remember, until next time, only Cobra is Cobra. Hello, everybody. Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here, and I'm back with another vintage G.I. Joe toy review. And this week, we are going to look at another figure from 1982. I did not intend for September to be a theme month, but we've been rolling with these 1982 figures, so we might as well finish up the month with another one. Why is it important that we look at these 1982 figures? It's important because you have got to know your roots. Whether it be music or art or literature, you've got to understand where you came from to make any sense of where you're going. And these 1982 figures were the foundation of 80s and 90s G.I. Joe. So with these reviews, we are building our foundation. So when we look at figures that came later, we will understand them better because we took the time to build the foundation. So let's build a little more this week. We're going to look at a bad guy this time. Let's look at the 1982 and the 1983 versions of the Cobra Officer. This is the Cobra Officer, the enemy of G.I. Joe. He was first introduced in 1982 in this so-called straight arm version. It was called straight arm because it had only one point of articulation here at the elbow. He could not swivel his arm. In 1983, he was reissued with swivel arm battle grip, which added this swivel at the bicep so he could hold his weapon with a two-handed grip. The straight arm version was available only in 1982. The swivel arm version was available in 1983 and 1984. It was discontinued in 1985. And in 1985, the closest to a replacement for this figure was the Crimson Guard. But the Crimson Guard wasn't really a replacement for the Cobra Officer. The Crimson Guard was a new separate unit within Cobra. The Cobra Officer was available in a lot of ways other than carded for retail. He was available with the 1982 Cobra Missile Command headquarters. He was also in a J.C. Penny exclusive three-pack in which he came with the mortar that originally came with short fuse. In 1986 through 1987, he was available from Hasbro Direct as part of their original Adventure Team set. In 1989, he was available as an individual bagged figure, so this guy was available for a long time and in a lot of different ways. In 1984, the entire mold of the swivel arm Cobra Officer was reused for the Stinger driver and came with the 1984 Stinger Jeep. In 1989, the entire mold for the swivel arm Cobra Officer was reused for the Python Patrol Python Trooper. Let's take a look at the Cobra Officer's accessory and he came with only one, this AK-47 assault rifle. The AK-47 was also known as the Kalashnikov AK. So what I'm saying is the AK-47 is AKA the Kalashnikov AK. The AK-47 is a Russian weapon that first saw service in 1949 and is still widely used around the world. Um, it's used a lot because of its generally low production cost and its overall reliability. The Cobra Officer's original accessory is a very dark gray. In 1984, in Battle Gear Accessory Pack Number 2, they reissued this same weapon but in a blue color. And you often see Cobra Officers coming with this blue rifle, but that blue, even though 
it does closely match the color of the uniform. That is not the original. The original is this dark gray. I don't know if the Cobra Officer rifle would be considered a rare accessory, but I did have a heck of a time finding a loose one. There is some controversy as to whether the Cobra Officer was originally intended to come with this AK-47. The 1982 Cobra Soldier came with a Dragunov sniper rifle, which is a more specialized weapon, and the officer came with the more generalized assault rifle. You would expect that to be reversed. To add to the confusion, when Python Patrol came out, the mold for the Cobra Soldier was reused for the Python Patrol officer, and the mold for the Cobra officer was reused for the Python Patrol trooper, and so the officer then had the sniper rifle, and the trooper had the assault rifle. There are some fan theories out there, and some have speculated that somewhere in the design process, the Cobra officer got the accessory that was intended for the Cobra soldier. Well, if that's the case, then there was also a mix-up on the card art, because the packaging for the Cobra officer clearly depicts him with this AK-47. Let's take a look at the articulation on the Cobra officer. The 1982 version of the Cobra officer had the typical articulation for figures of that year, uh, meaning he could turn his head from left to right. He could also lift his arm up at the shoulder about so far, and he could swivel at the shoulder all the way around. He did have that hinge at the elbow, so he could move at the elbow about 90 degrees. Uh, he was held together with a rubber O-ring that looped around the inside, so he could move at the torso a little bit. Uh, he could move his legs apart about so far. He could move his leg at the hip about 90 degrees, and he could bend at the knee about 90 degrees. The swivel arm Cobra officer had the same articulation as the straight arm Cobra officer, but he did have that new point of articulation at the bicep. He could now swivel his arm all the way around at the bicep. Let's take a look at the sculpt design and color of the Cobra officer, and let's make a quick note here. Uh, you can see my Cobra officers are different colors. The straight arm version is darker than the swivel arm version. Uh, however, uh, this is probably attributable to sun damage. Uh, this has been exposed to a lot of sunlight. Uh, the color on it has darkened, but the original color for the Cobra Officer should pretty closely match the color for the Cobra Soldier. That would be the original color, and this one appears to be discolored. The head features a blue non-removable helmet and a black mask that goes over his nose. On G.I. Joe team members, I prefer to have the helmets be removable, but I don't really mind the non-removable helmets on Cobra figures. The head for the Cobra Officer is almost identical to the Cobra Soldier, but as you can see, the Cobra Officer has this chevron molded onto his helmet, and the Cobra Soldier does not. The chest features that classic Cobra blue uniform, and he has web gear, more elaborate web gear than the Cobra Soldier, and some additional paint apps. We have gray on the shoulders, and we have this gray device here on the belt. His straps carry on to the back, again, with a different profile than what you see on the Cobra Soldier. And then on his chest is this very troublesome silver Cobra sigil. This silver paint is notorious for being very easy to rub off. It's Nowadays, it's hard to find a Cobra officer with uh, his Cobra sigil completely perfect in mint condition. A lot of them are scratched away like this, and some of them, the Cobra sigil is completely gone. This is actually the the best one out of all of the Cobra officers I have. Here are all of the Cobra officers I have with their Cobra sigils in various states. Uh, this one looks like he's got some road rash there. This one is just barely visible, and this one here is completely worn away. His arms are blue, long sleeves. He features these rings here at the cuff and black gloves. There was a change between 1982 and 1983. The 1982 version had this single ring at his cuff and the 1983 version had a double ring at the cuff. There's a very minor variant on the straight arm version. Some of the straight arm Cobra officers featured thick thumbs and some featured thin thumbs and this I believe is the thin thumb version but my straight arm Cobra officer also has the ultra rare no thumbs variant. The 1983 Cobra officer's arms were reused for the swivel arm Cobra Commander version 1.5 however the straight arm version of Cobra Commander did not reuse the straight arm Cobra officer's arms. The straight arm Cobra Commander had unique arms. Another good way to tell the Cobra officer 
apart from the Cobra soldier is the gloves. Cobra officer had black gloves and the Cobra soldier had blue gloves. This waist piece features a black belt. It's got some pouches, pretty plain on the back. We've got some pockets there. Uh, the trousers are the same color as the shirt. The waist pieces on the 1982 and 1983 Cobra officers are the same. However, they do have different date stamps on the butt. On 1982 Cobra officer, it says copyright 1982 Hasbro. On the 1983 Cobra Officer, it says copyright 8283 Hasbro. This waist piece was reused on a lot of other figures. It was used on the 1982 Cobra Soldier. That is the only part that the Cobra Officer and the Cobra Soldier share. Even though the figures look a lot alike, other than the waist piece, they share no other parts. It was used on the 1983 Hiss Tank Driver. In 1988, it was used on Tiger Force Duke, and it was used on some versions of Steel Brigade. It was used on version 1D and version 1E of Steel Brigade. His legs are blue. His right leg is pretty plain, nothing there. His left leg features a black dagger. And then he has some pretty plain black boots. The Cobra Soldier also features a black dagger on his left leg, but it is not the same dagger. The one on the Cobra Officer is more ornate. The Cobra Soldier features these really cool knee pads, and the Cobra Officer does not have knee pads. And I gotta admit, I really like the knee pads. And the Cobra Soldier's boots are more detailed. So with these added details, I may prefer the Cobra Soldier figure over the Cobra Officer. Let's take a look at the file card, and I have have two file cards here because I wanted to point out something. Most of your Cobra Officer file cards would have been printed on the back of the card on which the action figure was packaged. So on the flip side, you'll see some of the artwork from the front of the card like this. Uh, this would have been from the 1983 swivel arm version because you can see a little bit of the advertisement for the new swivel arm battle grip. The Cobra Officers that came as a mail away or that came with the 1982 Missile Command headquarters feature a plain red back like this, no artwork on the back. Uh, this is probably from the Missile Command headquarters because those figures were actually sealed on the back of the card on a bubble and this has that ripped off. Whereas the mail away Cobra officers uh, were in bags and the file card was just an insert in the bag. So this is probably from the Missile Command headquarters. I do not normally seek out those red back file cards because they're usually a bit more expensive, uh, but since I had one, I thought I'd show you an example. The file card has his faction as Cobra, naturally. It has a portrait of a Cobra officer. It says his specialty is Cobra officer, and his code name is The Enemy. Okay, this is kind of a weird thing they did on the 1982 Cobra file cards. It just said code name The Enemy, and that's not really a code name. They did the same thing on the Cobra soldier, who they didn't really call a Cobra soldier, they just called Cobra. Again, code name the enemy. Uh, even Cobra Commander, um, his code name was Enemy Leader. Uh, in 1983, even the His Tank Driver uh, still had code name the enemy. That was the year after this. In 1983, they were still doing that. And then in 1984, uh, the Cobra Stinger Driver carried over this code name the enemy. Uh, this file card is textually almost identical to the Cobra Officer with just some minor changes. It says, file name unknown, and that's not really true. Cobra would have had many officers, so this file card really does not feature an individual. Uh, this really should say file name various. There would have been a lot of Cobra officers within the Cobra organization. His primary military specialty is infantry, secondary military specialty is artillery and intelligence, and his birthplace is various countries, which is correct. They should have essentially done the same thing for the file name. It has his grade as 04 or equivalent and 04 is a major, and I don't think that's correct. Uh, that would give him the same rank as Major Blood, and I don't think a Cobra officer should have the same rank as a major, no pun intended, character like Major Blood. In my view, a Cobra officer should have any officer rank, second lieutenant and up, but would be below any of the command officers like Major Blood, the 
Baroness, Destro, and Cobra Commander. This section says Cobra officers are frontline fighters who lead Cobra attack units into battle. Many are also believed to be operating as spies at defense plants, nuclear power facilities, etc. All are martial arts experts, masters of disguise, deceit, and demolitions. What they're describing here is a fifth column, which is a group that is intended to undermine an enemy from within. And that really pretty well describes what the Crimson Guard was intended to do. Qualified expert AK-47 assault rifle, PM-63 machine pistol, M16 Ingram M11 submachine gun. There's a quote here down at the bottom that says, Cobra officers are dedicated to destroying G.I. Joe and the American way of life. Beware, they are extremely dangerous enemies! Exclamation point, end quote. This file card doesn't tell you anything about the personality of a Cobra officer, but it isn't intended to. As I said earlier, there would have been many Cobra officers within Cobra, so this file card is describing all Cobra officers. Now this may seem kind of plain, but for kids in 1982, this probably would have been enough to get them excited about this new enemy of G.I. Joe. Let's talk about rank within Cobra. When the Cobra officer came out, uh, the main difference between him and the Cobra soldier is the Cobra soldier had a red Cobra symbol and the Cobra officer had a silver Cobra symbol. So that silver symbol seemed to be some kind of officer designation. In 1983, the His Tank Drive also an officer, had the silver cobra symbol, but in 1984, the Baroness, definitely an officer, had the red cobra symbol, and Cobra Commander, the highest ranking cobra officer of them all, had the red cobra symbol. In 1983, the Cobra Viper pilot, who reused the Cobra Soldier's mold, and who was not an officer, had the silver cobra symbol. Both the Cobra Officer and Cobra Commander had these little emblems here on their collars and that probably means something but the rank insignia within Cobra was never very clearly defined looking at the Cobra officer overall the first obvious thing about him is he looks almost identical to the Cobra soldier in fact if that silver Cobra symbol is worn off at a distance it's almost impossible to tell them apart these blue uniforms would work pretty well at night they would be pretty stealthy at night but they're not very good camouflage at all for daytime operations. Cobra seems to have a different philosophy, though. They want to be seen. They want their enemy to see a huge wave of Cobra officers and Cobra soldiers coming over the hill, and they want that to inspire fear in their enemy. The Cobra officer was depicted in various G.I. Joe media, but he often got folded in with the Cobra soldier. I guess when you're drawing throngs of Cobra troopers, uh, there's not much point in differentiating between soldier and officer. The G.I. Joe comic book tended to focus on one particular Cobra officer called Scarface, and he was a part of a story arc in the early comic books featuring Snake Eyes, Quinn, and Dr. Venom. The Scarface character started a bit of an urban legend among my friends. Since the character was featured in the comic book, naturally we expected to get an action figure, but there was no action figure for Scarface face, but the legend went that some Cobra officers were sculpted with scars under the eyes like the Scarface character, but there was no designation on the package. You just had to look at the action figure and see if you could find the ones with the scar. So when we went to the toy department, we would look at all of the Cobra officers. We would stare very closely at each one to see if we could find the one with the scar. But of course, we never found one because there never was one. Here's an interesting little bit of history about Cobra. Originally, Hasbro did not design any bad guys for G.I. Joe. In fact, if you look at the earliest carded example of G.I. Joe figures from 1982, it does not feature any Cobra figures on the cross cell on the back of the cards. The idea for Cobra came from Marvel Comics editor Archie Goodwin, who suggested an organization similar to Hydra in the Marvel Comics universe. When we did finally get Cobra action figures, the only figures that were available at retail were the Cobra Soldier and the Cobra Officer. Cobra Commander wasn't available until later as an exclusive mail-away offer. What a fortuitous suggestion on the part of Archie Goodwin. Would G.I. Joe have been as popular as it
became without its nemesis, Cobra. The Cobra officer was a good figure for its time, but he was overshadowed by the more detailed and more specialized Cobra troopers that came later, like the Snow Serpent, uh, like the Cobra Viper. But one thing I like about the Cobra officer is he is still an officer, and that means he's a leader. So a Cobra officer could lead a squad of any of these more specialized Cobras, except for the Crimson Guard. I kind of see the Crimson Guard as a totally separate unit within Cobra with its own unique command structure. I really like seeing the Cobra officer in a command position over these other Cobra troopers because amidst all of these uh, more specialized troops, I really enjoy seeing that classic Cobra blue. That was my review of the 1982 and 1983 Cobra officer. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you're thinking of getting a Cobra officer, I hope you found it informative. If you liked it, make sure you give it a big fat thumbs up on YouTube and don't forget to hit the subscribe button. I've got a lot of great new G.I. Joe toy reviews coming up. You don't want to miss them. Don't forget to like me on Facebook and follow me on Twitter. You get a lot of updates there you don't get anywhere else. And don't forget for my 500 subscriber giveaway, I am giving away a G.I. Joe vamp and swivel arm clutch action figure. Make sure you check out my video for that for the rules and don't forget to enter. You don't want to miss out on that. Thanks everyone for watching. I'll see you next week with another vintage G.I. Joe toy review. See you then. Hello everybody, Honey Cobra Commander 78 here. It's time for another vintage G.I. Joe toy review and I had a hard time deciding what I was going to review this week until I finally settled on Flash since there was a good positive response to my quick shot of Flash. I love looking at these old 1982 Joes. I really enjoyed the impromptu theme month that we did so I'm happy to look at another one of the original Green 13. What do you think of when you hear Flash? Do you think of the superhero that runs really fast? Maybe you think of Roscoe P. Coltrane's dog. Or maybe you think of Flash Gordon. Flash. Flash Gordon. Everybody knows the Buster Crab Flash Gordon is the only real Flash Gordon, but you probably don't think of a G.I. Joe character from 1982. Flash was a character that was mostly forgotten after 1982, the year that he was released. But here at the HCC 788 channel, we never forget our roots. So let's take a look at Flash. This is Flash, G.I. Joe's laser rifle trooper from 1982. He was in the first series of G.I. Joe figures when the line was relaunched that year. He was first available in 1982 in this so-called straight arm version. He was reissued in 1983 with a new point of articulation with this so-called swivel arm version. I will explain what those terms mean later in this video. The swivel arm version of Flash was also available in 1984. He was discontinued for the year 1985 and in 1986 there was a new laser rifle trooper, Sci-Fi. The presence of Flash in that first wave of G.I. Joe figures means that there were science fiction elements within G.I. Joe from the very beginning of the line. It wasn't purely realistic military. Flash is often confused with Grand Slam, another figure that was available at the same time, a figure that also had these red pads and came with a helmet and visor. It's a little known fact, but Flash's pads are actually white. White. But once a month, for about a week, they turn red and nobody knows why. You get it? Anybody? Flash was one of the original Green 13. He was one of the first 13 members of G.I. Joe, and just look at him, they're mostly green. Let's take a look at Flash's accessories. He is a laser rifle trooper, so he comes with a laser rifle. And this is the XMLR-1A shoulder-fired laser rifle, and it has an attached wire here that connects to his backpack. This is a fantasy weapon. It is not based on a real-world design, but it does have a lot of detail added to make it look more realistic. The laser rifle has a thin curved stock and that is easily broken off as is this wire that connects to it so do be careful with those easily broken parts. Now this is a science fiction weapons but lasers are real. Lasers do exist and when they are weaponized they're considered to be a type of directed energy weapon. Most weaponized lasers are gas dynamic lasers which use a lasing medium gas which becomes very hot and I think that's why Flash has this 
protective padding. The Soviets were the first to develop a handheld laser back in 1984 for use by their cosmonauts. In most cases, a laser rifle would be inferior to a regular rifle, a firearm. It would be most useful as a cutting tool or to blind the enemy. If you did want a laser as a personal battlefield weapon, it might look a lot like this. It would require a lot of energy from an energy source that would probably be heavy and bulky and would probably be in a backpack like this. In 1983, G.I. Joe finally won its battle against the laws of physics with the introduction of the XMLR 3A laser rifle with the 1983 Snow Job. The XMLR 3A that came with Snow Job is supposed to be the next generation laser rifle from Flash's XMLR 1A, and it became the standard laser rifle in the G.I. Joe animated series. I've never been a big fan of these fantasy weapons, these laser guns. I've always preferred the more realistic accessories for G.I. Joe, and I felt like every time we got one of these fantasy weapons, I was being cheated out of a really nice replica of a real-world weapon for my G.I. Joes. As an adult collector, I can appreciate the design and the detail of these fantasy weapons, but as a kid, I really wanted the more realistic G.I. Joe accessories. In 1983, Hasbro released the first Battle Gear accessory pack, which included some reissues of figure accessories in different color plastic, and one of the accessories released in the first Battle Gear accessory pack was Flash's laser rifle, but it was done in this lighter color gray. Comparing the accessory pack version of the laser rifle to the original, you can see the accessory pack version is a lighter color gray, but if you didn't have the original accessory to compare it to, it could be very easy to mistake this one for the original. The original laser rifle is not quite a true black, it is a very dark gray. Flash's next accessory is this clear visor, and this visor clips onto the helmet. Uh, these little tabs on the inside of the visor uh, clip on to the holes in the sides of the helmet. These visors are clear, they are tiny, they are very easily lost, and if you're looking to replace one, they can be almost as expensive as the figure itself. A laser, even a lower powered laser, can be very damaging to the human eye, which is why I think Flash wears this protective visor. Of course, the visor attached to the helmet, and this is a standard helmet that came with most 1982 G.I. Joe action figures, and it is in this medium green color, which matches the color of Flash's uniform. This helmet should not be confused with the helmet of Grand Slam, which is a darker color green to match the darker green of his uniform. There were a lot of G.I. Joe figures released in 1982 with this exact same helmet. Clutch, Grunt, Breaker, Hawk, and Short Fuse all had an identical helmet. Although the green may discolor over the years, there are a lot of these helmets floating around, so if you need to replace one, you really shouldn't have any trouble finding one. Flash's final accessory is his backpack, which serves as a power source for his laser. The backpack has some detail, not a lot of detail, but I guess this is impressive for 1982. One peculiar thing about this backpack, it is contoured to the shape of the back, and when it's put on the way it's meant to be, uh, the hole for the wire on the laser rifle is connected on the left side, which suggests that Flash is left-handed and should carry his laser rifle in his left hand. One problem I have with this theory is this curved stock does look like it's shaped to fit on the inside of his right arm. So I do think this wire is supposed to run from the left side of the backpack to the right hand. There is a difference between the 1982 version of this backpack and the 1983 version. The original 1982 version that came with the straight arm flash had this shorter and kind of squared off peg, uh, whereas the 1983 version with swivel arm flash had kind of a longer peg with a rounded tip. Let's take a look at Flash's articulation, and this is where there's a major difference between the 1982 version of Flash and 1983. Uh, the original version of Flash could turn his head from left to right like that. He could also lift his arm up at the shoulder, and he could swivel it at the shoulder all the way around. And then he had the single point of articulation at the elbow. He could move at the elbow about 90 degrees. In 1983, they added a new point of articulation on the arm. Not only could he move at the elbow about 90 degrees, but he had a swivel at the bicep so he could swivel his arm all the way around. This was referred to as swivel arm battle grip. Both versions of the figure were held together with a rubber O-ring that looped around the inside. That allowed them to move at the torso a little bit. Uh, he could move his legs apart about so far. He could move his leg at the hip about 90 degrees, and he could bend at the knee about 90 degrees. Let's take a look at the sculpt design and color of Flash, starting with his head, and his head is very plain with a neutral expression. He is a Caucasian 
with brown hair, and that's really all there is to say about him. There's really not much to distinguish Flash. In 1982, G.I. Joe figures were really bad about reusing parts, including head sculpts. In fact, Flash has a twin in the 1982 G.I. Joe line, the 1982 Mobat tank driver, Steeler. Flash and Steeler have the exact same head sculpt and even the same hair color. This same head sculpt was used four times in 1982. Flash and Steeler had it. Hawk and Short Fuse also had the same head sculpt, but with blonde hair instead of brown. This is one way you can distinguish between Flash and Grand Slam. They both have the same hair color, but Grand Slam has a different head sculpt. On his chest, Flash has those very bright red pads with silver straps that continue on to the back. This chest with the red pads and the silver straps was reused for Grand Slam, but the green uniform on Grand Slam is a darker color green than the uniform on Flash. Flash's arms feature sculpted pads on his biceps and brown gloves, and you can see a little bit of sculpting of additional pads on the back of his hands. The swivel arm version of Flash, in addition to having the new point of articulation, also has just painted on patches on his arms rather than the sculpted red pads. There's a difference in the waist piece between the 1982 and 1983 versions of Flash. The 1982 Flash has this thicker waist piece with a wide belt and an H-shaped belt buckle. 1983 Flash has a thinner waist piece with a more detailed belt and a different shaped belt buckle. Flash's legs feature more red pads, these kind of oval-shaped pads here, and he has boot covers with what looks like buckles that go around the back and brown boots. Let's take a look at Flash's file card. Now, this file card was printed on the back of the card on which the action figure was packaged. You can see some of the artwork on the front of the card there, and you can tell this is a card from 1982 Flash because in 1983, the swivel arm version of Flash advertised the new swivel arm battle grip and down in this corner of the card. It has its faction as G.I. Joe. It has a nice portrait of Flash right here. It says he is the laser rifle trooper, and his code name is Flash. His final name is Anthony S. Gumbello. His primary military specialty is infantry. His secondary military specialty is electronics and CBR. This CBR stands for chemical, biological, and radiological. This is often seen as CBRN, uh, which is chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear. The U.S. Army has a CBRN school at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, and if Flash is a specialist at CBR, I'd have to assume that he attended that school. This section says, Flash is highly skilled in many aspects of electronic technology and is capable of equipment repair in the field. Specialized education, electronic school, chemical school, and maybe this is referring to that CBRN school at Fort Leonard Wood. Uh, covert electronics, qualified expert M16, M1911A1, XMLR1A shoulder fired laser rifle, which of course is the accessory that he comes with. This bottom section has a quote. It says, Flash is methodical and persistent. He has an innate and unshakable faith in the order of the universe. He's working on his master's degree in electronic engineering, in parentheses, nights. During the day, he's too busy G.I. Joeing, so he has to moonlight. These 1982 file cards really didn't contain a lot of information. Compare that to a 1985 file card uh, for Crankcase. You can see the text is tiny and it's squeezed in here. They squeeze a lot of information on this file card. Uh, but these early 1982 file cards really gave us just a very basic rundown on the character. Flash did appear in G.I. Joe Media. In the cartoon series, he did appear infrequently, uh, and his specialty was changed from a laser rifle trooper to a flamethrower. Uh, but in the cartoon, everybody used a laser rifle, so having a laser rifle specialist was really unnecessary. In the G.I. Joe comic book, he first appeared in issue number one, where he used his laser rifle as a cutting tool, which again is how I think it would be most effectively used. Flash did appear in other issues of the G.I. Joe comic book, but there are some peculiarities with his appearances. Uh, for instance, in issue number six, Grand Slam is selected for a mission, but in issue number seven, we see that Flash is actually on the mission. I think Flash and Grand Slam are so similar that even Larry Hama, the writer of the G.I. Joe comic book, had a hard time telling them apart and got them mixed up. In issue number 50 of the comic book, Flash appears, but he calls himself Zap. Now, Zap is the code name of one of his teammates, the Bazooka Soldier. Uh, Zap has nothing to do with laser rifles, and he doesn't even look like Flash, so this is just a straight-up error. Taking a look at Flash overall, it is very difficult to rate this figure. He's constructed entirely of reused parts from other action figures, so it's very difficult for me to give him a top-tier rating. However, he does seem like a special action figure. He really stands out among his peers, so it 
it kind of seems like he deserves some special recognition. I can tell you that I did not like this action figure as a kid. I really didn't like the red pads. At the time, my other G.I. Joe figures were all green, and I kind of liked it that way. But when I saw these red pads, I kind of saw this. It looked like he was making a big target of himself in the field. Also, I was not on board with these laser guns, these science fiction features that they were sneaking in with my army toys. I'm much more accepting of things like bright colors in G.I. Joe now as an adult collector than I was as a kid. As a kid, I was kind of merciless. I wanted a military toy line, not this science fiction stuff. That's still my preference, and there are some science fiction elements in G.I. Joe that still really bother me. But but I'm much less hard-nosed about it now, and I'm very happy to have Flash in my collection. I can also appreciate the fantasy elements in early G.I. Joe. Yes, they had some laser rifles, but they did not go overboard. It wasn't until later in the line that we got clones, mutants, and aliens. And comparing Flash to some of the goofy stuff that came out later in the line, he looks almost subdued and realistic. A lot of my viewers have said that Flash was the very first G.I. Joe action figure they got, so apparently this figure appealed to other kids a lot more than it appealed to me. I hate to disagree with the general opinion of my viewership, but when it comes right down to it, I'm still not a fan of lasers, and I still prefer the more realistic military G.I. Joes. So while Flash is a favorite of a lot of G.I. Joe fans, my favorite figure from 1982 is still going to be my old buddy Stalker. That was my review of the 1982 and 1983 Flash. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you're thinking of getting one of these action figures, I hope you found it informative. If you liked it, don't forget to give it a thumbs up on YouTube and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. I've got a lot of great new G.I. Joe toy reviews coming up. You don't want to miss them. And don't forget to like me on Facebook and follow me on Twitter. You get a lot of updates there you don't get anywhere else. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week with another vintage G.I. Joe toy review. Hello everybody, Hood and Core Commander 788 here. It's time for another vintage G.I. Joe toy review and I have made a mistake. There is an unwritten rule on this channel that I should review the first version of any figure before I review any subsequent versions. But there's one example where I did not follow that rule. I reviewed version 2 of Grunt with the Falcon Glider before I reviewed version 1. Well, we're going to fix that right now. We're going to look at G.I. Joe's first infantry trooper from 1982, codenamed Grunt. I know whenever I review one of these 1982 figures, not as many people are going to watch. But I don't care. This is important. This is our history. This is our origin. And I'm going to review every damn one of them. In fact, it's going to be a sad day for me when I finally reviewed the last of these 1982 figures. And I won't have the opportunity to go back and look at them anymore. But we're going to look at one today. HCC 788 presents Grunt. This is Grunt, G.I. Joe's Infantry Trooper from 1982, the first series of G.I. Joe when the line was relaunched that year. Now we have two figures here. Uh, they are similar, but there are some differences, uh, and we will look at both of them. In 1982, version 1 of Grunt was released, and this is referred to as Straight Arm Grunt. Straight Arm because of the single point of articulation at the elbow. Uh, in 1983, version 1.5 of Grunt was issued. This was a reissue of Grunt, but he had a new point of articulation, a, a swivel at the bicep that was referred to as Swivel Arm Battle Grip. Also in 1983, version 2 of Grunt was issued. A version 2 of Grunt was an exact copy of version 1.5, but in different colors. And version 2 of Grunt was a vehicle driver. He was the pilot of the Falcon Glider. There was a third version of Grunt, but I don't want to look at that one right now. We will look at that one when the time comes. Infantry refers to a foot soldier. An infantry trooper is a soldier that fights on foot. Uh, and so when troops are sent into combat, it's the infantry troops that are literally the boots on the ground. Grunt is a very basic army soldier, and so Grunt is most like the original G.I. Joe action soldier from 1964. Of course, G.I. Joe back then was 12 inches tall, and G.I. Joe in the 1980s was reduced to 3 and 3 quarter inches. Because Grunt is a very basic army soldier, 
Carter, he serves as the prototype for G.I. Joe's green shirts, which were non-differentiated soldiers that were sometimes seen in the background of G.I. Joe cartoons. Let's take a look at Grunt's accessories, starting with his weapon. This is his M16 rifle, and this is a pretty good replica of the real-world M16. You can see it's got decent detail there, and this is appropriate for the basic infantry trooper's weapon. It looks a little bit underscaled, though. When Grunt is carrying it, it looks just a little bit too small. Comparing Grunt's M16 with other M16s in the G.I. Joe line, we can see the one that came with the 1983 Airborne is about the same size, as is the one that came with the 1985 Footloose. Of course, Airborne uh, had an, a bayonet on his, and Footloose had a strap on his. Uh, Grunt's M16 had neither of those. Uh, then we have the one that came with Leatherneck, and this one uh, looks uh, is quite a bit larger. In fact, this one looks like it might be slightly overscaled. Next, let's look at Grunt's helmet, and Grunt came with the standard helmet that came with a lot of G.I. Joe action figures in 1982. In fact, I think it came with most G.I. Joe action figures in 1982. Uh, there's not a lot of detail on it. It has a couple holes in the side of the uh, helmet. You could clip a visor to that, but Grunt did not come with a visor. It's in this medium green color, which should pretty closely match Grunt's uniform. Grunt's final accessory is his combat backpack, and this is a really tiny backpack. Uh, it's really, I think, just too small. It's very dinky looking, not a lot of detail. It's so small that when you put it on the action figure uh, facing the front, you can't even tell he's wearing a backpack. The sculpting on the 1982 and 1983 backpacks are the same, but the pegs are different. Uh, the pegs on the 1982 backpack are a little bit shorter and stubbier and squared off, whereas the pegs on the 1983 backpacks are a little bit longer, slimmer, and rounded at the end, and they do fit into the uh, backs of the action figures differently. So you will need to make sure you get the right backpack for your action figure. Now let's look at the articulation on Grunt, and this is where there is a significant difference between the 1982 and 1983 releases. Uh, both of them could swivel their heads at the neck, uh, they could lift their arms up at the shoulder and swivel at the shoulder all the way around. Uh, 1982 Grunt had a hinge at the elbow he could bend at the elbow. In 1983 though, they introduced a new point of articulation. He could still bend at the elbow about 90 degrees, but he also had a swivel at the bicep so he could swivel his arm all the way around. Uh, both figures were held together with a rubber O-ring that looped around the inside. That allowed the figure to move at the torso a bit. He could move his legs apart about so far. He could bend his leg at the hip about 90 degrees and he could bend at the knee about 90 degrees. Let's look at the sculpt design and color of Grunt and here I have to point out there is some discoloration on my 1983 swivel arm Grunt. This is Grunt's original color. Uh, there's some yellowing on the plastic of this one uh, but better examples of the swivel arm Grunt uh, should still be in this original green color. Grunt's head features brown hair and a high hairline, and he has kind of a stern expression here. Uh, this is not the best head sculpt, it's not the worst either, uh, but this head sculpt was used on a lot of other action figures. In 1982, besides Grunt, this head was also used for Zap, but at least they gave Zap black hair, so he looked a little different. Uh, it was also used for Grand Slam, and then in 1983, it was used for version 2 of Grand Slam and version 2 of Grunt. So this head Head really got around. It was used on a lot of action figures, and I'm not a big fan of the practice of reusing heads. Reusing other body parts for action figures is not such a big deal, but when you reuse a head this many times, it looks like G.I. Joe has a lot of clones on the team. Grunt's chest features a green shirt with a collar and brown straps with a grenade on one side, a knife on the other, a couple pouches, and that continues around to the back. Uh, this also is not a part that is used unique to Grunt. Other action figures uh, shared this chest, including Hawk and Breaker and others. His arms feature long sleeves, bare hands, and light green pockets on the upper arms. These details were changed on the swivel arm Grunt. These pockets, instead of being on the sides of the arms, were moved around to the front and given a little bit more sculpted detail. The waist piece was also changed between 1982 and 1983. The 1982 waist piece was thicker, had an H-shaped belt buckle, in 1983, they gave him a waist piece that was slimmer, uh, they changed his belt buckle, uh, they made his belt a little bit more detailed, and they even added a little bit more detail on his back pocket. Grunt's legs are pretty standard in green, that same color green, uh, and these legs, like a lot of other parts,
parts on Grunt were used on other action figures. In fact, these legs were pretty standard and used on most G.I. Joe action figures from 1982. Uh, they feature unpainted pockets on the thighs and standard brown boots. It seems like since the designers at Hasbro intended Grunt to be the basic infantry trooper, uh, they wanted to make the action figure pretty basic as well. But with later infantry troopers, it seems like they figured out that's not the best way to handle this type of figure. So in 1985, with the infantry trooper Footloose and with the 1988 light infantryman hit and run, these figures are loaded with great details and great accessories. It's just unfortunate that Grunt was not given the same treatment. Let's take a look at Grunt's file card. This file card was printed on the back of the card on which the action figure was packaged. You can see some of the artwork from the front of the card there. This file card is admittedly very plain, but the reason it's so plain is because this is the first G.I. Joe file card ever written. These file cards were written by Larry Hama, the writer of the G.I. Joe comic book, and he created these, uh, he called them dossiers at the time, uh, really to just keep track of the characters and their personalities. It was later that Hasbro decided to turn his dossiers into file cards, uh, and this is rather plain because this was Larry Hama's first attempt. Uh, it has his faction as G.I. Joe, it has a portrait of Grunt here, it says he's the infantry trooper and his code name is Grunt. We have his file name as Robert W. Graves, primary military specialty infantry, secondary military specialty small arms armorer and artillery coordinator. Armorer here is misspelled. An armorer is someone who works in an armory and supplies and repairs weapons. His birthplace is Columbus, Ohio and his grade is E4. This section says, familiar with all NATO and Warsaw Pact small arms as well as domestic civilian arms. Graduated advanced infantry training, finished top 10 in his class. Qualified expert M14, M16, M1911A1 auto pistol. In this bottom section we have a quote. It says, Grunt is a highly motivated, systematic individual. He's a stand-up guy who doesn't blow his cool in a firefight. This file card is very short and it says very little about Grunt. We learn almost nothing about his background other than his training. So why is Grunt often ignored as a character? Well, we're really not given very much here to latch onto. In G.I. Joe Media, he was mostly ignored by both the cartoon and the comic book. Uh, in the cartoon series, he appeared in the background sometimes, but he had few or no lines in most episodes. But Grunt was given the spotlight in a two-part story called Worlds Without End. In that storyline, somehow a handful of Joes find themselves in an alternate dimension where Cobra rules the world. It's sort of like the movie It's a Wonderful Life. We get to see what the world would be like if the Joes did not fight and defeat Cobra. Grunt really shines in that episode, and it's the first episode where we see evidence of death. Grunt finds the bones of several dead Joes from that universe, including the bones of the Grunt of that universe. He finds his own dead bones. But Grunt is strong and he holds it together. His buddy Steeler, who's suffering from a fever caused by a mysterious insect bite, uh, he's not holding up so well and he falls apart. Those episodes are written very well. Yes, they're kind of like Twilight Zone episodes, but they're done so well and I really can't hold that against them. Uh, they provide a lot of real drama and real emotions and real danger. Uh, they represent the cartoon at its best. In the G.I. Joe comic book, Grunt had a few moments. Uh, he had a fairly important role in issue number four, uh, entitled Operation Wingfield, uh, when he and Hawk went undercover and infiltrated a militia. His most notable moment in the G.I. Joe comic book was in issue number 55, when he retired. Uh, after serving his time, he left the army for civilian life. He went to Georgia Tech and he got a hot girlfriend named Lola. He returned briefly to help out when the Joes were outlaws after being accused of misconduct during the Cobra Civil War. Grunt made other appearances. Grunt was really the face of G.I. Joe when the line was relaunched in 1982. He appeared in promotional material. His image was in the corner of the comic books. Uh, he was on licensed items like color forms, uh, but he was an anonymous star. Kurt Vazigian, Hasbro's head of marketing for boys toys back in the 80s, has said that Grunt was his favorite from that first series. Taking a look at Grunt overall, this is not a top-tier figure. 
It's not even a middle tier figure. He has no unique parts, including that head that got reused a lot of times, and I really have a problem with that. However, the idea of Grunt is very important. Grunt never really had a chance. He's not flashy. He doesn't have a cool specialty or an interesting background. He doesn't come with great accessories, and he doesn't have great detail on the figure. Instead of developing his character over time, he got the spotlight a couple times before he was more or less forgotten. The way Grunt was handled in G.I. Joe reflects the way we tend to think of the common soldier. But the common soldier is G.I. Joe. The name G.I. Joe was taken from the movie The Story of G.I. Joe, which was a dramatization of the real-life war correspondent Ernie Pyle. And Ernie Pyle chose to not write about the so-called important figures in World War II. He wrote about the common soldier. He told the infantryman's story. He refused to let the world forget about those men and their sacrifices. They did the marching and the fighting and the killing and the dying, and Grunt is exactly the kind of soldier that Ernie Pyle would have written about. I think it's unfortunate that a toy line called G.I. Joe couldn't find a way to tell Grunt's story, other than in a few moments of glory. Grunt would never be the star of G.I. Joe, but his character could have been developed more, and one way to develop that character is to give him a battle buddy. My suggestion would be to pair him up with Flash, because Flash was another soon-forgotten character, uh, and there would have been a nice contrast between Grunt as the traditional soldier and Flash as the sci-fi laser trooper. So as the main characters take the spotlight, in the background you would have Grunt and his battle buddy providing support, laying down cover fire, covering a flank, and doing any other work that needed to be done. They wouldn't be the focus of any story, but through brief moments of dialogue spread out over a long period of time through a lot of stories, their banter would develop their characters. Just a few lines here and there would tell us something about them. And that would be fitting for Grunt. He's not a general. He's not a commando. He's just a guy that you can rely on to keep his head when the bullets start flying. Then, if you give Grunt an exit, like he goes to fight Cobra in another dimension, or he retires from G.I. Joe, then you look back and you realize this guy was really important. Uh, he was never in the foreground, but he was always there, always dependable. He wasn't the star, but he was vital. So then, when you lose him, that loss has more impact. And that's why I'm going to do something about it. I am forming a political action committee to get some respect for Grunt. We will call ourselves Disgruntled, which stands for Defending Infantry Soldier Grunt, Rejecting unfair treatment for Lola's educated dude. I'm not good with coming up with acronyms. That's not the point. The point is, Grunt deserves some respect. Grunt really is the core of what G.I. Joe is. Not just the toy line, but going back to when that term was first coined. So disgruntled will fight for Grunt. We'll defend Grunt. We will march as Grunt marched. And we will win Grunt the respect he deserves. Who's with me? <laughs> Before I go, I want to correct another mistake. In my review of the 1964 G.I. Joe action soldier, I referred to him as a generic soldier. Well, that's wrong. There may be generic action figures, but there are no generic soldiers. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of those real-life grunts out there. Thanks for watching my review of Grunt. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you leave it a thumbs up on YouTube, subscribe on YouTube, like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter, and share this video. That's what keeps this channel going. Thanks again for watching, and remember, until next week, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe. We're letting the theme song run long in this video because this video is about rock and roll! Yeah! Reviewing Scarlet last week inspired me to review more of the 1982 G.I. Joes, and I just completed Rock and Roll, and I wanted to show everybody. So let's take a look at the 1982 G.I. Joe Machine Gunner Rock and Roll.
This is Rock and Roll, G.I. Joe's first machine gunner. He was first introduced in 1982 as part of the first wave of G.I. Joe figures when the line was relaunched that year. Uh, the 1982 version is the so-called straight arm version, meaning he had a single point of articulation at the elbow here, but he could not swivel his arms. He had a hinge, but not a swivel. In 1983, uh, he was reissued with what they called swivel arm battle grip, which introduced a new point of articulation at the bicep, a swivel at the bicep. We will talk more about the articulation in a few minutes. This swivel arm version was available in 1983 and 1984. He was discontinued in 1985, but in 1984 he was somewhat replaced with G.I. Joe's new heavy machine gunner, Roadblock. Rock and Roll was an excellent addition to that first series of G.I. Joe figures. He was much more practical than and say a mortar soldier, almost every mission your Joes would go on would need a machine gunner. Let's take a look at the accessories, starting with uh, Rock and Roll's weapon. The contents of the card on which he was packaged just call this a heavy machine gun. This machine gun is very long, really too long for a single hand grip, which is all you could do with the straight arm version uh, because he could not swivel his arms. I have, however, noticed that the length of the machine gun uh, that's behind the grip makes it really too long to get any good two-handed poses, even with swivel arm battle grip. You can get a two-handed pose by putting the butt of the machine gun outside of his right arm, but I don't think that really looks right. Normally you would want to sling that under his arm, but it's so long here that it really doesn't like to go under and sort of wedges uh, in his armpit. So you end up with a single-handed grip, even though you have swivel arm battle grip, which is supposed to let him hold his weapon with a two-handed grip. As a kid playing with this toy, I always assumed this was an M60 machine gun because it was pretty much the standard American machine gun at the time. However, it wasn't until I got some books on military weapons that I realized this is not an M60 machine gun at all. What this is, is a modified MG42, which is a German World War II era machine gun that was created in 1942. The MG42 is known for having a very high rate of fire. In fact, it was nicknamed by American American soldiers, Hitler's buzzsaw. The high cyclical rate of the German 42 was so unnerving to American soldiers at the time that the army made a training video about it. Listen to that. That. That thing sprays a lot of lead. And you're scared because the German gun fires faster than anything you've run into before. Well, so it does have a high rate of fire. Does that mean it's a better fighting weapon than ours? By 1982, the MG-42 would have been an antique, and I find it kind of odd that they gave an antique Nazi machine gun to an American special operations soldier. This is not an exact copy of an MG-42. Uh, it has this sort of foregrip here, which the original did not have, but it does have a lot of really nice, impressive detail, a lot of detail for those 1982 G.I. Joe accessories. The most frustrating and annoying part of this accessory is this bipod, which clips on and can be removed and therefore is very easily lost. In fact, I only recently got one myself. I'd say about 90% of the rock and rolls that you see are going to be missing this bipod. That can be a very tough and annoying little part to track down. So that's something you'll have to watch out for. If you want a complete rock and roll, you will have to try to find one with the bipod and uh, good luck with that. Rock and roll's only other accessory was his helmet, and this is the standard helmet with 1982 G.I. Joe figures. A lot of figures came with this standard helmet, like Clutch here. You can see it's the same helmet. However, note the color difference. Uh, Rock and Roll's helmet is a slightly darker color green to match the darker color of his uniform. So it's very easy to get these mixed up, uh, but note that uh, the helmet that comes with Clutch and with Breaker 
our slightly lighter color green. Let's take a look at the articulation on Rock and Roll. He had the standard articulation for 1982 G.I. Joe action figures. That means he could turn his head from left to right like that. He could lift his arm up at the shoulder. He could swivel his arm at the shoulder all the way around. He had a hinge at the elbow so he could move his arm at the elbow. He was held together with a rubber O-ring that looped around the inside. That allowed him to move at the torso a little bit. He could move his legs apart about so far. He could move his legs at the hip about 90 degrees, and he could bend at the knee about 90 degrees. As noted earlier, the swivel arm version added a new point of articulation at the bicep. He still had that hinge at the elbow, but he also had a swivel at the bicep so he could swivel his arm all the way around. Uh, that was supposed to allow the figures to hold his weapons with a two-handed grip, uh, but as noted earlier, uh, that wasn't always uh, very useful with rock and roll. Let's look at the sculpt design and color of rock and roll, starting with his head. And of course, the first notable thing about his head is he has very blonde yellow hair and a blonde beard. Those 1982 G.I. Joes were really bad about reusing parts. They didn't have a lot of unique parts in that first series of G.I. Joes. As you can see here, Breaker, Clutch, and Rock and Roll all have the same head. Their hair is just painted a different color. That's better treatment than some figures in 1982 got. For instance, Hawk and Short Fuse not only share the same head sculpt, but the same hair color, so they look like twins. I've already done a parts and color guide for these 1982 figures, and I recommend you watch that to learn about the reused parts. So I won't go too much into that right now. Let's look more at Rock and Roll. On his chest, he has a ridged collar, and he has gold bandoliers crisscrossed over his chest, and that continues around to his back. And these bandoliers have bullets for his machine gun. So even though the machine gun did not include an ammunition belt, you could pretend that the machine gun was being fed with these bullets that are on Rock and Roll's chest. Despite the fact that Rock and Roll reused a lot of parts from other figures, the chest and back piece were unique, and they were awesome. You can't get much cooler than having bullets crisscrossed over your chest. And these bullets are fairly well detailed uh, for the time. Uh, this gold paint, though, however, does have a tendency to wear off, so that's something you'll have to watch out for. You see a lot of rock and rolls, kind of like this one, where some of that paint has just sort of worn away. His arms feature rolled up sleeves, and this cut here where his sleeve ends is where they added the new point of articulation. That's where the swivel is on the swivel arm battle grip version. And that's kind of nice. Uh, the new point of articulation is uh, somewhat seamless on these figures with the rolled up sleeves. The waist piece from the 1982 version was changed for the 1983 swivel arm version. The original waist piece was very thick, uh, almost looked like a diaper with a great big thick belt and an H-shaped belt buckle. The 1983 version with the swivel arm battle grip had a thinner waist with a smaller and more detailed belt. Note the H-shaped belt buckle is probably supposed to be a brand stamp for Hasbro, and the 1983 belt buckle looks exactly like Hasbro's logo. These legs are standard. A lot of other figures from 1982 shared these legs, except of course Rock and Roll had gold painted uh, pockets on the side and brown boots. Let's take a look at the file card. This file card was printed on the back of the card on which the action figure was packaged. You're encouraged to cut these out and keep them. You can see some of the artwork from the front of the card there. It has his faction as G.I. Joe. It has a portrait of uh, Rock and Roll right here. And I do like this artwork. That face does look like it has some character. His specialty is Machine Gunner. His code name is Rock and Roll. Note the spelling because I have seen this spelled a number of different ways. It's Rock Space Apostrophe N Space Roll. His final name is Craig S. McConnell. His primary military specialty is Infantry. His secondary military specialty is PT Instructor. Instructor. And this is our first hint that Rock and Roll uh, may be physically stronger and tougher than some of the other characters. His birthplace is Malibu, California, and his grade is E5. This section says Rock and Roll was a surfer in Malibu prior to enlistment. He was also a weightlifter and played bass guitar in local rock bands, perhaps the source of his code name. Is familiar with all NATO and Warsaw Pact light and heavy machine guns. Graduated advanced infantry training 
training, top of class, specialized education, covert ops school. As a kid, when I read rock and roll was a weightlifter, in my mind, that made him super muscle man. As far as I was concerned, he was like Arnold Schwarzenegger, and so that's why I list him as G.I. Joe's first tough guy. And that was a role in which he again was also kind of replaced by Roadblock. Just a side note, it says rock and roll graduated top of his class in advanced infantry training, whereas his teammate Grunt, it says he was just in the top 10 of his class in advanced infantry training. Grunt gets no respect, no respect at all. This bottom section has a quote. It says, rock and roll is cunning but naive, forceful but shy, possesses a strong sense of loyalty to his teammates and is sincerely concerned about their well-being. A man of honor and integrity who can be counted on to hold the line. Okay, cunning but naive, forceful but shy. These are kind of contradictory. Also, I don't think these reflect how rock and roll was portrayed in the G.I. Joe comic book at all, so I don't know where this comes from. Taking a look at rock and roll overall, despite the fact that he shares a lot of parts with other 1982 G.I. Joe figures, he still looks pretty unique. I mean, you're not going to mistake rock and roll for anybody else, especially with those gold bandoliers and that bright yellow beard. As noted before, Stalker is my all-time favorite G.I. Joe character, so by extension, he was my favorite character from 1982. Picking my second favorite character is not quite so easy. I don't have quite as many detailed memories about a lot of the other 1982 figures. However, Rock and Roll may have been my second favorite. I do kind of remember getting a lot of enjoyment out of this figure. He comes with this big, huge gun, which is both an upside and a downside to this figure. On the one hand, it's awesome, but on another hand, it's maybe a little bit too big and long. It's kind of unwieldy. It's difficult to get him uh, in a good pose with it. And of course, hunting down this bipod will drive you to drink and send you to the loony bin. Rock and Roll appeared in both the G.I. Joe cartoon and the comic book, probably more so in the comic book, and like a lot of the other 82 Joes, he kind of had to step aside when new characters were introduced to replace them. However, he had a great appearance in G.I. Joe issue number 35 alongside Breaker and Clutch when they encountered the Dreadnoughts and Rock and Roll captured Buzzer. Although the toys for Rock and Roll, Breaker, and Clutch all shared the same head. In the G.I. Joe comic book, they did not look alike. Rock and Roll had a full beard, Clutch only had stubble, and Breaker did not have a beard at all. I'd never trust a man with a beard. What's he trying to hide? In G.I. Joe issue number 22, Rock and Roll informally passed the machine gunning torch to Roadblock with a statement of respect at General Flagg's funeral. So how do I assess this figure? Do I like this figure? Uh, despite its unique parts, like a lot of the other 1982 Joes, it's much more generic than the G.I. Joe figures we would get later in the line. So objectively, this figure may leave something to be desired. However, subjectively, I do remember getting some enjoyment out of this figure when I got it way back in 1982. If I only assess Rock and Roll within the universe of his 1982 peers, he's one of the better ones and one of the less generic ones. So I would say he is a middle to top tier figure among the original Green 13. Although Rock and Roll did not come with a vehicle, he was often portrayed as riding the 1982 Ram motorcycle. In fact, in the first G.I. Joe comic book, he refers to it as his motorcycle. I prefer to have Breaker driving that vehicle. Sometimes I display rock and roll gunning the 1984 Whirlwind or the 1982 Flak. However, now that I have rock and roll complete, I will want to display one of them with his machine gun and bipod. That was my review of the 1982 and 1983 versions of rock and roll. I I hope you enjoyed it, and if you're thinking of getting a rock and roll action figure, I hope you found it informative. If you did, please, pretty please, hit that like button on YouTube, and if this is the first video of mine that you've seen, I'd really appreciate it if you'd hit the subscribe button on YouTube so you don't miss any future videos. Thanks for watching. I'll be back next week with another vintage G.I. Joe toy review. I'll see you then. Hello, everybody. Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here. It's time for another vintage G.I. Joe toy review, and this time we're looking 
looking at one that I think is special. Uh, it's special because this action figure is a figure of a woman, and this character came out in 1982, and she was portrayed as doing things that, at the time, women were not allowed to do. And that makes her a pioneer, and therefore, I think she's important and special. I'm talking about, you already know who I'm talking about. Let's look at the 1982 G.I. Joe counterintelligence specialist, codenamed Scarlet. If you are a fan of G.I. Joe, you already know who this is. This is Scarlet. She was first introduced in 1982 as part of the first wave of G.I. Joe figures when the line was relaunched that year, and she was released in this straight arm version. We will talk about the articulation in a few minutes. In 1983, the following year, she was re-released with swivel arm battle grip. Like all of the 1982 figures, she was re-released with a new point of articulation. Uh, she was sold in this swivel arm version through 1984 and was discontinued in 1985. In 1985, she was replaced by the new G.I. Joe covert operations specialist, Lady J. But Scarlet was never replaced in G.I. Joe media. She, she continued to appear in G.I. Joe media all the way through the end of the line. Scarlet was the first woman to appear in the 1980s G.I. Joe toy line, and as it has been revealed by former Marvel Comics editor, editor-in-chief Jim Shooter, Hasbro believed that women action figures don't sell. So it took some courage for Hasbro to put Scarlet out among the first series of G.I. Joe. Hasbro may have been thinking of their first attempt to make a female G.I. Joe action figure. That would be the 1967 Action Nurse, and that one did not sell well. That one was considered a failure. On the other hand, Princess Leia was part of the Star Wars toy line before the new G.I. Joe came out, so there was a precedence for women action figures. Let's take a look at Scarlet's accessories. She came with only one. This was the XK1 Power Crossbow. And what exactly it means by Power Crossbow, I'm not sure. Essentially, this is a pistol crossbow with a scope. This crossbow may not be a copy of a real-world weapon, but crossbows do exist and have existed for a very long time, so this is not a fantasy weapon. Uh, there's some detail on there, but not a lot, uh, so uh, it's a little bit short in the detail department, but it's still not a bad accessory. Crossbows fire arrow-like projectiles called bolts or quarrels, and quarrel was the code name for the UK Action Force version of Scarlet. The weapon has a single bolt sculpted onto it, and Scarlet does not have any replacement bolts. This is where a backpack would have been in order. A backpack with some extra bolts would have made more sense. This crossbow started a tradition of G.I. Joe not giving their women characters' firearms. Uh, the 1984 Baroness came with a laser rifle. Still not exactly a firearm, but it was closer than this. But most G.I. Joe women characters got uh, some kind of maybe projectile weapon or something like that, but not a gun. In 1983, G.I. Joe started coming out with Battle Gear accessory packs, which were reissues of old accessories. This is the accessory pack version of Scarlet's crossbow. You can see it's using the exact same mold as the original, but it's in a lighter color gray. So do watch out for that. It's very easy to get these two mixed up. Uh, but the original is this very dark, almost black gray, and the accessory pack version is lighter gray. Now let's look at articulation. The 1982 Scarlet had the typical articulation for figures of that year, meaning she could turn her head from left to right, she could lift her arm up at the shoulder, and she could swivel her arm at the shoulder all the way around. She had a hinge at the elbow, meaning she could uh, move at the elbow about 90 degrees. So the figure was held together with a rubber O-ring that looped around the inside. It allowed her to move at the torso a little bit. She could move her legs apart about so far, and she could move her legs at the hip about 90 degrees, and she could bend at the knee about 90 degrees. The 1983 version of Scarlet had the same articulation as 1982 version, except it added one new point of articulation at the bicep. Not only could she move at the elbow about 90 degrees, but she had a swivel at the bicep. She could swivel her 
her arm all the way around. Let's look at the sculpt design and color of Scarlet, starting with her head. And the first thing you notice about her head is her hair is very red, fiery red, fire engine red. It could not be redder. She also has short hair, unlike how she was depicted in different G.I. Joe media, where she had long hair, often tied back in a ponytail. Uh, the action figure just did not reflect that. Uh, these early uh, women action figures in G.I. Joe, uh, the hair, they just hadn't figured out how to make the hair long, so all the hair on them was short. The first woman G.I. Joe action figure to have long hair was the 1984 Baroness, who had a separate hair piece that was molded out of softer plastic to give it this long hair effect. Much has been said about these face sculpt for Scarlet, and yeah, it's really not that good. Uh, compared to the image on the file card, it really does not live up to that image. This does not look like the same person. Unfortunately, it was kind of par for the course on those early G.I. Joe uh, head sculpts. Um, the other figures that came out in 1982, uh, the faces on those figures left something to be desired. The sculpting on these figures did get better as the years went on. On her chest, we see she's wearing a light tan or almost flesh-colored leotard over sort of a pewter colored bodysuit. This chest is a little bit short on detail, but it does have a grenade on this side. Uh, and on this side, there is a red pad, and this would be a shoulder pad probably for the butt of a rifle, like if she were a uh, sniper shooting, she would rest the butt of a rifle on her shoulder. Unfortunately, she doesn't come with any weapon uh, that would utilize this shoulder pad. Also, although it's difficult to see, there is a zipper coming off of her neckline right there. She has really no detail on her back other than that red shoulder pad. The upper arms on the straight arm version are very plain and thin. Uh, the upper arms on the swivel arm version have more detail, and these upper arms were reused for other figures. The figures that share these upper arms include the 1984 Baroness, the 1983 His Tank Driver, and the 1983 Cover Girl. Her lower arms and hands, however, are unique and they have some points of interest. On the inside of her right wrist, she has a very small silver pistol, which I guess counts as a firearm, but it's just sculpted on so she can't hold it. On her left wrist, she has two silver throwing stars. Her waist piece is pretty plain. She has a belt, and that's a small waist piece that is smaller than the waist piece that came on the male action figures at the time. And then on the back, we have one of the strangest details, uh, sort of uh, hooked here on her back pocket is a slingshot. Of all things, I don't know why she would have a slingshot. That's a very weird detail. It is uh, painted there in silver. On her upper legs, she has the pewter grayish colored bodysuit, and on her right leg, she has a pocket, and she has a mysterious electronic device uh, with silver paint. On her right leg, she has a dagger, uh, that is painted silver. She has some very tall boots that have pockets on the inside and the outside. Uh, they match the color of her gloves and her leotard, and these boots have some heels. Scarlet is the only figure that could not use figure stands, and that's because her feet did not have holes for foot pegs. She is the only G.I. Joe figure that I'm aware of that did not have holes in her feet for foot pegs. Even the 1984 Deep Sea Six, which had a whopping two points of articulation, still had holes in the bottom of his feet for foot pegs. I have to assume the designers made this decision because she has small feet, and they probably figured her feet were too small to drill holes in them. However, the 1984 Baroness also had small feet, and she has holes in her feet for foot pegs. Let's take a look at Scarlet's file card. This file card was printed on the back of the card on which the action figure was packaged. You can see some of the artwork from the front of the card there. There are a bunch of different variations of Scarlet's file card floating around out there, including one version of the file card where the portrait actually has a picture of CoverGirl instead of Scarlet. I don't have any of those variations. This is just the most common version of Scarlet's file card. Her specialty is counterintelligence, and counterintelligence is sort of like an anti-spy. So her job is to prevent intelligence gathering by the enemy, by 
by catching enemy spies. Her code name is Scarlet. Her file name is Shanna M. O'Hara. Her primary military specialty is intelligence. Her secondary military specialty is classified for some reason. Her birthplace is Atlanta, Georgia, and her grade is E5. Scarlet's personal information here is a scrambled up reference to Gone with the Wind, the 1936 novel by Margaret Mitchell that was turned into the 1939 movie starring Vivian Lee. Vivian Lee's character was named Scarlet O'Hara and the story was set in Georgia. This section says Scarlett's father and three brothers were martial arts instructors. She began her training at age nine and was awarded her first black belt at age 15. Graduated advanced infantry training and ranger school. And it's worth noting that this card was published in 1982. At that time, women were not allowed in ranger school. The first women to graduate ranger school happened this year in 2015. Special Ed Covert Ops School, Marine Sniper School, Special Air Service School, Marine Taekwondo Symposium. Now just that part of this paragraph makes Scarlet out to be a super lethal badass, but it does not stop there. Look at all the weapons that she is a qualified expert in. Follow along with me. Qualified Expert M14, M16, M1911A1, M79, M3A1, M700 Remington Sniper Rifle, MAC-10, XK-1 Power Crossbow, Throwing Stars, Garrett, and K-Bar. She is an expert in all these weapons, but instead of including Scarlet with some of these high-powered firearms, they included her with the pointy stick shooter. This bottom section has a quote. It says, Scarlet is confident and resilient. It's remarkable that a person so deadly can retain a sense of humor. Does she really have a sense of humor, or does everybody just laugh at her jokes because they're terrified of her? Looking at Scarlet overall, she is definitely more super heroine-like than soldier-like with these colors, but I really think uh, this costume is meant to look sort of like Emma Peel from the British television show The Avengers. Uh, Emma Peel kind of wore these uh, full-body costumes like this, and if this uniform were all black, that's that's exactly what this would look like. Scarlet was such a powerful character in G.I. Joe Media, she probably deserved a better action figure. We did not get a second version of Scarlet until way toward the end of the vintage line, and that second version of Scarlet was not a very good action figure. I still like this figure, though, despite the fact that in some ways it's kind of weird. What with the strange color choices uh, and the less than impressive head sculpt and the slim shot on her butt. Scarlet was very unique among that 1982 lineup. First of all, she was a woman among a bunch of men. Uh, also, the figure used entirely unique parts, whereas the other figures in that lineup, uh, they reused a lot of parts between them, whereas Scarlet was entirely unique. Also, since the other figures in the 1982 line wore green uniforms, Scarlet really stood out. As Scarlet was portrayed in the G.I. Joe comic book, her sex was a non-issue. She fully participated with all the other members of the team, sometimes even in a leadership position. As she was portrayed in the G.I. Joe cartoon, she was a little bit more feminized, and she served as a love interest for Duke, the team leader. In 1980s properties that were marketed towards boys, women were treated probably better than you might expect. However, there was a common practice that women characters had to serve as as romantic interest for one of the male characters, usually the team leader. And in the 1983 G.I. Joe animated series, that was Duke. In the comic book, however, Scarlet was romantically linked to Snake Eyes, and I always thought this pairing made a lot more sense. I would think that Snake Eyes' mysterious nature would appeal to Scarlet a lot more than Duke's machismo. To be totally honest, though, Scarlet doesn't need anyone. She She's smart, she's strong, she's independent, and she definitely does not need some man to protect her. In one of the classic comic book issues, issue number 21, The Silent Issue, Scarlet is captured by Storm Shadow, Cobra's ninja, and Snake Eyes goes in 
to rescue her. But Scarlet doesn't just sit around waiting to be rescued. She escapes. She does ultimately fly out with Snake Eyes, but she's perfectly capable of taking care of herself. I am somewhat biased towards this figure, though. Uh, objectively, this isn't necessarily a very good action figure, but it is the only Scarlet figure that we got in that vintage line that portrayed her in her classic uniform. This this is the best Scarlet figure that we had. And because I love the character so much, I mean, this character was one of the best developed characters uh, in all of G.I. Joe, and she is integral to the G.I. Joe storyline, especially in the comic book. Uh, so even though there are some shortcomings in this figure, you still have to have it. The diversity in G.I. Joe influenced me as a child. I mean, the way Scarlet was portrayed in G.I. Joe, she was an integral part of the team. And so it really didn't make any sense to me, this idea that women couldn't do certain things. I mean, just look at Scarlet. She could do anything the men could do, and they really never thought anything of it. It, it wasn't something that was played up as uh, some kind of special thing that she was a woman doing uh, things that were traditionally done by men. No, she just did it. And that's sort of how I approached uh, women characters uh, in G.I. Joe and elsewhere. Uh, women uh, were as perfectly capable of doing everything that male characters could do. And Scarlet was portrayed this way at a time when the general public was vehemently opposed to the idea of women serving in combat roles. And now, finally, 30 years later, we are slowly starting to get over these arcane ideas about women. Uh, and we're no longer seeing women as objects that, at best, need to be protected by men. I often refer to G.I. Joe as a toy line that was marketed toward boys, which is true. But I do not call G.I. Joe a boys toy line. There were plenty of girls that also played with G.I. Joe, and it's not fair to them to call G.I. Joe a boys toy line. Uh, that's much too limiting. G.I. Joe was bigger than that. And frankly, I would rather my daughters follow Scarlet and Lady J as role models uh, than the characters depicted in toy lines that were in fact marketed directly towards girls like Barbie. I would like for my daughters to acquire the strength and the toughness and the intelligence of Scarlet. She's an excellent role model for girls and she appears in a toy line that was supposedly for boys. Of course we can't give Scarlet all the credit for this transformation but let's give her a little bit of credit. She was ahead of her time. That was my review of Scarlet. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did make sure you give it a thumbs up on YouTube and don't forget to subscribe. I've got a lot of great new G.I. Joe toy reviews coming up. You don't want to miss them and don't forget to like me on Facebook and follow me on Twitter. You get a lot of updates there. You don't get anywhere else. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week with another vintage G.I. Joe toy review. See you then. Hello everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here and it's time for another vintage G.I. Joe toy review and I apologize I was late on my review for this week. I've been moving to a new house and I've been trying to get all this set up so I could do this review. But now I am set up, I'm ready to go and what is the first review I'm going to do in the new house? Short Fuse! Yay! Okay, Short Fuse is not exactly a fan favorite, but at some point someone did actually request a Short Fuse review. So I'm doing a requested review here. Maybe some people think these 1982 figures are kind of dull, and maybe so in some respects, but I think they're important. If you're a G.I. Joe fan, or I think really a fan of anything, it's important to know your roots. And there are some interesting things to say about Short Fuse. There are some variations to look at, so let's jump right in. HCC 788 presents... Short Fuse. This is Short Fuse, G.I. Joe's Mortar Soldier from 1982, from Series 1 of the new G.I. Joe, when the line was relaunched that year. In 1982, Short Fuse was released in the so-called straight arm version. In 1983, he was reissued in the so-called swivel arm version. And we will look at the differences between these two in this video. The 1983 swivel arm version of Short Fuse was also issued in 1984 and was discontinued for the year 1985 
and he had no direct replacement that year, and there were no more versions of Short Fuse in the vintage line. For G.I. Joe collectors, the straight arm version of Short Fuse is referred to as version 1, and the swivel arm version is referred to as version 1.5. Short Fuse was also available in 1986 and 1987 as a mail-away. Normally, I don't consider the mail-away reissues to be important, but for Short Fuse it is important because there was a change to the file card, and we will look at that in this video as well. Collectors often think of Zap as the most difficult figure to complete of that 1982 G.I. Joe series, and that may be correct. The Zap action figure is made of this light green plastic that is notoriously easy to break. Mine is broken, and Zap had three different versions of his bazooka, so that's a lot of variations to collect. However, I think Short Fuse may actually be a little bit more difficult to complete than Zap. Uh, the action figure for Short Fuse is not as easy to break as the Zap action figure, but he also comes with three versions of his weapon and three different file cards. That is a lot of variations to collect. Let's take a look at Short Fuse, starting with his accessories, and let's look at his weapon first. And he came with this, uh, what the card contents call an M1 81mm medium mortar. This accessory is loosely based on the real world M1 mortar, which was used in World War II and in the Korean War, but it was outdated by the 1980s. It had been replaced by the M29 mortar in 1952. Uh, the M29 was lighter and had a longer range. It came with a detailed bipod, which could be removed. A mortar is a usually barrel-loaded weapon that fires mortar bombs at short range and high arcing trajectories. Uh, they lob explosives down on the heads of the enemy. Here's where we start to get into the variants. The earliest versions of Short Fuse's mortar had a thin, closed handle. Later, that handle would change, and Short Fuse came with a mortar that had a thin, open handle. The mortar was changed again, and Short Fuse came with an open, thick-handled mortar. And the handle on this one is thick enough that I would not recommend putting it in the action figure's hand. Short Fuse's next accessory is his clear visor, and this visor fits on the helmet uh, with a couple pegs on the visor that fit in holes on the sides of the helmet. And these visors are very small, they are clear, they are very easy to lose, and they are hard to replace. So if you're getting a short fuse, you probably want to get one that already has the visor, rather than try to track down a visor to replace a missing one. Short fuse was one of a few G.I. Joe figures of that era that came with clear visors, including Flash, Grand Slam, and Hawk. Short Fuse came with a standard helmet. This is the helmet that uh, really almost all G.I. Joe figures from 1982 came with. Uh, it is in a medium green uh, that should pretty closely match his uniform. Finally, Short Fuse came with a backpack, which the card contents called an ammo pack and it has sculpted on mortar bombs for his mortar. This backpack was recolored in a lighter green for Zap. There is a difference between the backpack of the 1982 short fuse and the 1983 short fuse. The 1982 backpacks had a shorter peg, a uh, thicker peg for the figure, and the 1983 backpacks had kind of a thinner, longer peg, and they fit differently in the backs as well. So you'll want to make sure you get a 1982 or 1983 backpack, depending on which short fuse action figure you have. Let's take a look at the articulation on short fuse, starting with the straight arm version. He had the standard articulation for 1982 G.I. Joe action figures. So that means he could turn his head from left to right. He could swing his arm up at the shoulder about so far. He could swivel at the shoulder all the way around, and he had a hinge at the elbow so he could bend at the elbow about 90 degrees. Uh, the whole action figure was held together with a rubber o-ring that looped around the inside. That allowed him to move at the torso a little bit. Uh, he could move his legs apart about so far, he could bend his leg at the hip about 90 degrees, and he could bend at the knee about 90 degrees. The articulation was changed in 1983 when they added what they called a swivel arm battle grip, which was a swivel at the bicep. So not only could he move his arm at the elbow about 90 degrees, he could now swivel his arm all the way around. Let's take a look at the sculpt design and color of Short Fuse, and like a lot of other 1982 G.I. Joe action figures, he reused a lot
lot of parts. In fact, Short Fuse has no unique parts. On his head, he has very yellow blonde hair and a very plain head sculpt, a passive, almost disinterested expression. Now, this head is not too bad. It's not too great either. But the problem with this head is it exactly matches the head of Hawk, G.I. Joe's commander, that was also released in 1982. These guys were available at the same time. And they look like twins. The 1982 G.I. Joe series was really bad about reusing parts, and it's most noticeable with these heads. Uh, this same head sculpt was also used for Steeler and Flash. And as you can see, Steeler and Flash have the same hair color, so it looks like we have another set of twins. As the 1982 G.I. Joe series was originally planned, all of these figures were supposed to have unique head sculpts, but that was changed at the last minute as a cost-cutting measure. I think a regrettable decision. In the G.I. Joe comic book, Short Fuse is shown wearing glasses. The action figure does not have glasses, so it is assumed that his unique head sculpt would have had him wearing glasses. There is kind of an urban legend that Short Fuse's unique head sculpt later got used for Doc in 1983, just changed the skin color and the hair color. However, based on what I've read, that legend is not true, and this head sculpt was always intended for Doc, so we still don't know what Short Fuse's original head sculpt would have looked like. Short Fuse uses the same chest and back that was used on Zap. His chest features short straps and a collar, and it is otherwise quite plain. On the straight arm short fuse, we have long sleeves with pouches on the sides of his arms with a little touch of silver paint on them, and we have bare hands. These arms are identical to Hawk's arms right down to these silver pouches. On the swivel arm short fuse, those pouches have been moved from the side of the arms around to the front of the arms. They are more detailed, and they are still painted silver. Straight arm short fuse's waist piece is thick with a wide belt and an H-shaped belt buckle. Uh, he has a pocket in the back here, uh, but this waist piece is thick and kind of clunky looking. That waist piece was changed on the swivel arm version to give him a slimmer waist, a more detailed belt and belt buckle, and even the pocket in the back has more detail. That looks much better. These legs are standard and were used on almost all 1982 G.I. Joe action figures, including, again, Hawk. Uh, he has brown pouches on each side, and he has brown standard boots. The only distinction between between Short Fuse and Hawk are the chest and back pieces and the color on the pouches and the boots. Other than that, they are the same action figure. Let's take a look at Short Fuse's file card, and this is where we get to look at more variants. The file card was printed on the back of the card on which the action figure was packaged. You can see some of the artwork from the front of the card there. It has his faction as G.I. Joe. It has a portrait of Short Fuse here. It says he's the Mortar Soldier, and his code name is Short Fuse. And note the spelling on Fuse, F-U-Z-E. That's a very unusual spelling. Uh, would normally be spelled F-U-S-E. His file name is Eric W. Freistat, and this is where we run into the variant. Uh, this file name was changed on later file cards. The file card that came with the swivel arm version of Short Fuse changed his name to Mark W. Brenston. The file name was changed again on the mail-away file card. These mail-away versions came with red back file cards, red on the back, uh, and, but that's not the only difference between this file card and those others. They changed the name again. They kind of took uh, the first name from the second file card and the last name from the first file card, and uh, they made him Mark W. Freistat. That is why this mail-away file card is so important. I don't normally try to get these red back file cards. They're really usually not important to me, but they changed the name, and it's very unusual for them to change the name of the character. Why the name change? This is not a typo. Somebody deliberately changed it. Uh, maybe the name too closely resembled the name of a real person? I don't know. So what is Short Fuse's canonical file name? There are some fan theories about this, but that's all just speculation. What would be the official file name for Short Fuse? If you're looking for any source outside the file card to confirm Short Fuse's file name, one source would be G.I. Joe Order of Battle number 2, which has his file name as 
Eric W. Freistad. His primary military specialty is artillery. His secondary military specialty is infantry engineer. His birthplace is Chicago, Illinois, and his grade is E4. This section says, short fuse comes from a military family. In parentheses, father and grandfather, both career top sergeants. A top sergeant is a first sergeant, often just called top. Enjoys abstract mathematics and can plot artillery azimuths and triangulations in his head. Specialized education, artillery school, School, engineer school, advanced infantry training. Qualified expert M14, M16, M1911A1, M79 grenade launcher, M2 60mm light mortar, and M1 81mm medium mortar. This bottom section has a quote. It says, short fuse is logical and sensitive, has a tendency to blow his stack, hence the nickname short fuse. This file card makes short fuse out to be kind of a hothead, but that side of his personality is never really played up in his appearances in G.I. Joe media, which are admittedly limited. Short Fuse made a few appearances in the various G.I. Joe media, but not many. In the cartoon series, he first appeared in the miniseries from 1983, A Real American Hero, in the first part, but he did not have a speaking role until part three, and he was voiced by Frank Welker. He did appear other times in the cartoon, but he rarely had any lines, and in the cartoon, he was not depicted wearing glasses. In the G.I. Joe comic book, Short Fuse appeared in issue number one, and he had some things to do in that issue. Uh, he used his mortar to take out an airfield, and in the comic book he did wear glasses, which helped to distinguish him from the other Joes who at the time looked very similar. After a few other brief appearances, the character was mostly forgotten. He was sidelined in issue number 33, along with a lot of other 1982 characters, uh, in favor of new Joes. Looking at Short Fuse overall, this is not a great action figure. He has no original parts, and I hate to put one of the original Green 13 in the bottom tier, but that's where he has to go. There just isn't enough going on with this action figure, and nothing to really generate any interest. The figure and the character are very forgettable, and he was seldom used in G.I. Joe media. But if you think about it, G.I. Joe is a fast-strike counter-terrorism unit, and a mortar soldier is better suited to more traditional large unit warfare, and he would be part of a mortar team, which really just isn't the the way G.I. Joe operates. These early G.I. Joes are like larger versions of those little green plastic army men. And in those army men, they always had a mortar soldier. So in G.I. Joe, you had a mortar soldier whether you needed one or not. Even though it's not a great figure, it is a great challenge for collectors because of all the variations. It gives you a lot to sink your teeth into, a lot to hunt down and track down. And I did get a thrill out of completing this figure. But chances are, Short Fuse was not your favorite favorite G.I. Joe figure. So in the interest of rehabilitating Short Fuse's image, let me suggest some other uses for Short Fuse besides a mortar soldier. Short Fuse the Hunter. You killed Cecil. Short Fuse the Ladies Man. Short Fuse the Lady. Short Fuse the Porn Star, unfortunately unsuccessful because he had a Short Fuse. That's where his nickname really came from. That was my review of the 1982 Short Fuse. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you hit the thumbs up and hit the subscribe button. That's what keeps this channel going. Like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter, and check back next week for another vintage G.I. Joe toy review. And until next time, remember, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe. Hello everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here, and I'm back with another vintage G.I. Joe toy review, and oh boy, I am really excited about this one. I've been looking forward to doing this review for months. This is my review of the 1982 and 1983 G.I. Joe Vamp with its driver, Clutch. Uh, before we get started, I want to remind everybody, uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and smash that subscribe button. Uh, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Uh, if you don't like this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs down. Either way is fine with me. If you're watching this video from any website other than YouTube, I would greatly appreciate it if you would take a little trip over to YouTube to the Hooded Cobra Commander 788 channel and go ahead and subscribe. I've got a lot of great vintage G.I. Joe toy and comic book reviews coming up and you don't want to miss it. This is the Vamp, which the box called a multi-purpose attack vehicle, uh, also sometimes known as the G.I. Joe Jeep. Uh, it was sold in 1982 and 1983, uh, and was discontinued in 1984, although in 1984 it was released as part of a box set 
that included the HAL laser cannon. This is the HAL laser cannon, uh, so the box set would have come with both of these. In 1984, the VAMP was replaced by the VAMP Mark II, which uh, was very similar to the VAMP in almost every respect, uh, except a few details were added, uh, and instead of a, a machine gun on the top, it had a, a missile uh, launch system. Uh, and instead of being a green color, it was colored kind of a desert camouflage beige. The VAMP was worth three flag points, and the design was loosely based on a real-world vehicle, the Lamborghini Cheetah FMC XR311. I will flash a picture of the Lamborghini Cheetah so you can compare the real-world vehicle to this G.I. Joe reimagining of it. The VAMP came with an action figure, the driver, Clutch. And I'm going to take Clutch out here, and we will take a closer look at Clutch a little bit later, so I'm going to set him aside for now. Let's look at the parts of the VAMP. Uh, the most prominent feature, of course, is this uh, machine gun that it has on the turret on the back here. Uh, this could be an anti-personnel or uh, an anti-aircraft weapon. The blueprints for the VAMP refer to it as a 762 millimeter computer-synchronized machine gun. The turret could elevate. It could turn all the way around, 360 degrees, uh, and it had this feature here on the side, this handle, uh, which if you moved it back and forth, it would simulate the gun firing. The machine gun is mounted on a green turret that's the same color as the vehicle, and the turret latches on there through, like, through a kind of key system. This notch here lines up with the hole there uh, and secures the turret on and the turret in turn is connected to the machine gun by these pegs which slide in and latch in those holes now none of this snaps in permanently so you know these can all be taken apart which consequentially means that these can be lost, and you see a lot of vamps out there on eBay and whatnot that are missing the turret and the machine gun. Here in the back, we also have two gas cans, which the blueprints refer to as bulletproof gas cans. And um, even though they're essentially the same, they do have different stickers on them. There's gas can one and gas can two. On the front of the vamp, we have what the blueprints refer to as a tow bar, and inside we have one of the most frequently lost parts, and that is the steering wheel. This steering wheel was actually the item that uh, kept me from having this piece completed for a really long time. It took me a good long while to track down a steering wheel for this thing that wasn't ridiculously expensive. The steering wheel... Uh, slides into this hole there that also has a key to it. This notch goes in the top and once it goes in it can come out pretty easily and the steering wheel does not really turn. It's not a functioning steering wheel. Since the vamp has a lot of parts that can be easily taken off these are frequently lost so if you're trying to complete a vamp uh, you would do yourself a favor to try to find one that still has the steering wheel uh, because you will have trouble finding one uh, if there's not one already in there. Uh, these gas cans, they can be found uh, sometimes without the stickers. Um, and you can find the gun and the turret reasonably easily, but sometimes they can run you quite a bit uh, to buy just the parts. Let's look at some of the features of the VAMP, and if we turn it over and look at the bottom, it has uh, something that's not obvious, but is yet one of my favorite features, and that is the metal bar axles for the wheels. These allow the wheels to roll quite freely, uh, and it makes it a very sturdy vehicle. It's a pretty durable toy. I have occasionally seen a few of these uh, with the wheels broken off. And on this one, you can even see there's a little bit of stress on the plastic there. 
but despite that, really, you'd have to abuse this thing pretty well to get the wheels to come off. They're on there quite solidly. Uh, these are plastic wheels. It would have been nice to have rubber wheels, but that's go okay. I think the metal bar, uh, metal bars for the axles make up for that, making this a nice, solid vehicle, uh, something that a kid could play with and not risk damaging too much. At the back here, there is a standard G.I. Joe tow hook, uh, which could be used to tow vehicles like the HAL. Let's just hook it up here for a demonstration. Um, the HAL would just hook its tow arms to that, and, uh, and since the HAL had wheels, the van could pull it along. Even though these wheels are pretty tough and are not going to break too easily, uh, they, they do have a downside, and that is, after a while, they tend to squeak. They can develop the most ear-piercing squeak that you've ever heard. Uh, they just kind of squeal whenever you roll them around. This one has a bit of a squeak. On the front here, we have what the blueprints called a heavy-duty winch. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again, it would have been really nice if this had been a real winch. Some of the other G.I. Joe vehicles, especially the helicopters, had working winches. And if they had made this a working winch, that would have been a really neat, very cool feature. But it's just kind of molded on there, just a piece of plastic, and that's all right, I guess. On the front here, it has this small gun-looking thing. It almost looks like a small machine gun. Uh, right in front of the steering wheel, but the blueprints actually don't say what this is. I'm not sure exactly what this is supposed to be. Looking at the interior of the vamp, uh, we have some detail in there. We have a gear shift, we have what looks like a, a radio in the center there, and we have a little bit of detail on the dashboard. And that's nice, that's good detail, but that's actually considerably less detail than the dashboard on the Stinger Cobra Jeep uh, that was obviously modeled after the Vamp. The Stinger, by comparison, has a lot of detail on the inside. Uh, much more detail, a lot more instruments, a lot more gauges. Uh, that really is going the extra mile by Hasbro, giving us some detail that really you probably wouldn't have noticed had it not been there. Um, it would have been nice to see that kind of detail on the vamp, but this vehicle was in the first line of G.I. Joe vehicles when uh, G.I. Joe was relaunched in 1982. So for that early era, this is acceptable. I can accept this level of detail. In the back, we have a rack to hold the gas cans. And honestly, when I was a kid, I never had much use for these gas cans. Uh, you know what? Despite the fact that uh, I could refill the vamp with these gas cans if I needed to, somehow, when I was playing with this, it never ran out of gas. Uh, apparently, G.I. Joe vehicles get unimaginable gas mileage because the thing never ran out of gas, and I never had to refuel it. So this really is kind of useless to me. The Cobra Stinger replaced that with a platform and a bar with foot pegs that could hold two action figures. And that, I think, is much more useful than a gas can rack. Uh, that turned the Stinger in from a two-person vehicle to a four-person vehicle. And I think that adds a lot of play value to the toy. The cab is kind of caged in here with a roll cage, and this is a little bit of a weak point in the design of this vehicle. Uh, these roll bars have a tendency to break here and here where they meet the body of the vehicle. Uh, they can just kind of snap right there if too much pressure is put on them. Now, if it does break, uh, you can re-glue it, and it's pretty much invisible. You can't really tell. Uh, but if you are going to ship one of these to a buyer, or if you are looking one, for one to buy yourself, just be cautious about that. Uh, make sure that that's uh, still solid on there, make sure that it's not broken, uh, and don't put too much pressure on that to, to make sure that it doesn't break on you. Let's look at the action figure that came with the vamp. Uh, this was Clutch. Uh, he had one accessory, and that was his helmet. Looking at the sculpt of Clutch, he did reuse a lot of parts from other figures from the 1982 release, uh, but that was pretty much normal. A lot of the 1982 figures did share a lot of parts between them. In particular, 
Uh, clutch has the same head as breaker. Obviously, they've changed the uh, paint on the beard and the hair. Uh, and he also shared a head with rock and roll. Uh, they also shared the same arms uh, and the same legs. But Clutch did have a unique chest and back piece. Those pieces were only used for Clutch and were not reused for any other action figures. I mentioned that the Vamp was sold in 1982 and 1983. Uh, the main difference between the 1982 version and the 1983 version was actually the action figure. Uh, the 1982 release of the G.I. Joe action figures had what they referred to as straight arm articulation, which was a hinge here at the elbow that would allow them to bend at the elbow. But that's all they could do other than, you know, their articulation at the shoulder. But starting in 1983, they re-released all of the 1982 action figures with what they referred to as swivel arm battle grip. Uh, and that added a point of articulation at the biceps. So not only did they have a hinge at the elbow, they also had a swivel at the bicep, allowing the arm to go all the way around. This was a, a very nice new feature uh, which allowed the figures to hold their weapons with a two-handed grip. Looking at the rest of the articulation for Clutch, he could move his head from side to side. Starting with the G.I. Joe figures in 1985, they had a ball joint here at the neck so that they could look up and down as well. But in 1982, they could just turn their heads left and right. The action figure was held together by an, uh, a rubber O-ring that looped around through the inside of the action figure which allowed him to move at the waist a little bit. His arm uh, could swing out, it could rotate all the way around at the shoulder. Uh, as noted before, he had a hinge at the elbow and a swivel at the bicep. His legs could spread out about that far uh, and he could move his legs about 90 degrees at the hip, and his knee could bend about 90 degrees. Let's take a look at the file card. This file card was printed on the back of the box that the vamp came in. There's nothing on the other side. It was just the back of the box. And you were encouraged to cut this out because it contained a short biography of the action figure that came with the vehicle. Uh, and this file card makes Clutch out to be kind of a, an interesting character. It says, Vamp Driver, codename Clutch, file name Lance J. Steinberg, primary military specialty transportation, secondary military specialty infantry, uh, birthplace Asbury Park, New Jersey. Uh, and it says uh, here that Clutch was a mechanic at Manny's Mean Machines and was heavily involved in racing street machines prior to enlistment. Graduated Advanced Infantry Training, Covert Ops School, uh, Executive Bodyguard School, that's interesting, uh, Ranger School, uh, Qualified Expert, M14, M16, M1911A1, M3A1, M79, and M60. Um, this quote down here says, He greases his hair with motor oil, rarely shaves, chews on the same toothpick for months. Clutch still calls women chicks. And if you... Remember Clutch from the early G.I. Joe comic books? Uh, he was always trying to hit on Scarlet, which uh, she uh, regularly rebuffed. Essentially, he sexually harassed Scarlet throughout the entire, his, his entire appearance in the comic book series. Nowadays, he would probably be court-martialed, maybe brought up on charges, but uh, I guess in the 80s, you could get away with that kind of thing. I always imagine Clutch as kind of like a greaser, uh, but with a thick New Jersey accent. Maybe a cross between this and this. That's my review of the 1982 and 1983 Vamp with its driver, Clutch, and his file card. Uh, thank you for watching. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and hit the thumbs up if you like this video and hit the thumbs down if you didn't like this video. But stay tuned for more vintage G.I. Joe toy reviews and comic book reviews coming up. You won't want to miss it. I'll catch you guys later. Hello everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here and I'm back with another vintage G.I. Joe vehicle and action figure toy review. And after doing 
two helicopters in a row, I decided to come back to something completely different. I wanted to review one of my favorite small vehicles of 1982 and 1983, the HAL, the Heavy Artillery Laser, with its driver, Grand Slam. The HAL and the Grand Slam were issued in 1982 uh, with the first line of action figures and vehicles. It was also reissued in 1983. The main difference between the 1982 and 83 version is the action figure. Uh, the action figures from 1982 were re-released with new articulation at the bicep, but I'll get to that later. This is a big laser gun, as you can see, um, and so essentially it is a science fiction weapon. Um, it is not a copy of any real-world military weapon, but as you can see, it has a very military look to it. So even though it is a sci-fi weapon, and in general I don't care for um, excessively science fiction based weapons in G.I. Joe, this, I think, strikes a nice balance between science fiction and uh, a real military look. This is something that you would actually bring into battle with you. It's got military colors, a nice military design, and so it doesn't look like something out of Tron or Star Wars. And that's why I really like this vehicle, uh, and, and I wanted to make sure that I took a closer look at it. This is a towed vehicle. Uh, as you can see, it's got wheels, and it's got these uh, tow arms here. Let's look at some of the parts. One part that is frequently missing is this computer control panel, and I'm going to attempt to take it out without breaking it so that you can see. It's held in by this sort of uh, notch here, and it doesn't hold in all that firmly, really. And this arm that holds it in is very susceptible to breaking. The first HAL that I had, actually, uh, this part broke off uh, in shipping. So if you are selling one of these and you're sending it to somebody, make sure that you either pull this out uh, and wrap it separately, or if you're going to leave it in, make sure that you package it in such a way that it will not break in transit. Of course, we've got Grand Slam, and we're, we'll take a closer look at Grand Slam a little bit later. So let's set him aside for now. Another piece that is often missing is this back support leg. It does come out. It just kind of has a ball joint there, and just... Uh, slide it in like so, and it, while it's not necessarily essential to the stability of the vehicle, as it, uh, as, as the cannon as it sits here, it is an important piece to look out for if you want a complete HAL. Of course it has the tow arms, and these are kind of unique. They um, they spread out like this to be support legs, but when the vehicle is towed, they come together like this and overlap to form a single tow hook or a tow loop like that. It's, uh, it's different. None of the other towed vehicles worked quite like that. And one consequence of having tow arms like this is this cannon can take up a lot of shell space if you're displaying it. They spread out to stand up like this and uh, and it kind of creates a wider profile for this cannon. That's something to think about if you're going to display the HAL is to make sure you leave enough shelf space for these tow arms which spread out pretty far. Another piece that is frequently broken is the uh, the gun tips. The gun tips are very easily bro breakable, and you often see these, uh, e either one or both of them, completely broken off. So keep an eye out for that if you're going to buy a HAL. And, uh, and if you get one, just be careful with those. 
uh, and and don't let them get don't don't put too, too much pressure on them because those will break. This is a towed vehicle, so it has wheels. They're just ordinary plastic wheels. They are held together with this metal bar, which I like a lot. I, I really like these uh, vehicles, these wheeled vehicles that have the metal bar. The metal bar is, uh, is probably not going to break. It's a much more sturdy than a vehicle that, uh, that's just held in with plastic. So that's, that's a nice feature. And you probably don't have to worry too much about the wheels being missing or broken off on this thing. Let's take a look at the features of the HAL. It's a cannon, so of course it will swivel on its base. It will also elevate, and this actually is one of my least favorite features of the HAL. When you pull it up to elevate it, it makes a very loud clicking sound that both feels and sounds like I'm breaking the toy just to elevate it as it's supposed to go. This is the uh, kind of ridged thing here that causes the ratcheting sound, the very loud ratcheting sound. And there's a, a metal bar in there that runs along these that uh, makes that horrific sound. As it goes back down, though, it clicks, but not nearly as loudly. And to be honest with you, even though there's not really much chance of breaking the toy by elevating it, the sound is so distressing to me that I, I don't like to do it. So uh, to display the howl, I usually find a, a position that I like, and I just leave it there. So uh, about that level of elevation is not bad. And... Um, just won't mess with it after that point. It includes a seat for the action figure. And inside, there is a foot peg for some extra support. Because as you can see, there's no back peg, which would, on some of the vehicles, the seats would have a back peg that would fit in the, uh, the back of the action figure here to help hold it in. In this case, it's got a foot peg meant to fit inside the hole on the bottom of the feet. And you can put the figure in that way, if you so choose. But it's actually a little bit difficult to get him in. I think I've just about got him. Um, and I don't really think it's all that necessary. Uh, even though this is a very open cockpit, uh, the figure, I think, sits in there without the foot peg rather well and doesn't come out too easily so really most of the time I don't bother with the foot peg it's nice that it's there but uh, I don't think very necessary as mentioned before this is a towed vehicle to change it from the stationary cannon mode to the tow mode you swing this back support leg up and there is a notch here that fits in the slot of the toe of, of the support leg and it just sort of wedges in there so now the wheels will make contact with the ground and of course you swing the toe arms together and now it will fit on the toe hook the standard tow hook on most G.I. Joe vehicles, like the Vamp here. Now the Vamp is not a bad vehicle to tow the uh, the HAL, but it's not my favorite. I Just as a matter of aesthetics, I don't care for the light green and dark green together. It's not a great color scheme. So, there are some other options. It can be towed behind the 1982 Mobat, which has a tow hook. Fits on there quite nicely. And it's a little bit better. There's still a color difference there. 
But one nice thing about the HAL being towed behind the MOBAT is that it has a seat for the figure, and the MOBAT really only accommodates one action figure. So the if you're towing uh, a cannon that doesn't have a seat like this, or uh, for instance the MMS mobile missile system, which doesn't have a seat for the uh, for the action figure, then you don't really have any place to put the action figure on the MOBAT tank. So as the MOBAT tows the HAL, at least at least there is seating for Grand Slam. There are other towing options, and I suppose since it did come with a tow hook, you could tow it behind the Polar Battle Bear, the 1983 snowmobile, but I don't know why you'd want to do that. It's, the can is actually larger than the than the Polar Battle Bear, and it looks a little bit like the tail wagging the dog here. My favorite towing configuration, though, is to tow it behind the 1983 Wolverine tank. I think that looks really nice. The colors go pretty well together. The HAL is slightly darker. But, again, there's this vehicle accommodates really only one figure, and so it's nice to have a seat for Grand Slam so he can ride along as his cannon is towed. But another thing that I like about it is that I think the weapons themselves go together. The missiles on the Wolverine tank, um, these can be, you can imagine these as either anti-aircraft or anti-tank missiles. And the HAL also is either an anti-aircraft or anti-armor weapon. But the Wolverine, it's a 12 shot. It has 12 missiles and if you have more than 12 targets you have a problem if you're the Wolverine. Whereas the HAL, being a laser, can keep firing until its power source is depleted. So as a team, you could have CoverGirl and the Wolverine taking out the larger armored vehicles and aircraft with the high explosive missiles, and you can have the HAL taking out smaller uh, vehicles and aircraft with its extremely precise laser cannon. So the two of these together could take out a whole squadron of fangs and rattlers and hiss tanks and maybe stinger jeeps. Uh, they could really cause Cobra a lot of trouble just with these two vehicles. And since they're towed, they can be mobile at the same time. They can run and shoot. So I really like these two together. Let's take a closer look at the action figure, Grand Slam. And uh, as you can see, he also, like the HAL, has some science fiction influence mixed in with uh, his overall military look. He's got these red pads on his chest, arm, uh, arms, and knees, or his thighs, which I guess is supposed to be some kind of uh, shielding to protect him from the adverse effects of his laser. Now, another character that is often confused with Grand Slam is Flash, who is the laser rifle trooper, another laser operator, who also had these same uh, kind of, they're red-ish, sort of slightly orange, maybe, pads in the same places. As I said, the 1982 characters were uh, re-released in 1983 with this new articulation at the bicep that was referred to as swivel arm battle grip. The 1982 version did not have that. Like Flash here, could uh, he, he could bend his arm at the elbow, but did not have an ability to swing his arms in and out like this new version of Grand Slam here. Another difference between the 1982 and 1983 releases were the waist piece 
you can see here on the 1982 version, it's got a thicker waist piece with kind of a wide belt here. And the 1983 version has a slimmer waist piece, uh, a more detailed belt, um, and just generally kind of looks better. Differences between Grand Slam, and we should cover this because there seems to be a lot of confusion between these two. Let's take a look at, let's take their helmets off. Both of them did come with helmets that had these clear plastic visors, and these are were often lost. And you can see why. They're tiny, they're clear. You know, you drop one of these on your carpet, uh, and it's likely to be vacuumed up. Um, I mean, the thing it looks like a thumbnail, honestly. It's about that size. Um, so these can be a little bit hard to find if you're missing one. But you can see that also the uh, their color is different. Grand Slam is slightly darker green, and uh, Flash is, has a slightly lighter green color in the plastic. Grand Slam's gloves, of course, are black, and his boots are black, whereas Flash's are brown. And the head sculpt is different. Now, these both of these head sculpts were reused for other characters. The 1982 uh, first release of G.I. Joe action figures did reuse a lot of parts like this. They did that quite a bit, but their heads are really quite different. They have the same hair color, but Flash has this kind of passive expression, uh, and Grand Slam has a slightly older looking face and a slightly more severe expression. So don't get confused uh, and order a Flash instead of a Grand Slam. They are, they are similar, but there are some significant differences. Oh, I also wanted to point out one other difference between 1982 and 1983. The straight arm action figures had pads here on the arm that were had this um, sort of checker pattern sculpt, but when they were reissued in swivel arm battle grip, those were just painted on with no sculpting at all. Not sure, really sure why that is. Just one odd thing about this particular Grand Slam figure is uh, this little mark of silver paint on his chest and what I think looks like a fingerprint. I think a previous owner may have tried to touch up the silver paint on here. Now this silver paint does tend to wear off more easily than the other paints on the figures, so I can see why someone would want to touch that up, but maybe a slightly botched job here. It looks like somebody was not careful with the paintbrush. But even so, it's a nice Grand Slam figure overall. Let's take a look at the other articulation of this figure. He had the typical 1983 G.I. Joe action figure articulation. His head could turn left and right. His shoulder could turn... Uh, all the way around, and his elbows, of course, could move up and down. He had the swivel arm battle grip, as mentioned before, so his arm could swivel at the bicep. He was held together with uh, a rubber O-ring that would loop around here and would allow his torso to move a bit. His legs would uh, could move up at the uh, waist here, about 90 degrees, and his knees would bend, and that's about it. Later, uh, later G.I. Joe action figures had a ball joint here in the neck, so they could look up and down as well as turn left and right, but on these older, older ones, they could just, just turn their heads like that. Now, I mentioned that there were two versions of Grand Slam, the sw the original straight arm version, like Flash here, and the swivel arm version, like this. But there was another version of Grand Slam uh, issued with the 1983 version of the Jump Jet Pack. 
And that version of Grand Slam, instead of having the red pads, had all silver pads. And that is the version of Grand Slam that I had as a kid. And that version of Grand Slam is actually really rare and hard to find and pretty expensive if you're looking to buy one. Uh, but I can kind of see why it's a highly desired figure. The all silver uh, Grand Slam just looked really cool. And I, I do like the red pads, but the silver pads really made this figure pop. And putting it together with the jump jet pack, which in itself is not a very spectacular vehicle, really combining the two made both of them more awesome. The Howl here was worth three flag points, and on the back of the box, of course, was Grand Slam's file card. You were encouraged to cut out these file cards from the back of the packaging and uh, keep them. It had some information about the, the character. In this case it says Laser Artillery Soldier, codenamed Grand Slam. His foul name is James J. Barney. Uh, his primary military specialty is artillery. Secondary military specialty, electronics engineer. And basically the file card indicates that Grand Slam is really a very intelligent person but also a little bit of uh, a geek, as we might say. Uh, I don't think they would have called him that in 1982. I'm not sure what the slang was, but today we'd say he's a little bit geeky. This section here says, Grand Slam received initial training in conventional artillery and served with a 155 millimeter battery. He graduated special weapons school, top of class. Specialized education, artillery school. Advanced Tech School, Qualified Expert in the M16, the M1911A1, and of course the HAL Artillery Laser. He better know how to operate the HAL if he's going to be the operator of it. Uh, he's soft-spoken and calm, just a bit shy. Intelligent, loves to read escapist fantasy, science fiction, and comic books. So. Grand Slam is actually the kind of guy who would go to a G.I. Joe convention and maybe cosplay, and why not cosplay his own character? So just picture Grand Slam cosplaying Grand Slam. He would have the best costume at the convention. The most realistic, of course, because he would just come in uniform. So there you have the 1982 and 1983 HAL Heavy Artillery Laser with its driver, Grand Slam. Thank you for watching this video, and stay tuned for more G.I. Joe toy reviews in the near future. Hello everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here, and I'm back with another vintage G.I. Joe toy review. This time we are going to be looking at the 1982 MMS with the action figure, Hawk. Before we get started, I want to remind everybody to smash that subscribe button. Uh, and if you like this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. Uh, if you hate this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs down. If you're watching this video on any website other than YouTube, I would appreciate it if you'd take a little trip over to the Hooded Cobra Commander 788 YouTube channel and go ahead and subscribe. I've got a lot more videos coming up and you won't want to miss them. This is the MMS Mobile Missile System with action figure Hawk. It was released in 1982 as part of the first series of G.I. Joe action figures and vehicles. It was also released in 1983, uh, and it was discontinued in 1984 when it was replaced with nothing, really. Uh, the next surface-to-air missile system like this uh, in the G.I. Joe toy line didn't come out until 1985. That was the Air Defense Battle Station, and that was a small playset that did not come with an action figure. The MMS was worth three flag points, uh, that's the same number of flag points as the HAL laser cannon, even though the HAL was bigger than this. But both the MMS and the HAL came with an action figure, and that's probably why they were both worth the same number of flag points. Now I'm going to take a closer look at the action figure later, but I'm going to set him aside for now, and we're going to take a closer look at the MMS. The MMS is modeled after a real-world military armament, uh, the Hawk MIM-23 missile system. 
The Hawk moniker for the MIM-23 is actually an acronym, which stands for Homing All the Way Killer. Let's take a look at the parts of the MMS. The MMS came with three missiles, what the blueprints referred to as Patriot missiles. As you can see, they're pretty large, and they each have four fins. Now these fins are very easily broken. As you can see, I have a couple fins broken on this one, uh, and the one behind it. So as you can see, they are very susceptible to breakage. They connect to the missile pod with these slots, which connect to these pegs, and there are three, one on the top and two on the side. The pod itself rotates all the way around, 360 degrees, and it elevates. One problem that I have with the missiles, besides the fact that they tend to break like this, is that they don't stay on very well. I mean, they slot in there, but if you're rotating the missile pod, uh, they're very easy to knock off. It also came with this firing panel and stand. It was two parts, came apart like that. And the firing panel was connected to the main body of the toy via this very thin plastic black wire. The stand connects to the firing panel here at the bottom in this little square partition that's the same shape as the post. You just slide it in there. And I have some sticky tack on the stand because it doesn't always like to stand up on its own. On the front of the MMS we have two folding legs. They're held down via this little notch. Same thing on both sides. Uh, they fold up to change it to the toe mode, and I'll demonstrate that more later. Uh, the same with these two legs on the back. They fold up and slide in. Uh, we'll get a better demonstration of that here in a minute. For transportation when the system is in tow mode, it has wheels. Nice, free-moving wheels. Uh, they are plastic wheels. It would have been nice to have rubber wheels, but that's okay. Let's look at some features of the MMS. First of all, we have some really nice detail on it. Look at all that detail. This really does look like a high-tech military missile system. And even on the bottom, we have some detailing on the bottom, and that is really cool. This is an example of Hasbro going the extra mile with these toys. If this had just been a plain bottom here, you probably wouldn't have cared. But they went through the extra trouble of molding on some detailing on the bottom of the toy. I already demonstrated the missile pod, and you can take off the missiles, of course. But the other main feature of this toy was that it could be towed by other G.I. Joe vehicles. To tow the MMS behind a G.I. Joe vehicle, you have to transform it from its stationary mode, like this, to the tow mode. And I'll demonstrate how to do that now. First of all, of course, you have to move the legs up. These front legs go all the way up like this, both the same. And the back legs, they go up and in. Then we have to take the control panel apart, take it off of the stand, and that fits nicely in this little slot right here. And there's even a space for the stand and this little notch in the back under the back legs. I've taken the sticky tack off just so that it looks a little bit nicer. And now that it is converted into its tow mode, this hook here can connect to a tow hook, a standard tow hook on most G.I. Joe vehicles like the Vamp here. And the wheels make contact with the ground and there it goes. It moves very freely. It's a nice towed vehicle. Now the Vamp is a nice choice to tow the MMS because as you can see, when the MMS is folded up and in tow mode, uh, Hawk needs a place to ride. And there is a passenger seat here in the Vamp. So you just fit Hawk right in there. And he can ride along. There you go. That's pretty much it as far as features go. The MMS was a pretty simple toy, which accounts for why I did not get it when I was a kid. It really just didn't look all that much fun to play with. So let's take a look at the action figure, Hawk. 
Hawk is a special action figure in the first line of G.I. Joe figures that came out in 1982, in that he was the leader of the G.I. Joe team. Let's look at Hawk's accessories. He came with only two. The helmet. And a very tiny visor. Clear visor. Uh, some of the other G.I. Joe action figures came with these. And these are very frequently lost. As you can see, they're clear, and if they get dropped on the carpet, they're pretty much invisible and very likely to be vacuumed up. The visor fit in these holes in the side of the helmet, like that. And of course, it could move up and down. Let's look at the articulation for Hawk. He had the typical 1982 G.I. Joe action figure articulation. Uh, which meant that at the head he could turn his head left and right about so far. Uh, later in 1985 G.I. Joe action figures had a ball joint in the neck so that he could also look up and down but in, in 1982 they could just move their head left and right. His arm at the shoulder could swing up like that and it could rotate all the way around. He had a hinge at the elbow so that he could move his elbow about 90 degrees in 1983, G.I. Joe action figures added another point of articulation at the bicep, which would allow the arm to swivel. It was referred to as swivel arm battle grip, and it looked like uh, what was on Steeler here. The arms would move in and out like that, as well as at the elbow. He was held together with a rubber O-ring that looped around the inside of the action figure, which allowed him to move a little bit at the torso. He could move his leg at the hip about 90 degrees, and he could bend his knee about 90 degrees. Let's look at the sculpt of Hawk. Uh, now, in 1982, the G.I. Joe action figures reused a lot of parts between different action figures, and that is especially true of Hawk. Essentially, Hawk entirely reused the body of Grunt. Same arms, same chest and back, same waist piece, same legs, same everything except for the head. Now the head actually was borrowed from Short Fuse. And not only do they use the same head, they have the same hair color. Look at this. Oh my god, G.I. Joe has perfected human cloning. Now I understand that in 1982 Hasbro was not certain that this new G.I. Joe toy line was going to be successful. So they went the cheap route and they just reused a lot of parts. They repainted them and they called them a different uh, character. But in this case, they didn't even repaint the head. They used exactly the same head for two. So it looks like they're twins. Now this is not the only time that that occurred in 1982. Uh, for instance, here are, here's another set of twins. Flash and Steeler. Not only did they reuse the same head, they have exactly the same hair color. Sometimes for the sake of diversity, they would at least change the hair color, like with Zap here, who had the same head, but at least he had black hair instead of brown hair. Now, I think there's a missed opportunity here because the toy designers had an option that would have made Hawk unique and it would have fit better with the second version of Hawk. So let's bring in Hawk version 2. This is the version of Hawk that came out in 1986. Uh, as you can see, he has the ball joint and he can move his head up and down as well as side to side. Now, take a look at these two action figures. Two versions of Hawk. These two action figures are intended to represent the same guy. Obviously, they don't look anything alike. Consider, if you will, if instead of using Short Fuse's head and hair color, they had used Grunt's head, but colored the hair blonde. I know they wanted the character to be blonde because he was in the comic book, and if they had used Grunt's head with blonde hair, he would not have been a clone of anybody. None of the other action figures used this head sculpt with blonde hair, so he would have been unique. Also, he would have looked more like the second version. You could kind of imagine this guy as being a slightly older version of this guy. It's closer, certainly closer than these two. Of course, you would have needed to keep the blonde hair in the second version. Uh, the hair color change from blonde to brown is never explained. This isn't the only time Hasbro has spontaneously changed hair colors 
for characters when they issued a second version of them, and I hated it every time. I just really wish they wouldn't do that. As you can see, Hawk has silver paint on his web gear. Now this silver paint rubs off very easily, and the reason he's painted silver may be to signify his rank. Uh, he is a colonel, and as I said, he is the leader of the G.I. Joe team. He is the highest ranking officer on the team. Now, when I was a kid, I did not know that this action figure was supposed to represent the leader of the G.I. Joe team. When I saw it on the shelves in the store, it looked like a very plain vehicle with a very plain action figure, and I really just didn't have any interest in it. I didn't find out that this was supposed to be Hawk, the same Hawk in the comic books, until after the toy was no longer available. Later in the G.I. Joe storyline, Hawk was promoted to General, and General Hawk is represented by version 2. This is Hawk as a General, and this is Hawk as a Colonel. Let's take a look at the file card. This was printed on the back of the box that the MMS came in. There's nothing on the other side, it was just the back of a box and you were encouraged to cut these out and keep them since it, it contained a short biography of the character represented by the action figure. Up here it says, interestingly, Missile Commander, not G.I. Joe Leader or G.I. Joe Commander. If it had said something like that, I might have taken notice of this toy earlier than I did. His codename is Hawk, which could refer to the Hawk missile system, which the toy is supposed to represent or it could refer to a war hawk, sometimes just called a hawk, which is a person who favors war in a debate about whether or not you should go to war. It says his file name is Clayton M. Abernathy. His primary military specialty is artillery. Secondary military specialty is radar. His birthplace is Denver, Colorado. That's a nice town, I've been there. His grade is 06, which is a colonel. Here it says, Hawk comes from a well-established, read loaded family. He's a West Point graduate, top of class, and has seen action in a number of trouble spots. Graduated advanced infantry training, covert ops school. Served on Cadre North Atlantic Range Command and USA ENG COM EVR missile and radar training. Classified. Qualified expert M16 M1911A1 auto pistol. This quote down here says, He's keenly intelligent and perceptive and quite capable of totally selfless acts in support of his teammates. An excellent leader. And that line right there is our only hint that this toy is meant to represent the leader of the G.I. Joe team. If you take a look at this guy closely, you can kind of see why I didn't think he was the leader of the G.I. Joe team. Uh, he has a very passive expression. He doesn't look like a leader. In fact, he just looks kind of sleepy. His eyes are kind of droopy. That was my review of the MMS mobile missile system and the action figure that came with it, Hawk. I hope you enjoyed this review, and if you're thinking of getting an MMS uh, or a Hawk action figure, I hope you found this video informative. Uh, if you liked it, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. If you didn't like it, go ahead and give it a thumbs down. Uh, and don't forget to subscribe. I've got a lot of great G.I. Joe toy reviews coming up, and you won't want to miss them. Uh, thanks for watching, and bye-bye. Hello everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here, and I'm back with another vintage G.I. Joe toy review, and this one is special. This one is really exciting. I've been working on this for a while, I just wanted to make sure that I had all the pieces. We are going to look at Cobra Commander, and not just one version of Cobra Commander, we're going to look at the 1982, 1983, and the 1984 versions of Cobra Commander. The Ojo.com G.I. Joe toy database refers to the 1982 version of Cobra Commander as version 1, the 1983 version as version 1.5, and the 1984 version as version 2. Now we did get a version 3 Cobra Commander in the vintage line in 1987, but he looked very different. He had this kind of Iron Man armor. Uh, but this is the classic look that we are used to. This is the Cobra Commander that everybody remembers. I'm really excited to look at the action figure that gives this channel its name. So let's take a look at Cobra Commander and give him a very good thorough review. Cobra Commander was released in 1982 as a mail-away. He was not available in the stores. 
1983, he was released as a carded figure for sale in the stores, and then in 1984, he was released as the hooded Cobra Commander as another mail-away. The hooded Cobra Commander was not sold in the stores. The hooded Cobra Commander was sold through mail-away offers like this one. There's one right there, and uh, you could uh, collect your flag points. It says um, only two flag points and $1.75. In 1982, if you mailed away to get your own Cobra Commander, this is what you would get. Uh, there was something a little bit odd about this first issue of Cobra Commander. His Cobra symbol was actually highly simplified. Uh, this one is actually a better view of this symbol. As you look at it, uh, it has kind of detached eyes at the top that kind of make the symbol look like it's wearing a Mickey Mouse hat. So this variation of Cobra Commander is referred to as the Mickey Mouse Cobra Commander. Uh, this is somewhat rare and desirable to collectors. Now later in 1982, if you mail away for Cobra Commander, you would get one with the regular Cobra symbol, the, the one that we're all used to. Let's take a look at the accessory, and he came with only one. The Venom Laser Pistol, which was a very dark, almost black, gray plastic. Uh, and this one, I think it looks a little bit lighter than it actually is under the camera, uh, but it's actually quite dark. Um, not quite black, but very close to black. I actually have two of them. Uh, I have one on the back of this Cobra Commander, but this one, the grip is slightly broken, so I'm just going to leave that plugged into the back, and we'll just take a look at this one. Now, as a weapon, I guess this is okay. This is fine as far as laser guns go. You know, and, and I really don't care for lasers in G.I. Joe. I, I didn't care for the science fiction weapons, but, I, I mean, this is all right. It actually looks a little bit more like a hair dryer than a gun. But it did have a nice feature in that it did plug into the back. The back of the action figure had some sculpted-on detail here. Uh, it was a, a recharging pack for the laser, so it had this hole in the in the top corner that corresponded with this notch on the gun and you just push that in there and it actually held pretty well. I do like it when the sculpting on the action figure matches the accessories. Let's look at the articulation of Cobra Commander and there was a difference between 1982 and 1983. When you first mailed away for Cobra Commander in 1982 you got what they referred to as the straight arm articulation. Uh, he could turn his head from side to side like that uh, he could lift his arm all the way up, and he could turn it all the way around. And he had a hinge at the elbow, uh, and he could move his elbow at not about 90 degrees. Um, all of the action figures in the vintage line were held together with a rubber O-ring that looped around the center, so they could move at the waist a little bit. They could move their legs apart about so far. He could move his leg at the hip about 90 degrees, and he could bend at the knee about 90 degrees. Starting in 1983, they introduced a new point of articulation at the bicep. Uh, th they had this swivel here that they referred to as swivel arm battle grip, and not only could you move the arm at the elbow at 90 degrees, you could also swivel it all the way around. This allowed the action figures to hold their weapons with a two-handed grip. Let's look at the sculpt of these three Cobra Commander action figures. The 1982 Cobra Commander was actually completely unique. He, he shared no parts with any other action figures. However, when he was re-released in 1983 with the swivel arms, he actually shared arms with the 1983 Cobra Officer. You can see that their arms match. They're just a different color. The 1984 hooded Cobra Commander had exactly the same body as the 1983 Cobra Commander, but with a different head. The head on this 1984 hooded Cobra Commander was a slightly rubbery material, so you kind of actually got the effect of the hood on his head. It, it kind of actually did billow over his uniform slightly. Uh, but as you can see, it is a much darker color than the 1982 or 1983 version. We already looked at the charging pack on the back, and that's some nice detail, and all of them featured that. He has a very military-looking uniform. Uh, he has a dagger on his left leg. And on his right leg, he has this very formal-looking red stripe down his pants. And his trouser leg actually comes all the way down to cover part of his boot. Let's look at the colors of Cobra Commander, and the color is the most obvious difference between 1983 and 1984. Uh, 1982 and 1983 
Cobra Commanders had this reflective silver mask, and this silver paint, in fact, any of the shiny metallic paint on these action figures rubbed off very easily, so you're really lucky to get one that doesn't have any of the paint scratched off. There's been some criticism of the color of Cobra Commander. He came in this very light blue color when he was first released in 1982 and 1983, and I think that was to provide him some contrast with the two other Cobra action figures that were released at the time, the Cobra Officer and the Cobra Soldier, which of course were very dark blue. And so Cobra Commander, in order to stand out, was a much lighter blue. He, he looked unique, uh, he looked like he was uh, set apart from the others, and so you could kind of tell which one was in charge. Then in 1984, when the hooded Cobra Commander was released, he was dark blue, kind of like the other two. But he does have a very regal look to him. This is his ceremonial uniform. Uh, the hood is meant to be a, a ceremonial hood, a cowl. And the, uh, the helmet and the mask, that's supposed to be his battle helmet. So when he goes into battle, he dons his helmet. Uh, and then when he's rallying the troops or doing some kind of a, a, a ceremonial thing, that he wears the hood. In the comic book, Cobra Commander was depicted as preparing for battle by taking off his hood and putting on his battle helmet. Uh, but of course, you couldn't really do that with the toy because they were totally different colors. These were obviously meant to be totally different uniforms. Despite the fact that you could not reenact the comic book exactly, I really don't mind this color scheme. If you think about it, if the hooded Cobra Commander had been done in the lighter blue plastic, he would not have had this very regal effect. He would just wouldn't have looked the same. And if the uh, regular Cobra Commander had been released with the darker blue, he would not have stood out well enough amongst his troops. So I really do think that this was the right way to go. It also meant that when you mailed away for the hooded Cobra Commander, you were not getting just the regular Cobra Commander with another head, you were getting an entirely new action figure. Taking a closer look at the 1984 hooded Cobra Commander, I think this is a really good looking action figure. He's got the gold paint on him with a gold stripe on his leg uh, in place of the red stripe from the original, and it does look like a good ceremonial uniform. He looks like he should be in charge of something. One criticism I have of the hooded Cobra Commander is that his eyes do not look very evil. Uh, you can see Cobra Commander's eyes there, and they look kind of droopy. Frankly, Cobra Commander looks a little bit sleepy. If you were to take the head off the body, he would look a little bit like a Pac-Man ghost. Cobra Commander does tend to be more expensive than most G.I. Joe action figures if you buy one on eBay, but I don't think that's because he's necessarily so rare. The 1982 and 1983 versions of the Cobra Commander action figure were actually available in a lot of different ways. Uh, by mail order, uh, in the stores, also with the 1982 Cobra Missile Command headquarters, and then the hooded Cobra Commander was actually available in Mailaway for a really long time. So there should be a lot of these floating around out there, but they still tend to run a bit more expensive, I think, because the demand is so much higher. Uh, you really, if you're a G.I. Joe collector, you've got to have Cobra Commander. He's one of the iconic characters, and you just don't want to have him missing from your collection. So everybody wants a Cobra Commander. Let's take a look at Cobra Commander's file cards, and we have several file cards to look at. When you first mailed away for a Cobra Commander in 1982, you would have got a file card that was plain on the back like this. Uh, later versions had a red back. I don't have the red back version. Uh, but this is a file card from the mail away Cobra Commander. In 1983, when Cobra Commander was released on a card in the stores, uh, his file card was printed on the back of the packaging. Uh, so you were encouraged to cut that out and keep it. And then when you mailed away for the hooded Cobra Commander in 1984, you got a card that also had a plain back. It also had this white border uh, with a flag point up here, which unfortunately was cut out on this one. One minor difference between the card art and the actual action figure is that the portrait of Cobra Commander on this file card has a Cobra symbol on his cowl, which uh, was not on the action figure itself. The text of these file cards are almost identical, so I'm just going to read one of them here. This says, Cobra Commander, codename Enemy Leader, and of course Enemy Leader is more his role, not his codename. The title Cobra Commander was always treated kind of as his name, they just called him Cobra Commander. His file name is classified, his primary military specialty is intelligence, his secondary military specialty is ordnance, and in parentheses, experimental weaponry. 
His birthplace is classified, and his grade is Commander-in-Chief, so he is like the President of Cobra. This section here says, Absolute power, total control of the world, its people, wealth, and resources. That's the objective of Cobra Commander. This fanatical leader rules with an iron fist. He demands total loyalty and allegiance. His main battle plan, comma, for a world control, comma, uh, there's an extra comma in here, I think that's a typo. In fact, on the hooded Cobra Commander card, uh, that is actually fixed. They took out the extra commas there. His main battle plan for world control relies on revolution and chaos. He personally led uprisings in the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and other trouble spots, responsible for kidnapping scientists, businessmen, and military leaders, then forcing them to reveal their top-level secrets. It's funny that it mentions the Middle East and Southeast Asia, because in the 1970s and early 80s, those are the places where the United States had the most difficulty in its foreign policy. It's kind of hinted that Cobra Commander is responsible for all the problems that the United States has had in those regions of the world. This bottom section says, Cobra Commander is hatred and evil personified, corrupt, a man without scruples, probably the most dangerous man alive. The personality that's depicted on the file card is pretty simple. He's evil. He's just plain evil. But I think that raises a more interesting question, which is, how does a person become so evil? What motivates him? Why is he the way he is? In the comic book, Cobra Commander's ideology is a little bit muddled, but it seems to mostly draw from the extreme right wing. Not only does the file card make him out to be kind of like the new Hitler, but in the comic book, especially in the earlier issues, uh, Cobra used a lot of Nazi imagery. I really like Cobra Commander as the leader of the enemy of G.I. Joe. Uh, and I like him not just because he's so evil, but because he's so smart. Uh, as he was depicted in the first issue of the G.I. Joe comic book, uh, he was a step ahead of the Joe team pretty much at every point. He's highly intelligent and charismatic. A person of lesser intelligence simply could not accomplish what he has accomplished, which is build an international network to take over the world. His goals may be evil, but he is a man possessed of uncommon intelligence, ambition, and ability. But of course, that's why he must be stopped, because if he succeeds, uh, that will mean the end of freedom and the domination of worldwide fascism. That's my review of the 1982, 1983, and 1984 Cobra Commander. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, go ahead and give it a thumbs down. That's what it's there for. But don't forget to subscribe because I've got a lot of great new G.I. Joe toy and comic book reviews coming up, and you do not want to miss them. I'll catch you later. Hello everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here, and I'm back with another vintage G.I. Joe toy review. And this time, by special request, we are looking at the 1982 G.I. Joe FLAC. FLAC was an acronym that stood for Field Light Attack Cannon. Uh, it was worth two flag points, and it did not come with an action figure. It was sold in 1982, it was also sold in 1983, it was discontinued in 1984, but it was available as a mail-away from 1985 to 1990. So this was available for a really long time, so there should be a lot of these floating around out there. Despite the fact that the flak was still on the shelves in 1983, its role was somewhat replaced by the 1983 Whirlwind Twin Battle Gun, which was another gun, an anti-aircraft gun, like the Flak, that did not come with an action figure. Uh, in 1984, we got the Cobra Asp, which was an anti-aircraft gun that fit the role of both the Whirlwind and the Flak, but this time for Cobra. The Blueprints call this gun a 105mm howitzer, which is definitely what this gun is not. A howitzer is a relatively short-barreled gun that is intended to fire shells at high trajectories for a steep angle of descent. So it's designed to lob shells down on the heads of the enemy. This is an anti-aircraft gun. And in case there was any doubt as to whether or not this was an anti-aircraft gun, there's a sticker here indicating the number of kills that this gun has had, and of course it's all aircraft. Also, on the sticker for the control panel, we see the gun targeting an aircraft. The Flak borrows design cues and its name from a series of German anti-aircraft guns from World War II. Uh, this, I think, most closely fits the German Flak 39, 
Uh, main difference is really uh, the the Flak 39 did not have the seat like this. The Flak 39 was a 105 millimeter gun, so the blueprints did have that part right. Let's look at the parts of the Flak, and it's a short list. It has three support legs, and they all fold it in like this. You fold them out to uh, to place it on the ground for support. It had a seat in the back, which came out really easily. Just very easily pop it out like that. And for that reason, these flaks are often missing the seat. Uh, also, the bar that supports the seat is pretty thin and these break off very easily. So you see a lot of flaks out there without the seat and sometimes without this entire bar. The seat just kind of kind of snaps in there like that and you can tell when you snap it in that it's not gonna stay in very firmly. The flak did not come with an action figure uh, but the box art featured rock and roll in the gunner seat and I think he's appropriate as the G.I. Joe machine gunner and this is how I always display my flak. There are two control joysticks here that the figures can kind of put their hands on. Uh, they're a bit thick so I wouldn't try to force the figures hands all the way on them but they can just kind of hold on to the edge there and that's really the only means of support for keeping the action figure in. There's no back peg on the seat so that would go in the back of the action figure and there is no foot peg here on the foot supports which would have gone into the holes in the bottom of the feet of the action figure to help hold them in uh, and I, I think that that's a missed opportunity. Honestly, uh, I mean, he does stay in there fairly well, but I would have preferred something more for support, something else to try to keep the action figure in, just keep him from falling out. Let's look at the features of the flak, and again, it's a short list. Uh, it will rotate all the way around on its base, and it, uh, it can move, it can move down, it can elevate. It elevates up to the point where the foot uh, foot rests hit against the, the supporting bar here, and so that's about as high up as it goes. And that's about it as far as features go, but I think one of the main features really is not what the flak does, but how it looks. I mean, it has a ton of really impressive details. It looks kind of hyper-realistic. Uh, the control panel there has some uh, stickers with some gauges, uh, and the sides of the gun just have a lot of detail. The stickers have a very nice military look to them. Uh, it's really an impressive looking gun. The 1983 G.I. Joe Headquarters Command Center had a special emplacement just for the flak. It had these indentions here, uh, one right there and another one up here and here, and those exactly fit the footprint of the flak. They're not very deep so they don't hold the flak in very well, but they were designed for the flat, flak and they fit perfectly. The flak as a standalone toy is fine, but it's not one of my favorites, mainly because there are some missed opportunities with this uh, with this toy. And I think the main one, the most obvious one, is wheels. Just give the thing some wheels. It, it, giving this some wheels and making it a towed vehicle like the Whirlwind, I think would have made a huge difference. Uh, there's actually no way to pull this thing and get it on the battlefield. It's actually a pretty static, stationary toy. Uh, but if you had slapped some wheels on it and put a tow hook on it, uh, it could have been towed by another G.I. Joe vehicle, and that, I think, would have made it look really cool. Alternatively, if there were at least some kind of loop or cleat on here that would have fit the 1983 Dragonfly's winch, then it could have been airlifted into position, but there's not really anything like that on there either. Now, to be fair, this came out in 1982, and the 1983 Dragonfly didn't exist at the time. Maybe if this were designed in 1983, they would have thought of that, but unfortunately, it just doesn't have anything to hook onto, really. Now, you can still airlift this thing in here by just playing out the Dragonfly's winch and uh, looping it around the body there and then hooking the uh, the hook there to the rope uh, and then you know it can be carried that way which I guess is fine the fact that the flak did not have wheels means that it didn't have a way to move it onto the battlefield unless you just you know kinda picked it up and carry it and who would do something crazy like that if the flak had wheels it would have been a nice less expensive alternative to the 1982 and 1983 HAL laser cannon which as you can see was bigger. It came with an action figure, Grand Slam, 
Uh, and it had wheels, so it was a towed weapon. And so if you're a kid and you only have so much allowance money to spend, and you have the more expensive HAL in the store, and on the same shelf you have the flak, and the flak could do everything that the HAL could do. It could be towed and it could shoot. It just didn't have an action figure. You might pick up the flak just because it's cheaper and your allowance money would go farther. That was my review of the 1982 G.I. Joe flak. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, go ahead and give this video a thumbs up. If you didn't, go ahead and give the video a thumbs down. That's what it's there for. But whatever you do, make sure you subscribe to the Hooded Cobra Commander 788 YouTube channel because I've got a lot of great new G.I. Joe action figure, vehicle, and comic book reviews coming up. You do not want to miss them. In fact, the next review is kind of special. It's one that I've been working on for quite a while, and I'm really psyched to actually be able to do it. So you do not want to miss it, so make sure you're subscribed. I'll talk to you all later. Hello, everybody. Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here, and I'm back with another vintage G.I. Joe toy review and this time I am looking at the 1983 jump jetpack and the action figure that came with it Grand Slam I'm very excited about doing this review I've actually wanted to do it for a while I just needed to make sure I had all of the pieces and this review is a special request from Plastica from the Yojo.com forum. If you would like me to review a particular G.I. Joe toy, just leave me a comment below this video in YouTube, and if I have the toy, I will review it. If I don't have the toy, if I ever acquire it, I will review it. So let's get started and look at the 1983 Jump Jetpack and Grand Slam. This is the Jump Jetpack, and Jump stands for Jet Mobile Propulsion Unit, which does not spell jump. It spells jumpu. The Jump Jetpack with Grand Slam is the 1983 version of the toy, but in 1982, the Jump Jetpack was sold on its own without an action figure. So if you got this toy in 1982, this is what you got. The action figure Grand Slam was also available in 1982 and 1983 with a different toy, the HAL Heavy Artillery Laser. As you can see, there are some differences between the Grand Slam that came with the HAL Laser Cannon and the Grand Slam that came with the Jump Jetpack. I will take a closer look at the differences between these two versions of Grand Slam a little bit later. So in 1982, you have the Jump Jetpack, not a very popular toy, not a lot to it. So in 1983, Hasbro re-released the Jump Jet Pack, but they packaged it with this new version of Grand Slam. So the Jump Jet Pack with an action figure, now you've got something interesting. So the Jump was introduced in 1982 and then reintroduced in 1983 with the action figure, and after that it was sold until 1985 as a mail-away offer in catalogs that you would get with uh, G.I. Joe vehicles such as this, and you could open it up and right there is an offer for a Jump Jet Pack. It was only three flag points and two dollars. When the jump was sold in 1982 by itself, it was worth two flag points. And when it was sold in 1983 with the action figure, it was still worth two flag points. So you didn't get an extra flag point with the action figure, and I think that's kind of a ripoff. I'm going to take a closer look at Grand Slam a little bit later, so I'm going to set him aside for now. Let's look at the parts of the jump jet pack, and the largest part was this launch pad. The launch pad had four legs, they're more like feet. It also included this recharging station and control console, and that has a lot of really impressive detail, lots of high-tech gadgetry there. And on the bottom of this side of the control console, it has these hooks, and those hooks just hooked on to this recessed portion here that ran all along the edge of the launch pad, and you hook that on there, and the control console would stay. There's actually no specific spot along the launch pad to place this control console. You'd really hook it on any side. All four sides would accommodate the hooks on it, so you could really put it in any configuration you wanted to. The jump came with this laser gun, and this laser gun, the blueprints say, has a range of 100 yards. And it has this kind of sight thing on here that's actually a quite narrow and thin piece of plastic. These are often broken off, so if you're looking for a uh, jump jet pack uh, and you want to make sure that it's intact, uh, take special note of this sight thing, this uh, kind of attachment on here. Uh, that breaks off extremely easily. 
The laser gun fits into the hand of the action figure, and it has this C-clip here that actually fits over the forearm. So you kind of push the gun into the hand, and the clip fits over the arm, and it stays on there very securely. Connecting the laser gun to the jetpack itself was this black wire, and this black wire is often missing. These can be a real pain to find. They were almost always lost on these things. Uh, they, they would fit in the this hole in the bottom of the laser gun on one end, and the other end, which was, looked identical, would fit on the bottom of the jetpack like that. And it actually does not stay in very securely. It pops out pretty easily, so you can understand how this thing would get lost quite frequently. In fact, I've had to do several takes in this video because I keep having the thing pop out on me. That brings us to the jetpack itself. And the jetpack is loosely based on the real-world Bell Textron rocket belt. And that's a design that's actually been around for a while. The U.S. Army did express an interest in building these things for military use, and the program to build rocket packs was called the Small Rocket Lift Device, or SRLD. So jet packs, or rocket packs, are a real thing. They exist in the real world, but they're not very practical for a lot of reasons. For one thing, they have a very short flight duration, roughly about 30 seconds. And if you have a flight duration of only 30 seconds, you can only spend about 15 seconds going up, and you better spend the next 15 seconds getting back down, because you do not want to be at the top of its arc when this thing runs out of gas. Because jetpacks did not fly very high because of their extremely short flight duration, uh, they didn't get up high enough for the pilot to use a parachute if the device failed. So you're high enough to get injured really badly if you fell, but not high enough to use a parachute. You can see why the military use of jetpacks would be a little bit problematic. The jump jetpack had some fairly decent detail on both sides, and on this side it has a peg, and that peg would fit in the hole in the back of the action figure, and that would hold the jetpack on. So the jetpack fit on exactly like any other G.I. Joe backpack. The legs are adjustable. If you pull them out, they can adjust to this notch right there like so, or you could just pull them all the way out. Let's look at the features of the jump jet pack, and on this side of the control console it has a hole, and that hole fit the peg on the jet pack. You just put the peg in the hole and it holds the jet pack on there for refueling and recharging. And it has a slot right there that fit the barrel of the laser gun, so you could kind of holster the laser gun, and there you go. As far as features goes, that's it. The jump jet pack does not do anything else. It has nothing that is spring-loaded or battery-powered. It's that. There you have it. Let's be very frank about this. The jump jet pack is not really a vehicle. It is an accessory. I mean, as far as the jet pack itself goes, this is it. This is actually what goes on the action figure. This part really isn't necessary. You don't really need a launch pad to uh, launch a jetpack, so you don't really need this. And the console that has the hole for the uh, jetpack and the hol holster for the laser gun, you only really use that when you're not using the jetpack. It's basically just storage for the, for the toy. And so really what we're talking about here uh, is an accessory with some extra bits. The launch pad did have a foot peg that you could fit in the hole on the bottom of the action figure's feet so you could stand a figure on there, but you don't need it for the actual jet pack itself. It's really not very necessary. So you know what this, you know what this uh, launch pad really is? It's a really big figure stand. You may recall that in my video review of the 1982 Flack, uh, I kind of knocked it a little bit because I thought it was too simple. I think it needed some wheels or some other features to really make the toy, you know, be really cool. Well, as far as simple toys go, uh, this jetpack is even simpler than the Flak. But I feel very differently about the jetpack than I do the Flak. I still really love this, despite the fact that it really is just an accessory with a, a completely unnecessary launch pad. I really love this toy. 
I did have it as a kid, uh, and I had it with the uh, Grand Slam with the silver pads like this. Uh, and I loved it. I mean, if you think about it, it's it's a wonderful toy. It allows you to turn a G.I. Joe action figure into Superman. It, uh, it allows your action figures to fly. Now, a Grand Slam is an attack aircraft, and that is pretty darn cool. Also, as an adult collector, I don't play with these toys anymore. I display them. And the launch pad and the control console actually looks pretty cool as a display. When the jump jet pack was used in the comic book and the cartoon, and probably when you were playing with it as a kid, uh, you would have your figures flying uh, horizontally like this, like Superman. Uh, and I'm no physicist, but I don't think that would actually work, uh, because I mean, if you're flying horizontally and you don't have wings for lift and gravity is pulling you down then you're just gonna arc downward until your face plants in the dirt. To really fly this thing you would need to be vertical and the pilot would move forward by just leaning forward a little bit but he would still remain mostly vertical. To illustrate this check out this video of a real jetpack in flight. Let's take a look at Grand Slam and let's look at Grand Slam's accessories. He came with a helmet that was dark green to match the dark green color on his uniform and a visor that clipped onto the helmet on the holes in the side of the helmet like that. And this visor was clear plastic. It was very small and these were often lost. You can see how they would get lost very easily. They're tiny and they are clear and you know if you drop one of these it's just going to be invisible and it's going to be gone forever. In addition to the helmet and the visor of course Grand Slam came with the jet pack itself. Let's take a look at the articulation of Grand Slam. He had the typical articulation of 1983 G.I. Joe action figures which meant that he could turn his head left to right uh, he could move his arm up at the shoulder about so far and he could swivel it all the way around. He had a hinge at the elbow and he could move his arm at the elbow about 90 degrees and he had a swivel at the bicep so he could swivel his arm all the way around. The figure was held together with a rubber o-ring that looped around the inside that held the figure together and it allowed him to move at the torso a little bit. Uh, he could move his legs apart about so far he could move his leg at the hip about 90 degrees and he could bend at the knee about 90 degrees. Let's take a look at the sculpt of Grand Slam. Uh, his face has kind of a, an older look, sort of a severe expression there, uh, and he has brown hair. Uh, he has very prominent silver pads on his chest with kind of a checker pattern, uh, also on his thighs, and painted pads on his arms. He has black gloves and black boots with these straps here and these are obviously supposed to be boot covers. He was pretty simple on the back. He had silver straps that could just continued over to his silver pads on his chest. Now the Grand Slam that came with the Jump Jet Pack was identical to the Grand Slam that came with the HAL Laser Cannon also in 1983. Uh, but as you can see the Grand Slam that came with the HAL Laser Cannon had these red kind of orangish red pads instead of the silver pads. So when they decided to sell the Jump Jet Pack with Grand Slam, they really just repainted the, these red portions silver. And I really like this new paint job. I think the silver pads on here just really stand out very well. He looks really cool. It looks very science fiction. But the green gives him a, a sort of a, an authentic military look, even though he has this very futuristic uh, pads on him. These pads on the action figure are apparently to protect him from some kind of adverse effect of the laser that he operates. Uh, he did have a laser with the jump jet pack and when he came with the HAL, of course the HAL was a laser cannon uh, and the only other action figure that had those pads was Flash and he was the laser rifle trooper. So apparently these pads have something to do with protection from lasers. Be very cautious with this silver paint. This silver metallic paint that Hasbro used was not very robust. It would rub off very easily, so just have a care. Uh, and if you're going to get a Grand Slam, take careful note of the condition of the silver paint. In the early issues of the G.I. Joe comic book and in the cartoon, 
The jump jetpack was not associated with Grand Slam. It was used by Stalker, and I really think it looks great on Stalker. It just looks really cool. Uh, and before I had the silver pad version of Grand Slam, I always used to display my jump jetpack with Stalker. Let's take a look at the file card, and this is the file card that came with Grand Slam uh, with the jump jetpack. It was printed on the back of the box that the jump jetpack came in. On the other side, there's nothing. It was just the back of the box. And, of course, that was the second version of Grand Slam's file card. The first version was the version that came with the HAL laser cannon. And this, of course, the portrait is different because this is the art that was on the box for the HAL laser cannon. And this was the art that was on the box for the jump jetpack. The text on these two cards are almost identical. In fact, the only difference is that the card with the jump jetpack adds this line, jump jetpack, which was missing on his card for the HAL laser cannon. The title up here says Laser Jetpack Soldier, codename Grand Slam, file name James J. Barney, primary military specialty artillery, secondary military specialty electronics engineer, Birthplace, Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, and his grade is E5. This section says Grand Slam received initial training with conventional artillery and served with a 155mm battery, graduated special weapons school, top of class, specialized education, artillery school, advanced tech school, qualified expert M16, M1911A1, HAL heavy artillery laser, and jump jetpack. This quote down here says he's soft-spoken and calm, just a bit shy intelligent, loves to read escapist fantasy, in parentheses, science fiction and comic books. I kind of like that about Grand Slam. He's a comic book nerd, and I can kind of relate to that. That was my review of the 1983 Jump Jetpack and its pilot Grand Slam and his file card. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you're thinking of getting a Jump Jetpack, I hope you found this video informative. If you like this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up on YouTube, and don't forget to subscribe. I've got a lot of great new G.I. Joe toy and comic book reviews coming up, and you do not want to miss them. And if there's a vintage G.I. Joe toy that you would like for me to review, go ahead and leave a comment below, and I will do my best to get to it. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you all later. I'm so happy to finally have you in my collection, Bomb Disposal Unit. Oh, but I can't review you right now because you're from G.I. Joe, and this is Cobra Month. You wait right there while I go look at something from Cobra. Hello and welcome to Cobra Convergence 4. Commander 788 here, and it is my privilege to bring you the fourth year of Cobra Convergence, and we are going to be looking at a very special G.I. Joe toy. The 1982 Sears exclusive Cobra Missile Command Headquarters is a testament to Ron Rudat. If you don't know who Ron is, he is the person most responsible for the look of G.I. Joe in the 1980s. He designed all the early figures, he designed some of the vehicles, he created the iconic Cobra emblem. Ron's fingerprints are all over this playset. He designed all three figures that came with it. He designed the set itself. He even did the artwork on it. This is Ron Rudat's baby. I was honored to meet Ron Rudat at JoeCon a few years ago. I was able to thank him in person for all the work he did on G.I. Joe. Now, for Cobra Convergence, it's my privilege to review the first playset in the G.I. Joe A Real American Hero toy line, HCC 788 presents the Sears exclusive Cobra Missile Command Headquarters.
This is the 1982 Sears exclusive Cobra Missile Command Headquarters. It was sold only at Sears in 1982 and 1983. It was discontinued for 1984. This is the first playset of any kind in the G.I. Joe A Real American Hero toy line. It is made entirely of cardboard, with the exception of some plastic fasteners. This playset was exclusive to Sears because it was exclusive to only only one retailer, and because it was made of cardboard, this is a very rare set. Fewer were produced, and many of them did not survive playtime. The set came with three figures, all three Cobra figures that were available at the time. Cobra Commander, the Cobra Officer, and the Cobra Trooper. This set was the only way to get Cobra Commander at retail in 1982. The figure was otherwise only available through mail order. According to former Hasbro employee Kirk Bozigian, who was in charge of boys' toys at the time the G.I. Joe toy line was launched in 1982, Sears wanted an exclusive G.I. Joe toy. The presentation for the toy was made in August and needed to be ready by Christmas the same year. A plastic toy would take at least a year to produce. The only solution? Use cardboard instead of plastic. Ron Rudat, the Hasbro designer who created all of the early G.I. Joe action figures, did all the illustration on this set. In earlier eras of mass-produced toys, cardboard playsets were more common. Fully plastic playsets were exceptional. Toy companies used a variety of materials to keep costs down. Some playsets were nothing more than vinyl cases that opened up for play. Some larger sets were made of tin. Occasionally, the playset would just be a sheet of printed plastic that pieces were placed on. The petroleum crisis in the late 70s increased the price of plastic, which perpetuated the use of cardboard in playsets. Both the Kenner Star Wars Death Star playset and the Millennium Falcon had cardboard walls. After this, future G.I. Joe playsets would be made of plastic. They would also get bigger. In 1983, there was the G.I. Joe Headquarters Command Center. In 1985, there was the Transportable Tactical Battle Platform. Also in 1985, there was the USS Flag. In 1986, there was the Cobra Terror Drome. For Cobra, this was a big upgrade from the cardboard set. In 1987, there was the Defiant Shuttle Complex. Also in 1987, there was the Mobile Command Center. In 1990, there was the General. In 1992, there was a new G.I. Joe Headquarters playset. And also in 1992, there was the Toxo Lab. You may have noticed some pieces left out. Some vehicles were so large they seemed like playsets, and some playsets had wheels so they moved around like vehicles. However you classify them, G.I. Joe had a wealth of large toys to play with. Sears advertised the set in their 1982 wish book for $11.99. That's roughly the equivalent of the price of the three figures plus a couple extra dollars. Today, they're worth at least twice that. Sears was a big supporter of the G.I. Joe toy line and had several exclusive sets. In 1984, they had the Vamp and Hal 2-pack. In 1985, they had the Cat and the SMS. In 1986, they had the Dreadnought Air Assault and the Dreadnought Ground Assault. These sets tend to be rare. Any toy that was produced exclusively for one retailer would not be produced in the same numbers as a general retail release. They were also mostly reissues of earlier toys, sometimes with different colors. There was a modern version of this toy released in 2007. It was an exclusive to San Diego Comic-Con. I will show you a side-by-side -side comparison between the vintage and modern later in this video. I have the instruction sheet for the Missile Command Headquarters, and this is a little different from our usual vehicle blueprints in that it has the instructions on how to put the thing together, but it does not have an illustration of the toy on a grid background with a numbered list of the features. It does have illustrations of the various parts that go to it, and it has this blurb here. 
uh, with a little bit of text that kind of tries to talk up the set. This missile command station is a detailed copy of Cobra Command's super secret headquarters. Inside its thick steel walls is the world's most sophisticated state-of-the-art missile system engineered to operate under the most extreme conditions. It's made of cardboard, folks. Although it is cool to have the instruction sheet and it's certainly handy when you're putting the set together, a lot of collectors will consider the set to be complete without it. Let's look at the parts and the features of the Cobra Missile Command headquarters. And it's worth pointing out that everything is on one side of this playset. The back side of it is just plain white cardboard. For starters, you have this large background piece, which the instruction sheet calls the fully detailed Cobra missile base. It appears to be a domed base with a tunnel that lines up with the elevator rail and a couple guards in the tunnel. On the wall behind the missile is a big Cobra emblem. Cobra has its branding on everything. Then there's this little orange cart drawn on on the floor. There is exceptional technical detail on that background piece, all of it drawn by Ron Rudat. This is a two-dimensional piece on which all of the three-dimensional pieces are attached. Next we have the elevator, and the elevator is functional. It will slide along two sideways L-shaped slots. You can place an action figure in the elevator, and the elevator will slide over and down. And then, of course, back up and back over. Uh, it may take a little bit of work, but mine actually slides pretty easily. This is a pretty creative way of making a 3D moving part out of two-dimensional cardboard. There is some technical detail on that control panel, some switches and buttons and control panels and monitors, and a little Pac-Man there. And it looks like there's an illustration of the missiles. So uh, this is nice. I do like the elevator. The next layer out from the backboard is what the instruction sheet calls the missile support systems. It's mainly a bunch of technical detail with a couple platforms that connect to the backboard. And then of course the additional pieces connect to that piece, adding another dimension to the playset. If you move the elevator out of the way, you can stand action figures on those platforms. So they did try to give you ways to have the figures interact with the playset other than just standing in front of it. And here is more of that amazing technical detail illustrated by Ron Rudat uh, on that support system piece. As you can see, um, it's just a long piece uh, that connects to that backer board in a couple spots. Um, and then the other pieces are connected to that. But uh, really exceptional detail on that. Um, and that gives us another layer to look at. The next piece is the cruise missile. It is a flat piece. It is two dimensional. It's just illustrated on a piece of cardboard. It is connected to the missile support system piece at one point and it will pivot. It will go all the way vertical and it will go horizontal. If this set were brand new, the missile should hold in any position, but this is cardboard, it does tend to wear, so my missile will not stay up. And at this age, don't we all have that problem? In order to help keep it up, I usually use a piece of mounting putty, and that will keep it uh, up at a nice angle. Unfortunately, the missile will not launch. It will only pivot up and down. And this is the centerpiece of the playset. This is a missile command headquarters that cannot launch its missile. It's a little disappointing that the focus of the set is flat and doesn't really do much. A cruise missile is a guided missile that takes out ground targets. There are cruise missile designs that look similar to this one. Cruise missiles have been around for a long time and would have been pretty well known to the public at the time this set was released. There is a big red Cobra emblem on the tail of the missile and Cobra made sure to register their trademark. Directly in front of the missile is the work platform and as with all the other pieces, there is exceptional technical detail all over it. There's a ramp on one side, but the primary function is as a platform so you can stand 
a figure on it, and this guy can repair the missile or something. At the other end of the playset is the control panel. It is a U-shaped computer control console with tons of buttons and gauges and monitors all over it. It has three seats that attach to it. Unfortunately, I only have two seats. The third seat would go right here, uh, but the seats are all identical, so you can see what the seats look like. I really like this computer center. The missile may be the showpiece of the playset, but this is the heart. Uh, the figures can use the seats at the control panel by straddling the seat, and there are little holes in the cardboard for the figure's feet. Um, it works more or less. It's not perfect, but they had to make attached seats out of cardboard pieces somehow, and this is what they came up with. That's all the features on the playset, but we have one more piece to look at, the file card holder. Uh, this file card holder isn't technically part of the playset, but it did come with the playset. Some collectors will consider the set to be complete without it. This file card holder is nothing more than a box with a flap on the back. It has a G.I. Joe logo in front, a Cobra the enemy on each side. It is blank on the bottom. It is blank on the back. And on the front of that flap, it has uh, the G.I. Joe figures that were available at the time, at least most of them. Surprisingly, it seems to be missing Cobra Commander. He is not on there. And the top of the box says G.I. Joe Com Combat Command file. It has a slot in it, and that is for holding the three included file cards. We will be taking a closer look at these file cards a little later in this video. Here is one more look at all the amazing technical detail illustrated by Ron Rudat on this playset. Uh, they did a good job of making a play environment out of cardboard. Some collectors may think this thing is cheesy, but I think it's impressive considering the short amount of time they had to make it. There was, however, an alternative construction they could have gone with. Some other cardboard playsets took a different approach, and we will look at one of them later. Let's look at the figures that came with this playset. These figures were packaged in two different ways. In the earliest releases of this playset, they were sealed in a plastic bubble on the back of the file card. Later, probably in 1983, they came sealed in a plastic bag with the file card. All of these figures, like the playset, were designed by Ron Rudat. G.I. Joe did not have an enemy when they were first presented to Marvel Comics for creative input. Marvel suggested an enemy similar to Marvel's Hydra. The late Marvel editor Archie Goodwin came up with the name Cobra. An anecdote about Archie Goodwin, he was born in Kansas City, Missouri in 1937, but he spent his teen years in my hometown, Tulsa. He attended Will Rogers High School, the same high school as my parents. He graduated in 1955, and he has been inducted into the Will Rogers High School Hall of Fame. Sadly, he passed away in 1998, one of my great regrets is that I will never be able to meet him. Depending on when you bought the Missile Command headquarters, you could get one of three Cobra Commanders. The earliest releases of the playset in 1982 would have come with the Straight Arm Mickey Mouse Cobra Commander, so-called because of the simplified Cobra emblem on his chest with detached eyes on the top that look a little bit like Mickey Mouse ears. These Mickey Mouse Cobra Commander figures are somewhat rare. The early mail away figures also had this Mickey Mouse symbol. We don't know exactly why this odd chest symbol was used on the early figures. My guess is the factory mistakenly used a mock-up instead of the final design. Later in 1982 you would have got a straight arm Cobra Commander figure with the Cobra symbol that we are more familiar with. The later mail away figures also corrected the Cobra symbol on the chest. Other than the corrected chest symbol this figure is exactly like the other one. These are not as rare as the Mickey Mouse figures, but they are still sought after and can be expensive. And if you picked up the playset in 1983, you would have gotten a swivel arm Cobra Commander figure with the updated articulation on the arms and the regular Cobra chest symbol. Uh, this is exactly the same as the 1983 regular retail release. Before 1983, Cobra Commander was primarily a 
available through a mail order offer. This playset was the only way you could buy the figure in a store. In 1983, the figure was broadly available at retail. The retail 1983 version is the most common version, but that figure is still in high demand among collectors. Whichever version of Cobra Commander you got, he came with one accessory, the Venom laser pistol. It's in dark gray, it's kind of a clunky thing, looks a bit like a hair dryer. It does have a unique feature though. Uh, it will plug into the back. It has a peg, there's a hole in the back of the figure. He has a recharging pack molded on and uh, the laser pistol will peg on there for recharging. And that's not too bad. I kind of like that feature. Thanks to a viewer, Kurt Kessler, I have a full-size Venom laser pistol. I haven't tested it to see if it works yet, but you guys better watch out. Let's look at the sculpt design and color of Cobra Commander. He's wearing a light blue uniform. He has a light blue helmet with a silver mask. He's wearing a black shirt under a blue uniform jacket with a red Cobra emblem on the front. Uh, he has uh, that recharging port on his back for his Venom laser pistol. He's got a hole in the port that plugs in the pistol. Uh, it's got a couple straps sculpted onto his back and another strap or perhaps some wiring that goes around his midsection. His arms have long light blue sleeves and black gloves. His waist piece has a black belt with a couple pouches. Uh, he has a red belt buckle. On his legs he has that light blue color with a red stripe that runs all the way down his right side. On his left side, he does not have the red stripe, but he has a black dagger on his left thigh. Uh, his uniform covers most of his boots, but we do see he has black boots. In addition to Cobra Commander, depending on when you got the playset, you would get one of two Cobra officers. If you got the set in 1982, you would have gotten the straight arm Cobra officer, so called because on the lower arms, he only had one point of articulation, a hinge at the elbow. In 1983, you would have gotten the swivel arm Cobra officer, so called because he had a new point of articulation, a swivel just above the elbow. From the first time I saw this figure, I thought he looked special. He has a silver Cobra emblem on his chest, and I assumed that was tied to his rank. He is an officer. Beware that silver paint flakes off very easily. Uh, this one has a very nice clear silver cobra emblem but as you can see the silver paint on this one has partially worn away. Ron Rudat has said he designed these early cobra figures to be a faceless enemy. He did not want them to represent any particular country or ethnic group. So they all wear these blue uniforms and helmets with black masks that conceal the face. The cobra officer came with one accessory an AK-47 assault rifle and this is a pretty good light of that real-world weapon. Some fans feel the Cobra Trooper should have come with the AK and the Cobra Officer should have had the sniper rifle. However, in concept art by Ron Rudat, the Cobra Officer is clearly shown with the AK-47 and the Cobra Trooper clearly has the Dragunov sniper rifle. I've even seen some fans say the details of the Cobra Trooper are more fitting of the Officer and the Officer looks more like a Trooper. To add to the confusion, both the Officer and Trooper were reissued in 1989 as part of Python Patrol, but their roles were reversed. The Officer Mold became the Python Trooper, and the Trooper Mold became the Python Officer. If you are of the opinion that the Trooper looks like an Officer and the Officer looks like a Trooper, the Python Patrol versions could be validation of that opinion. Let's look at the sculpt, design, and color of the Cobra Officer. The Cobra Officer officer has a dark blue helmet with a chevron molded on. He has a black mask that covers his nose and mouth and the lower half of his face. Uh, he has a dark blue uniform, that same dark blue color, with a silver cobra emblem on his chest. He has black web gear, uh, front and back, and he has gray on his shoulders and then a gray explosive device on the left side of his chest. He has long dark blue sleeves with black gloves. 
On his waist piece, he has a black belt with a couple small pouches. Um, he has dark blue legs. Uh, on his left leg, there is a black dagger. And then he has tall black boots. And finally, we get to the Cobra Trooper. Depending on when you bought the playset, you would get one of two Cobra Troopers. In 1982, you would get the straight arm Cobra Trooper, again with the single hinge at the elbow. In 1983, you would get the swivel arm Cobra Trooper with the swivel above the elbow. This is the backbone of the Cobra Legion, the famous blue shirts. They do the bulk of the frontline fighting. In 1986, they were replaced by the Viper, which filled the same role. The Vipers are the blue shirts, just with updated uniforms. Larry Hama, the writer of the comic book series, even refers to the blue shirts as Vipers. On the file card, they are just called Cobra, but the box for the Missile Command headquarters calls them troopers. Even though the Cobra officer and the trooper look very similar, they share only one part between them, the waist piece. All the other parts are unique. The Cobra trooper came with one accessory, the Dragonov SVD sniper rifle in dark gray. Uh, this is another pretty good representation of a real world weapon, though slightly modified. It's no surprise these guys came with Russian weapons. The Soviet Union was the biggest threat to the United States at the time. Looking at the sculpt design and color of the Cobra Trooper, he has a dark blue helmet, uh, the same color blue as the Cobra Officer. In fact, this figure is the same color as the Cobra Officer, but he does not have the chevron on the helmet. He does have that same black mask. Uh, he has a dark blue uniform shirt with a red Cobra emblem. He has a couple black straps. They continue to the back. Uh, he has a molded on grenade launcher on one strap. He has long blue sleeves and blue gloves, unpainted gloves. Uh, on his upper right arm, he has a silver wire. On his upper left arm, he has a couple grenades for his grenade launcher. His waist piece is exactly the same as the Cobra Officer. He's got that same black belt. His legs are that same dark blue uniform color. He has a pocket on the right leg. He has a black dagger on the left leg. It's a little different from the Cobra Officer dagger. He has black knee pads and he has black boots. The mold for the swivel arm Cobra Trooper was used twice in 1983. First, of course, for the Cobra Trooper, and then for the 1983 Viper Pilot, which came with the Viper Glider. The difference was the Viper Pilot had the silver Cobra chest emblem instead of red. Other than that, these figures are identical. This caused some confusion for me because I thought the silver emblem meant he was an officer, but the Viper Pilot was not an officer. Let's take a look at the file cards that came with these three figures. At first glance, they look exactly like the retail file cards, but there are a couple important things to look for. These cards were not printed on the backs of retail card backs. They were just rectangular cards with a black border and a flag point in the corner. Uh, the black borders on my cards have been cut out. Without the black borders, the best way to distinguish these cards from regular retail is to look at the back. In the earliest releases of this playset, the figures were sealed on the back of the file cards in a plastic bubble. So on the back of the card, you will have a red back, usually with a tear where the figure was taken off. Later releases of the playset had the figures in a plastic bag with the file card. So those file cards would just have a plain red back and they would not be torn off like this. That's not such a problem with Cobra Commander, but that could cause confusion on the other two file cards. The earliest mail away Cobra Commander file cards had exactly the same text as the Sears exclusive file card, but it was not red on the back. It just had a plain cardboard backing. When the swivel arm figure was finally released at retail in 1983, it had a file card with exactly the same text as the other two, uh, but the back of the file card has some of the front uh, card art on there, so it's obvious that this card was cut out of the back of the retail card. The Cobra Officer file card has the same red backing with the tear 
there where the bubble was removed, and it has exactly the same text as the retail file card, uh, but the retail card has the artwork on the other side, so that's easy to distinguish. One problem with the Cobra Officer and the Cobra Trooper's red back file cards is with the later Sears exclusive sets, uh, they did not have the tear on the back. They were bagged file cards, and both of these guys got later mail away releases that also had red backed file cards. The mail away file cards had a white border instead of a black border, but when the borders are cut out, it could be very difficult to distinguish the Sears exclusive file cards from the mail away file cards. Let's round out our look at file cards by looking at the Cobra Trooper file card. Again, it just says Cobra, not Cobra Trooper, codenamed the enemy. In fact, the officer also says codenamed the enemy, and the Cobra Commander file card says codename Enemy Leader, but this is the Cobra Trooper. The text is the same as the retail file card, and again we have the red back with the tear where the bubble was removed, so this would have come from a 1982 Sears Missile Command Headquarters playset, and once again on the retail card on the other side we have that artwork, so easy to distinguish the retail from the Sears exclusive, but like the Cobra Officer there was a later mail away Cobra Trooper with a red back file card and a white border, so with the white border cut out it could be difficult to distinguish the mail away file card from the Sears file card. In 2017 Hasbro issued a remake of this playset and it was an exclusive to San Diego Comic Con. Like the original it was made of cardboard and it came with three action figures, the modern equivalent of Cobra Commander, the Cobra Officer, and the Cobra Trooper. Looking at these two side by side, obviously they have very similar construction and they share a lot of the same details, so it could be very easy to mix them up. Upon closer inspection though, there are significant differences between these two. In fact, none of the parts are identical, so if you know what to look for, you should always be able to tell the modern from the vintage. Hasbro didn't help matters by making the box very similar to the 1982 box, including including some distressing, some wear and tear, some yellowing of the white areas. This is made to look like an old box, even though it's brand new. However, on the 2017 box, the photograph includes modern action figures, so that's of course a major difference from the 1982 box. In fact, the 1982 box had photographs of prototype figures rather than the regular retail production figures, uh, but if you see modern action figures on the front of the box, that's a pretty good way to know that you have the modern box, not the Vintage. The back of the box is also very similar to the 1982 box with the two color printing on a white background, but if you look at it, there are brown spots all over it as if it's aged cardboard but this is a brand new box. They just intentionally made it look old. Flipping the playsets around to the back, you can see the similar construction and material. I'd say the cardboard used in the modern release is thinner than the original, uh, but perhaps a bit sturdier. One difference in the construction between modern and vintage is the vintage parts were printed on larger sheets of cardboard that were perforated, so you would have to punch the parts out. So you'll see little nibs of cardboard cardboard along the edges where the pieces were connected to the larger sheets of cardboard. On the modern release, all the parts were die cut, so you didn't have to punch them out. They came bagged exactly as you see them. The biggest difference and the easiest difference to spot between the modern and the vintage is the artwork. The artwork on the modern release is entirely done with computer. It doesn't look like any of it is hand drawn. There are some additional details like the additional detail on the floor, the background, Ground, um, and the guards in the tunnel are actually photographs of modern action figures uh, rather than hand-drawn. Um, and uh, mostly the details are the same, uh, except they are clearly done on computer. Uh, rather than hand-drawn as the original was. Compare that with the original and all of it is hand-drawn and inked and painted and really shows the hand of the artist. Um, the details are a little bit different. Uh, there's less detail on that floor and the background, but otherwise a lot of the details are essentially the same as the modern version, but 
uh, you can see that this was drawn by somebody. This was not done on computer, uh, and that's very evident uh, when you have them side by side. They both came with the file card holder. The modern one here is in much better shape because it's brand new, but the construction is pretty much the same, and the artwork on them is almost identical. The artwork on the back flap is almost identical to the vintage. The printing is maybe a shade darker, but it does look like they've used the vintage artwork on the modern. Some differences to look for on the vintage file card holder, there is a number here in the bottom corner that is not present on the modern release. Also on the vintage, it has Hasbro's copyright information here on the top and this number 6200 next to the Hasbro logo. On the modern release, it does not have the copyright information on there, and it has a different number next to the Hasbro logo. You can see, though, how it would be easy to mix these two up. You have the Cobra enemy on the sides and a blank back and bottom, exactly as the vintage file card holder. The file cards are also very similar, so it's important to not mix these up. Uh, the file cards have the black border, but no flag point in the corner and they have the red backing. One thing I noticed on this modern Cobra Commander file card is they fixed an error that was on the original. The original file card had a typo. There was an extra comma in this sentence, his main battle plan for world control. Uh, and they actually fixed that and removed the errant comma on the modern one. Uh, the text is otherwise quite similar. The artwork obviously is pretty much the same. On the modern card, they did add a disclaimer in fine print down at the bottom that does not appear on the original. The file cards with this set use the classic file card shape that we're used to from the 80s. Modern file cards are mostly shaped like this with this longer section up here on top. So they are really trying to make these look like vintage file cards. Let's compare the figures these two sets came with. We've already looked at the vintage figures that came with the 1982 release. The 2017 release came with modern figures with modern articulation and sculpting, but it came with the same three characters, Cobra Commander, the Cobra Officer, and the Cobra Trooper. The modern version paid homage to the vintage, particularly with the Cobra Commander figure. The scale of the modern figures is slightly different from the vintage. They are a little taller. They also came with figure stands that had the name of the character printed on them. This Cobra Commander figure, instead of having the regular Cobra emblem, has the Mickey Mouse Cobra emblem on his chest. So that is a direct homage to the earliest Cobra Commander figures. This modern figure, like the vintage, has the red stripe down the right leg and no stripe on the left leg. That's a direct copy of the vintage and like the vintage the modern figure has a recharging pack molded onto the back on which you can connect his venom laser pistol this figure does have all modern articulation it also has a removable helmet and on his left leg he has a removable knife. The Cobra Officer figure has a lot of callbacks to the vintage figure. He has that same dark blue uniform. Uh, he has an AK-47 rifle, uh, similar to the original, but it's updated. It's not exactly the same. Uh, he has that silver Cobra chest emblem. His web gear is removable. It's not just sculpted on. And he has a removable helmet. And finally, the Cobra Trooper with the figure stand that just says Cobra has has a lot of callbacks to the vintage figure. Uh, on the modern figure, we actually lose some of the silver details that were on the vintage figure, but he still has that dark blue uniform with the red Cobra emblem on the chest. Uh, he still has the knee pads, and that's an important detail. He has the Dragunov sniper rifle, and that is similar to the vintage, but not exactly the same. It is updated. Uh, like the Cobra officer, he has removable web gear, and and a removable helmet. To give you a more thorough look at the San Diego Comic-Con Missile Command headquarters, I recorded an unboxing and assembly video, which you should see on my YouTube channel later this week. I said earlier there was an alternative construction they could have used for this cardboard playset, and I was going to show it to you. For that, we have to go outside the United States to the British version of G.I. Joe, Action Force, produced by the UK company, 
Mini Palatoy. They made cardboard playsets that were dramatically different from this one. Palatoy was the licensee for Star Wars in the UK, and they made a cardboard playset for the Death Star that we did not get in the US. They made a similar cardboard playset for Action Force, and it's my privilege to show that to you now. This is the Action Force Headquarters playset by Palatoy. It is made primarily of cardboard, with a few minor plastic pieces. This one is missing some of the plastic pieces, but it is made of a thicker cardboard than the Missile Command Headquarters, so it is sturdier. But as you can see, this is a true 3D playset. Instead of starting with a background and building forward, they started with the ground and built up. It has multiple levels, it has a helipad, it has a wall that unfolds into a runway. It is spectacular. It has so much more play value than the American playset. I have to thank Michael in the UK for sending this to me. So yes, if you're going to do a cardboard playset, this is the way to do it. But in fairness to Hasbro and Ron Rudat, they were on a time crunch and they probably did not have time to construct something like this. But I can still daydream about getting this kind of playset for G.I. Joe. Looking at how this playset and these characters were used in G.I. Joe media, Cobra had many secret bases, but none exactly like this, so I think it's fair to say this playset was not used in G.I. Joe media. Cobra Commander, the Cobra Officer, and the Cobra Trooper, however, were used extensively. In the G.I. Joe animated series, Cobra Commander had his origins in Cobra Law, the secretive race of mutants hiding in the Himalayas. Cobra Commander was a Cobra Law scientist whose face was disfigured in an experiment. For some reason, he was chosen to lead Cobra in an attempt to conquer the human world. He was, of course, totally inept at that task. The animated version of Cobra Commander tended to be more buffoonish. He concocted wild, implausible plans to take over the world, and those plans invariably failed. Even so, he was one of the most important characters in the series. At one point, they tried to get rid of him and replace him with Serpentor, but he came back. In the 1987 animated movie, they transformed him into a snake. It looked like that was the end end of Cobra Commander, but they brought him back in the Deke animated series. He was a snake man, and he wore his battle armor to cover his nakedness. There were countless officers and troopers in the animated series. They were most famous for having stormtrooper aim. They would fire their lasers all day and never hit anything. Of course, this was an animated series for TV, so the violence had to be toned down. In the G.I. Joe comic book series published by Marvel Comics, Cobra Commander was again one of the most important characters in the series, but he was very different from his animated appearance. Larry Hama, the writer of the comic book series, in a Toy Fair magazine interview said he loved writing Cobra Commander. He modeled Cobra Commander after conservative political personality William F. Buckley. We know a lot about Cobra Commander in the comic book series, more than most Cobra characters. We know his past occupation, we know something about his family, we have met his wife and son. Cobra Commander began his journey to evil after the death of his brother, Dan, in a car accident. That same incident caused the death of Snake Eyes' family. Cobra Commander blamed Snake Eyes for his brother's death. At some point in his past, Cobra Commander was a used car salesman. He became a corrupt businessman, amassing wealth through unscrupulous means, and eventually forming the underground organization Cobra. Cobra completely took over the small American town of Springfield. Cobra Commander contracted the assassination of Snake Eyes when he was still in training with the Arashikage Ninja Clan. The assassin, Zartan, accidentally killed the Hard Master instead. That incident set in motion a long chain of revenge, deception, and hatred. His son, Billy, became a resistance fighter in Springfield. He was recruited by the Baroness and Major Blood to kill Cobra Commander, but Destro prevented him from doing it. He was taken under Storm Shadow's wing and given ninja training. 
In a missile attack by scrap iron, he lost an eye and a leg. His leg was replaced with a mechanical one. Cobra Commander's ex-wife reappeared in issue number 83. She reunited with Billy. At one point, Cobra Commander was thought dead. He was replaced by a Crimson Guardsman called Fred Seven, who started a civil war with Serpentor. The imposter Cobra Commander prevailed. The real Cobra Commander was not dead, though. He returned to retake command of Cobra. He trapped all his internal enemies in a land locked freighter and buried it under a volcano. That's his style. Cobra Commander could have been a stand-in for any foreign enemy of the U.S., but in the comic book, that's not what he was. He represented the enemy within. He represented the allure of fascism and power over all else. Cobra was a domestic terrorist group. There were plenty of Cobra officers in the comic book series. Often the officers and troopers were used almost interchangeably. Their uniforms were almost identical. There was one Cobra officer that got special attention, Scarface. He was identifiable by the V-shaped scar that ran across his eyes. He operated as a courier for Cobra during Dr. Venom's plot to develop a lethal plague toxin. Scarface died in issue number 19. Among my friends, Scarface created a rumor of a rare variant of the Cobra officer figure. We thought some Cobra officers would have the scars sculpted onto the face. We looked closely at every Cobra officer figure we could find, but we never saw the scars. Of course, the scarred Cobra officer figure did not exist at the time. There is now a modern scarred Cobra officer figure, though. There were countless Cobra troopers in the comic book series. Even though they were replaced with the upgraded Vipers, they still appeared in the comic book long after the figures were discontinued. Larry Hama refers to these blue shirts as Vipers, even though they weren't called Vipers until they were upgraded in 1986. Looking at the Missile Command headquarters overall, the figures that came with it are great. They're still among my favorite Cobra figures in the entire line. They were groundbreaking, they were iconic, they are top tier. The playset itself has some rather obvious problems. The cardboard construction is very fragile. The rarity of the set makes it very expensive. The play value is limited. The cruise missile, the centerpiece of the playset, does not launch. You can elevate it to launch position, but G.I. Joe had better stop it there because it doesn't go anywhere. The elevator does move, but that's not enough to elevate it to a top tier playset. This playset is highly desired by collectors primarily because it is rare. It is one of the most difficult playsets to complete. The 1987 Defiant Shuttle Complex may be more difficult to complete than this one, but that is because of the sheer number of parts. The Missile Command Headquarters has fewer parts, but those parts are very hard to find. I'd say this is more of a diorama than a playset. For that purpose, it works fine. It may not have much play value, but the background and the platforms look nice on display. The best thing about this set is the story behind it. It was the first attempt at a playset in the line. It was an exclusive to Sears, which created challenges to producing it on time. It was conceived and executed by the architect of G.I. Joe, Ron Rudat. It has a place in the history and legend of G.I. Joe. Its legend was so great, they tried to recapture it in 2017. Were they successful? You'll have to judge. I wouldn't fault any collector for passing on this set. You'll spend a lot of money for a few pieces of cardboard. Even if you have the money to spend, you may not see the value in spending it on this. And I understand that. I am happy to have it because of its history and because I can share it with you. That was my review of the Cobra Missile Command Headquarters. I hope you enjoyed it. We have more Cobra Convergence coming this week. On Monday, July 8th, we have SEO Toy Review on YouTube. On Tuesday, July 9th, we have the Forgotten Figures blog. 
On Wednesday, July 10th, we have Retro Blasting on YouTube. On Thursday, July 11th, we have McDowan on YouTube. On Friday, July 12th, we have Special Mission Force on Instagram. And on Saturday, July 13th, we have My Side of the Laundry Room on YouTube. There is a full schedule of the event on hcc788.com. Don't forget, we have Cobra Convergence content for you every day this month. If you like what we're doing here, please consider giving this video a thumbs up on YouTube, subscribing to the YouTube channel, hitting the notification bell so you don't miss any videos, and sharing this video with your friends. I am on social media on Facebook and Twitter and my website hcc788.com. Thank you to my patrons. I can't thank you guys enough. If you like these videos and you'd like to support the channel in that way, please consider checking out my Patreon for some special perks and you can find out how to decode these mysterious messages. I'll be back next week with another Cobra Convergence review. It's Cobra Convergence all month on my channel. I'll see you then and until then, always remember, only Cobra is Cobra. I thought I left something there. <gasps> Whoa! Oh, oh, they're gone! They're gone! Oh my god! Oh, 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 thank god these guys are still there. They're Susan! 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 monster do you think I am? Do you really want me to answer that? I didn't destroy anything. I stole it. And believe me, Steve, you won't be my only target. <laughs> I need help here. Form BX257. Form BX257. Kevin! Kevin! Hello? Oh, hey, buddy. I had a feeling you'd be calling. Timmer has gone mad. He has an infinity gauntlet. Oh, I guess that explains why half my collection is missing. Ah, yours too? This is bigger than just the two of us. It's time for a convergence. Right. Hello? Sorry, wrong number. Yeah, maybe not include him in this. Right, sorry, force of habit. It's time for the Convergence Initiative. Hello everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here and I'm back with another vintage G.I. Joe toy review. But that's not all I'm back with. This is a special video. I have hit 50 subscribers and that's fantastic. I've only been doing this for a few months. I'm still a newcomer and I've already hit 50 subscribers. Thank you to everyone who subscribed. I'm very grateful. I really appreciate it. In this video, we are going to be reviewing the G.I. Joe Ram motorcycle, but I've got a special announcement after the review, so make sure you stick around for that. This is the 1982 G.I. Joe Ram motorcycle. Ram, R-A-M, is an acronym that stands for Rapid Fire Motorcycle, which doesn't actually spell out Ram. It spells out Erfum. The Ram motorcycle was first released in 1982 in the first line of vehicles when G.I. Joe was rebooted in 1982. It was also sold in 1983, it was discontinued in 1984, and it was not replaced with any other motorcycle in 1984. But there was a replacement for the Ram motorcycle in 1985, the Silver Mirage motorcycle. The Ram was worth two flag points and it did not come with an action figure. Let's look at the parts and the features of the Ram motorcycle, starting of course with this very large prominent gun that attaches to the side. The blueprints call this a 20 millimeter electric gatling gun and it really does look very impressive. Lots of nice detail on here. 
It has a wheel on here at the bottom so it can roll along when it's attached to the motorcycle. The gun has these two pegs here. One of them is round and another one is rectangular and they fit into the corresponding holes on the side of the motorcycle. They fit right in there and they don't snap in, they just friction in. Uh, it doesn't always stay in very well so sometimes I use a little bit of sticky tack just to hold it in a little bit better. On either side we have these saddle packs. There are two of them and they fit into these holes, uh, these rectangular slots here in the back. And these are frequently lost items, so you will often see Ram motorcycles missing one or both of these saddle packs. And as you can see, uh, they're not the same. Uh, although they are the same mold, they have different stickers. There's saddle pack one and saddle pack two. So if you're wanting a complete Ram, you need to check and check the stickers and make sure that you're getting the right ones. You need both of them in order to have a complete motorcycle. The front wheel turns a little bit uh, and not too much and that's a nice feature. I'm actually glad that it doesn't turn too much otherwise uh, it might not roll straight when you roll it along the ground so just a little bit of turn in the front wheel is okay. One thing I like about the tires is that uh, on the side it doesn't say Goodyear or anything like that. It has Hasbro's copyright information. This kind of hood looking thing up at the front here the blueprints call aerodynamic fairing and this may be taken from a real world vehicle, the Honda CB900 F2, which has a similar sort of housing on the front end here. On the other side, we have a sticker control panel. That's a nice detail. Uh, and it's just hollow inside. There are no handlebars, but this was designed for the straight arm action figures like Breaker here. Uh, the straight arm, straight arm action figures could not bend their uh, arms at the bicep to hold on to uh, handlebars. So uh, just having them stick their hands inside there was just much more practical. It worked better with these 1982 figures with the less articulation. All the way around the motorcycle, there is a lot of really impressive detail. Uh, this is a nicely detailed uh, motorcycle, a very nicely detailed vehicle, uh, especially considering this was the first line of vehicles, and sometimes those early G.I. Joe vehicles uh, were a little bit lacking in detail compared to later vehicles, but this this looks really nice. This engine, the blueprints call a 1,000cc twin cam engine, fuel injected and turbocharged. At the bottom, there is a kickstand that uh, will go up and down. And this is another frequently missing item. So if you uh, are getting a Ram motorcycle, uh, just make sure that it still has the, the kickstand that is often missing. On both sides, we have some posts here, uh, two on this side and two on that side, and those are for holding the action figure on the motorcycle. I'll show you how that works. Um, the action figure's legs kind of go between those posts. On this side, uh, the, the top of the foot goes under this post, and the, this post goes on the back of his ankle. On the other side, uh, we have one post for uh, the back of his leg, and another lower post for the top of his foot, and uh, that kind of holds him on there uh, with his hands inside the, uh, the hood. And I, th I find it easier to put the action figure on before putting the gun on. Uh, if the gun is on, uh, sometimes it obstructs the uh, uh, action figure's foot. So uh, once you have the figure in, like Breaker here, uh, there you go. And you have uh, Breaker ready to ride into battle on the Ram motorcycle. He looks like he's ready to do some business. There is a minor controversy about who should ride the Ram motorcycle. In the comic book, uh, it always showed Rock and Roll as the uh, driver of the Ram. Always paired Rock and Roll with it. Uh, and uh, I don't know, he looks pretty good. Rock and Roll was the machine gunner of that first G.I. Joe group. Uh, and so I guess they kind of figured that machine gunner, big machine gun, those should go together. However, the box art did not show Rock and Roll on the Ram. It had Breaker. And Breaker was featured in the first TV commercial uh, of, uh, that included the Ram motorcycle. Uh, and I have always been partial to Breaker on the Ram. I always preferred Breaker to Rock and Roll on the Ram motorcycle uh, for a couple reasons. First of all, Breaker 
uh, doesn't have any weapons. He didn't come with any firearms. He only came with his communication uh, equipment and his helmet. And so he doesn't have any guns to fire. So if you pair him with the ram, he can still have all of his accessories on. And he has this really badass gun on his motorcycle so he can ride into battle and actually fight Cobra. Whereas Rock and Roll, he already had a really big gun. And it wasn't really very easy for him to carry his big gun when he was riding on the motorcycle. So I think that Rock and Roll is pretty well equipped, but uh, Breaker really, I think, fits the Ram motorcycle better. I, I even like the combination of the lighter green on the motorcycle and the darker or medium green on Breaker's uniform. I just think that looks really good. So I put the question to you. Do you prefer Rock and Roll on the Ram or Breaker? or one of the other action figures. Uh, what's your preference? That's my review of the Ram motorcycle. It is a pretty simple toy, and so there's not a lot to go over here, but it's still a really cool toy. I loved this when I was a kid. I think that it, it's just a really awesome vehicle. Uh, it it's, looks great with the action figures. It looks really menacing with that huge gun on the side. Uh, it looks fast, so it really looks like something that uh, the Joe team would really want to have and that they would like to take into battle. This, this is like a fast attack vehicle with some great armament. I hope you liked this video. If you did, make sure you give it a thumbs up on YouTube and make sure you subscribe. I've got a lot of great new G.I. Joe toy reviews coming up. You do not want to miss them. And make sure you like the Hooded Cobra Commander 788 Facebook page. There are a lot of updates on that page that you don't get anywhere else. But this is not the end of the video. I've got a special announcement coming up right now. I hope you enjoyed the review. Now it's time for a special announcement. I'm going to be giving away a vintage G.I. Joe toy to one of my viewers. I decided when I started that when I hit 100 subscribers, I was going to give away one of my vintage G.I. Joe toys. So now that we're at the halfway point, I'm letting you know that when I hit 100 subscribers, I'm going to give away a toy, and specifically, I'm going to give away... The Ram Motorcycle, the very one that I reviewed in this video. This is from my personal collection, and this could be yours. I'll tell you how it's going to work. First, I've got to hit 100 subscribers. When I hit 100 subscribers, watch for the 100 subscriber announcement video. And then you will put a comment on that video to let me know that you would like to be in the running for the Vintage G.I. Joe toy. Then I will select one of the commenters at random and it will be yours. You won't even have to pay for shipping. Now you might be thinking, this is kind of a small toy and it's a fairly common item. That's not much of a prize, but hey, this is just for my first 100 subscribers. As I hit more subscriber milestones, I'll be giving away bigger and better G.I. Joe toys. I want to share some of the vintage G.I. Joe love with you, the viewer. So stick with me. There are a lot of great G.I. Joe toys yet to review, and it's going to be a great time as we climb up toward 100 subscribers. And then when we get there, one of you is going to get this little guy. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Hello everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here, and this time we're going to do something a little different. This is not a quick shot, this is a full review, but we're not going to be reviewing a G.I. Joe action figure or vehicle. Instead, I wanted to look at a couple ways Hasbro gave us to carry the figures. We're going to look at the 1982 official collector display case and the 1983 pocket patrol pack. I had both of these as a kid, and I thought they were pretty cool, so let's check them out, starting with the 1982 collector display case. This is an official collector display case. This is not a licensed product. Hasbro actually produced these, and this is pretty much what it looked like on the shelves. It didn't have any outer packaging or anything like that. Uh, in fact, this one still has the price sticker. Looks like it was purchased at Rinks for $4.89. On the front, we have this really nice image that has most of the G.I. Joe characters from 1982 uh, with the Mobat tank in the background. It's very dynamic. It looks great. This same image was used on the 1983 Battle Gear Accessory Pack number one, and it was used on the card for the Pocket Patrol Pack. A modified version of this image was used on the G.I. Joe comic book issue number one. You can see it carries and displays 12 G.I. Joe team members. There's the official Hasbro logo there. Now this number 12 is a little bit of a problem because 
In 1982, there were 13 members of the G.I. Joe team, and there were three Cobra figures if you count the mail-away Cobra Commander. So if you had the entire set, you could not use them all in this display case. You just have to pick the 12 you liked the best to display. On the back side, we have that G.I. Joe logo there, and we have some photos and some information about the display case. Uh, we have a photo of some of the 1982 G.I. Joe action figures. Uh, not all of them, though. It looks like we are missing Hawk uh, and Grand Slam and Clutch. Uh, and the Cobra Officer. Then down here we have some photos showing how to use the display case. You can either set it on a shelf, and that's the way I like to do it. You can close it up and use it as a carrying case, or you can even mount it on a wall. The case is hinged on one side, and it has clips on the other side, so it opens like a book. And there's even a handy arrow right here on the top that says open here. So let's open it as instructed and take a look at the inside. Here is the inside space to display the figures and there are some interesting choices here of course uh, these are the spaces for the figures and uh, there are strips that cover them and hold the figures in on these strips there are labels and the display case came with a label sheet that had a label for each of the 1982 figures and these were placed on here by the purchaser uh, and so you just chose whichever labels you wanted to use and placed them wherever you wanted to for that reason as a collector if you get a display case that already has the labels applied uh, it's very unlikely that any two of them will be exactly alike those strips peg in and can be removed and since they can be removed they are often missing these labels are interesting they do not include the character's code name only the specialty in red letters and the accessories in black letters and they don't even mention all of the accessories really only just the weapon uh, no helmets or backpacks are listed. This display case was reissued in 1983 and it included a new label sheet with the 1983 lineup. The display case was also available in 1984, but I'm not aware of any 1984 label sheet. Next we have a weapons armory with a removable door and this is for storing accessories. Now obviously this is not going to hold every accessory from 1982. It probably won't even hold the accessories just for the 12 figures you can fit in here but it is large enough to hold most of the weapons. It will even hold the largest weapon issued with a figure that year, Rock and Roll's machine gun. Since this door is removable, it is often missing, and there's another problem with it. It pegs on using three very thin pegs, and those can crack off, and they can even break off inside the case. Next, we have the partition for the combat command file, and this is a space for holding file cards. It pegs in exactly the same way as the figure strips do, uh, but one of the pegs actually goes behind the armory door, so you have to remove the armory door in order to take off this strip. There is enough space in that partition to hold all of the 1982 file cards. Holds it pretty snugly, but they do all fit, and they are fairly secure in there. As mentioned earlier, there are three ways to use this display case. You can either set it on a shelf like that, or you can close it up and use it as a carrying case, or you can mount it on a wall. And it actually has notches. There are four of them. One of them is behind the armory door where you can hang it on nails uh, nailed into a wall. The problem with this is uh, these little notches here are covered by the label in the front and the back. So if you mount this on the wall, it will necessitate punching through the labels. Here is the display case filled with figures. Uh, these are the figures that this particular display case has labeled. And of course, the figure is with its particular label. And I went ahead and put the file cards in there as well. Uh, this is how it was intended to be used. Uh, but I don't prefer this as a way of displaying the figures. The figures can't always keep their accessories uh, on while they're in the display case and like I said that weapons armory is just too small to hold all of the accessories so I prefer to display the figures in a different way 
but I actually like to display the case itself. This is what I like to do. This case has some gorgeous artwork and photos, and it's kind of a novelty in itself and deserves its own display. And if you're using it to display figures, then you are hiding this really nice artwork uh, that I think deserves to be seen. So this is what I prefer to do. Display the figures separately and then display the display case on its own. Now let's look at the Pocket Patrol Pack from 1983. This shouldn't take nearly as much time as looking at the collector display case. Uh, there's just much less to these. Again, these are official Hasbro products. These are not licensed. These Pocket Patrol Packs were first released carded in 1983 at retail and they were later available through the mail. We have two of them here because we have a variant. The G.I. Joe label on them changed over the years. It started out at retail with this label, uh, the black background and that original G.I. Joe lab label, which looks pretty good. This is the most common version of the Pocket Patrol pack. Later ones updated the logo. But not just the logo. If you look at the space where the label goes, it actually changed. Originally, uh, it was a rectangle with, with an angled edge here on this side. Later, it was changed to just a basic rectangle. Uh, so it's not just the label that changed. There was a change in the mold itself. The label on this one is misapplied, unfortunately. It's a little crooked. Uh, these Pocket Patrol packs were included with some later releases of the Mail Away Starduster figure from 1987. Later still, the Pocket Patrol pack was given away for free for any orders of $20 or more from Hasbro Direct. So there should be a lot of these floating around. On the back of the Pocket Patrol pack we have a loop and this is for a belt. You're supposed to wear this on a belt uh, and it's very easy to use. You have a clip here in front. You just pop it open and that reveals three compartments for storing figures. I've put three random figures from 1983 in the Pocket Patrol pack to show you how it works. It only holds the three figures. That's it. It's really all it does. Uh, but one thing that's nice about it is there's enough space in there that most figures can still keep their accessories on and the case will still close. That's all there is to the Pocket Patrol pack. That's really all there is to it. It does nothing else. It just holds those three figures and nothing more. But I did have the Pocket Patrol pack as a kid. In fact, I think I had several of them. And sometimes we would use them as ammunition packs when we were role playing as soldiers. So they did have that function. When they're not using them as figures, uh, they did kind of make a nice role play toy as kind of ammunition packs. That was my review of the 1982 official collector display case and the 1983 Pocket Pocket Patrol Pack. I hope you enjoyed it. I thought it might be fun to just do something a little different. Uh, we do have full vintage G.I. Joe toy reviews every week on this channel, so please subscribe to the YouTube channel so you don't miss those. You can find me on social media, on Facebook and Twitter, and I have a Patreon if you'd like to support the channel in that way. And I do have to give a special thanks to my patrons. Uh, their generosity is overwhelming and I greatly appreciate it. I also have a coffee account if you like the videos and would like to leave me a one-time tip. I'll be coming at you with a full vintage G.I. Joe toy review soon, so please don't miss that. And until then, remember, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe. Hello everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here, and this time I'm not doing a review of a G.I. Joe toy. Instead, I wanted to do something a little bit different. I wanted to do a video that might hopefully be useful to collectors of vintage G.I. Joe. Since there seems to be a lot of confusion about the 1982 re-release of G.I. Joe, since the figures did reuse a lot of parts between them, I wanted to do a parts and color guide for the 1982 G.I. Joe release so that you can figure out which character you have and how he's different from the others, even though they all tend to look very much alike. Before we get started, let me single out a few that we are not going to take a look at today. First of all, I'm not going to look at the Cobra action figures because they didn't really use many parts between them uh, and they're all blue so they're pretty easy to identify. 
Uh, so I don't think that really needs a guide. Essentially, if it's blue, it's a cobra. Also, I'm not going to take a look at Snake Eyes because, again, even though he reused the sculpt from a lot of other action figures, he was the only one that was all black. So if you need any help identifying a part of Snake Eyes, if it's black plastic, it's Snake Eyes. Also, I'm not going to look at Scarlet because she had entirely unique parts, so it is really not difficult to identify Scarlet. That leaves us with these 11 figures. And these figures do tend to look a lot like each other because they reused a whole bunch of parts, sometimes just recolored, sometimes not recolored at all. So we're going to look at each and every one of these. I'm going to show you how you can identify which figure you have. I'm going to show you all the parts that they share with each other and the different colors and the different ways that they try to differentiate these different action figures. Let's take a look at each one, and as we go through, I will label the names so you can know which figure we're looking at throughout this video. Over here we have Breaker, this is Rock and Roll, Short Fuse, Stalker, Hawk, Zap, Grand Slam, Stealer, Flash, Clutch, and Grunt. G.I. Joe uniforms came in three basic colors of green. Light green, medium green, and dark green. This light green is pretty notorious for being very fragile. And if you have a light green action figure, you probably have some broken parts, like Zap's broken thumbs here. The figures with the light green were Stalker, who was camouflaged, but his base color was the light green, Stealer, and of course Zap. The figures with the medium green were Short Fuse, Hawk, Clutch, Flash, Grunt, and Breaker. The figures with the dark green were Rock and Roll and Grand Slam. Of these 11 figures, only one had a unique head, and that was Stalker, who had a beret and a mustache. None of the other figures had that. The other figures reused three different heads, sometimes repainting the hair so they'd look different, but sometimes they didn't even do that. So some of the figures had the same head and exactly the same hair. The first head had kind of a passive expression. It was a slightly younger face, uh, and that head was used for Short Fuse and Hawk, who both had blonde hair, and Flash and Steeler, who both had brown hair. The second head was the bearded head, and three figures share that head. There was Breaker with the brown hair and beard, Clutch with the black hair and beard, and Rock and Roll with the blonde hair and beard. The third head had a slightly older looking face with a more severe expression, and three figures shared that head. One was Zap, who had black hair, and Grunt and Grand Slam, who both had brown hair. To complicate matters even further, each of these 1982 G.I. Joe action figures was re-released in 1983, but with some differences. The main difference was a new point of articulation in 1983. In 1982, for example, Breaker here had a hinge at the elbow, so he could move his arm at the elbow like that. But in 1983, he was re-released with a new hinge at the bicep. He could still move his arm at the elbow, but he could also swivel his arm all the way around at the bicep. This was referred to as swivel arm battle grip, or just swivel arm, and the original articulation without that hinge at the elbow was referred to as straight arm articulation. There were some other subtle differences between 1982 and 1983. Although most of the parts were the same, they actually changed the waist piece. In 1982, they had this thicker waist piece with the kind of H-shaped belt buckle. 
And in 1983, they had a slimmer waist piece with a more detailed belt. In 1982, the G.I. Joe figures that had long sleeves had pockets on the sides of their arms. In 1983, when they were re-released with swivel arm battle grip, that pocket was moved from the side of the arm to the front. In 1982, G.I. Joe had two action figures with red pads like this, and on their arms they had a sculpted on checker pattern uh, that was the same color as the pads on his chest. But in 1983, when they released the swivel arm battle grip, those pads on the arms were just painted on. There was no sculpting detail at all. One very subtle change between 1982 and 1983 was the hole in the back of the action figure. Uh, this was the hole that held the screw that held the entire action figure together, but it was also the hole in which the backpacks would fit with the peg. But those holes were subtly different between 1982 and 1983 to accommodate different size pegs in the backpack. The 1982 backpacks had kind of a, a thicker and stubbier peg, and the 1983 backpacks had a, a longer and thinner peg with kind of a curved edge at the end. The figures had three standard chest pieces. The first was the piece with the two long straps like this, and they had a sculpted on grenade and a knife. In the back, they kind of came to a V shape or a Y shape. And the figures that shared that chest were Stalker, Hawk, Breaker, and Grunt. Another standard chest was the one with these short shoulder straps. Uh, you can see that they have a strap that goes between them across the chest. And in the back, uh, they come to this kind of X pattern. The figures that shared that chest were Short Fuse and Zap. Of course, Short Fuse had black straps and Zap had brown straps. The third standard chest for 1982 G.I. Joe action figures was the padded chest, and this causes a lot of confusion. The two that had the padded chest were Flash and Grand Slam, and as you can see, they have these same colored pads, and that causes a lot of people to mix up these two action figures. In addition to the standard chests, the 1982 G.I. Joe had three unique chest pieces. They belonged to Steeler, clutch, and rock and roll. Steeler's unique chest piece has this weapon, this uh, pistol with a black strap. You can see how it comes together on the back, so his back piece was unique as well. Clutch also had a pistol sculpted on to his chest, but with different straps. He had shoulder pads and this kind of brown uh, lining on his jacket, and you can see how that carried along to the back as well. And then most distinctive was Rock and Roll, who had a pair of gold bandoliers crisscrossed across his chest and his back. There were two standard sets of legs, and the main one was this one, which just had a pocket on either side and a pair of boots. But the other standard pair of legs was shared also, again, by Flash and Grand Slam. It had their pads on the thighs, and it had uh, coverings on their boots. The figures had three standard sets of arms. They had the rolled up sleeves, which was shared by Clutch, Breaker, and Rock and Roll. They had the long sleeves, which was shared by Stalker, Short Fuse, Grunt, Hawk, and Zap. The third standard set of arms was another part shared between Grand Slam and Flash. They were the gloved arms, and as I said, in 1982 they had these sculpted on pads on the shoulders which were just painted on in 1983. And they had one unique set of arms, and that was owned by Steeler. His arms were not shared by any other action figure. Now I know this is a lot to take in, and I've thrown around a bunch of names, so you might still be a little bit confused. So I'm going to go through each of these figures and point out the one or two special differences that will allow you to instantly know which action figure you have. Let's start with the figure that's maybe the most difficult to identify because he's the most generic. This is Grunt. He has standard long sleeve arms, standard legs, standard chest, 
uh, and he has this uh, head with the brown hair that he shares with Grand Slam. But you can pick out Grunt fairly easily because he is the only figure that used these long straps with the head that had the older looking face. Stalker should not be that difficult to identify. Of course, he is the black guy, but in case you're colorblind, you can look for his beret. And he, of course, is the only one that had camouflage. So if you see a camouflage pattern, that's got to be Stalker. Another figure that should be pretty easy to identify is Rock and Roll. You're going to quickly identify Rock and Roll by his gold bandoliers and his blonde hair and beard. He was the only one of the bearded action figures to have blonde hair. One that may be difficult to identify is Hawk, because he looks so much like Short Fuse. But Hawk is the only one that had this shiny metallic silver paint on his long straps. So look for the silver and you will know that you have a Hawk action figure. In contrast, Short Fuse, even though he had the younger looking face and the blonde hair like Hawk, he had the short black straps with the black strap between them on his chest, uh, and he was the only blonde action figure to have that type of strap. Clutch may sometimes be confused with Breaker, but you're going to know Clutch right away because he's the only one of the bearded action figures that had black hair, and he has a unique chest piece with the gun molded onto his chest. Breaker had brown hair and a beard, and he was the only one of the bearded action figures to have the standard long strap chest. We now come to Zap, who should be fairly easy to identify. He had a very light green color, brown straps, and he was the only one of the figures to have this older looking face with black hair. We now come to the two figures that are probably the most difficult to distinguish because they shared essentially all parts between them except for the head. And even though they had different heads, they had exactly the same hair color. So it's easy to mix these two up. To complicate matters even further, there was a second issue of Grand Slam in 1983 that had silver pads. Now the 1983 issue of Grand Slam is going to be much easier to identify because he has silver pads, and Flash was never issued with silver pads. But the 1982 version, you are going to distinguish between Flash by looking for the black gloves and the black boots. Also, Grand Slam's green color was darker than Flash's. Now, of course, you can look for the different head sculpt, but mainly, look at the gloves and the boots. Grand Slam has black boots, Flash has brown boots. Flash, I said, is only distinguishable from Grand Slam by his head sculpt, the base color of his plastic, which was the medium green, and brown gloves and brown boots. At last, that brings us to Steeler. And Steeler was the only one of the figures with the light green plastic to have the younger looking face with the more passive expression. He did share a head entirely with Flash, including his hair color, but you're going to distinguish him from Flash because he did not have the red pads like Flash did. Steeler actually had more unique parts than most of the other action figures. He had unique arms and a unique chest and back piece. So look for the light green plastic with the gun on the chest and a gold undershirt under the green overshirt. There you have it. We have looked at all of the standard parts that were reused for these 11 action figures. Fortunately, in 1983, G.I. Joe released a bunch of new characters that looked entirely different from these guys and shared a lot fewer parts between them. But this 1982 reissue of G.I. Joe, uh, Hasbro wasn't quite sure if this uh, toy line was going to take off, so they went the cheap route. They reused the same mold for a lot of different figures. And it's understandable, especially for relatively new collectors, that you get confused between who is whom. So if you get confused and you want to know how to identify your 1982 and your 1983 variants of the 1982 figures, uh, just refer to this video, uh, play it back, and uh, you'll never get confused. And you know, with a little bit of time, with a little bit of practice, you'll be able to identify these action figures at a glance. 
Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe because I've got a lot of great new G.I. Joe toy and comic book reviews coming up and you do not want to miss them. I'll catch you all later. Welcome to the Hooded Cobra Commander 788 channel and welcome to my first ever G.I. Joe action figure review. We are going to be reviewing Breaker today. Uh, but before I get started, I did want to say a few words. Um, first of all, there are other G.I. Joe action figure reviewers on YouTube and of course they'll do a much better job than, uh, than I will. They're much more experienced collectors than I am. Uh, but it looks like fun and I've wanted to do it for a while so today I thought I'd give it a spin. Um, before we get into reviewing Breaker here, um, uh, I wanted to make a few comments about myself. I am uh, a relatively new collector. Um, I haven't been doing this for a long time. I did get um, G.I. Joe action figures when I was a kid and I enjoyed them very much. I've only recently rediscovered them as an adult and as an, a, a collector. Um, so I'm not a very experienced collector and I'm sure the more experienced guys out there will uh, have plenty to say and pl plenty to correct me about, and that's fine. That's how we learn. Um, uh, a comment on my collection. My collection, the scope of my collection is uh, fairly limited. Um, I am not looking for uh, mint on card figures or mint in box um, vehicles. Uh, for me, a, a complete item for my collection will be a figure or the vehicle. Um, with all of the parts or accessories uh, unbroken uh, and with the file card if, if there's a, a figure involved. Um, so to me, uh, or for my purposes, that is what I'm looking for for a complete entry into the collection. So as you might imagine, I have a lot of incomplete um, figures and vehicles that I'm still working on completing. Uh, and one of those figures is Breaker here. I actually do not have Breaker's file card. I will pick that up eventually. Um, it's not high on my uh, agenda, but, um, but eventually I will complete this figure. But I wanted to review Breaker first for a couple reasons. First of all, um, uh, Breaker is not thoroughly reviewed by other reviewers. You, you don't see a whole lot of reviews of Breaker and it's it's not hard to see why. He's a pretty plain character, but most importantly uh, Breaker was the first ever G.I. Joe action figure that I got as a kid. Now this is not my original one. Um, that one was misplaced or broken long long ago, uh, probably um, about 30 years ago. Um, but there's a lot of nostalgia for me uh, in this Breaker action figure. And uh, so I wanted to tackle him first. Um, now, uh, Breaker came out in 1982. Uh, and in 1982, I would have been seven years old, which is the perfect age. That's the, like the target uh, age for these action figures. I really, they really came out at the perfect time for me to get into them and to love them and to uh, want to get a lot of them. Uh, and I remember uh, the first wave that came out, and I remember that I got the first few uh, action figures with these uh, straight arms, like um, like Breaker here. Um, these arms have this point of articulation at the elbows, um, but they don't don't have the swivel um, the swivel arm battle grip that came out in the following year. And I remember how much um, uh, I how happy I was that they added a swivel at the uh, at the elbow because uh, it was it was a little bit awkward to pose some of these and to for some of the figures to carry their weapons uh, but uh, for collecting purposes I wanted to start out getting the actual first figure that I got as a kid which would have been the straight arm 1982 breaker and that's the guy we're going to be looking at today now um, breaker as you can see, is pretty plain. Uh, he shares a lot of parts with um, others in the 1982 uh, series. Uh, the chest piece was shared by Hawk and Grunt, and the the waist and legs were shared by almost all of the 1982 
uh, series. Um, his head was shared by by rock and roll here. Rock and roll had uh, blonde beard and hair, and uh, and of course Clutch, uh, who had black hair and a black beard. Uh, but it's the same sculpt. It's it's the same head, just painted a different color. Um, Breaker came with some accessories. He came with his helmet and the detachable communications headset, which had a wire that connected to his communications backpack. Now, um, Breaker didn't come with any uh, guns, um, and which I think is a little bit odd. But one thing that uh, works for his favor with not having any handheld guns is that he goes great with the vehicle that came out at the time, the 1982 Ram motorcycle, which with its pretty awesome side Gatling gun. Now, I remember as a kid, the TV commercial that, um, I, th I think the first commercial that I saw um, was uh, with Breaker on the Ram motorcycle. Um, and since he doesn't have a gun himself, I think he works well with on the motorcycle. He can still wear his communications backpack and his helmet. And he can talk to headquarters as he's buzzing around and uh, mowing down the enemy with his side gun. Uh, one odd choice um, is uh, was in the um, comic book. Rock and Roll was paired with the motorcycle. In fact, there's a, a, a scene in the first issue of the G.I. Joe comic book in which... Uh, Rock and Roll refers to the Ram motorcycle as his motorcycle. Uh, of course, Rock and Roll did not come with the Ram motorcycle, um, but I, I really think that Breaker is a better choice. Um, Rock and Roll, he has this really massive uh, machine gun. Um, now I'm missing the bipod on it, unfortunately. That's another piece that I'll have to pick up in order to complete this figure. But um, but he, he has a gun, and if he's riding the motorcycle, there's not really a good place to, to store the gun, to stow the gun. Um, so I really think that Breaker's the better choice here uh, for, for the Ram motorcycle. Uh, and that's the, way, that's the way I like to, like to set him up. Now, um, Breaker, as I said, is not complete um, because he does not have his file card, but... There are reasons that, for me to suspect that he's not complete for other reasons. Um, and I'm going to point them out, and perhaps uh, a skilled collector uh, can uh, give me some answers on this. And, um, you know, it'll be a learning opportunity for me. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, maybe we can all learn together. Um, one reason, one thing that's odd about this... Uh, breaker action figure is, let me get in closer, he has a silver painted uh, grenade on his shirt. Now, uh, pretty much all versions of Breaker that I have found um, have a an unpainted grenade. It's just green, the same color as his shirt. Um, it is possible that a previous owner painted this. Um, it's maybe it's a, a, a foreign version uh, that has been cobbled together into uh, this, you know, allegedly original 1982 um, version of Breaker. But I do not know. I do not know where that silver uh, hand grenade comes from. Uh, when again, most of the time, I see an unpainted hand grenade on these Breaker action figures. Now, I'm not particularly bothered by it. Um, I will uh, eventually pick up another breaker, probably several of them. Uh, and I do eventually want to get the swivel arm uh, breaker. Um, so for display purposes and for my purposes right now, this is completely adequate. Um, but I just would like to know exactly why that thing is silver. I, I do not know. 
Another thing um, that doesn't seem to fit is the backpack. The there was a a change between 1982 and 1983. The 1982 action figures Lightbreaker were re-released in 1983 with the swivel arm battle, battle grip, as I said. And I don't have an example of Breaker with the swivel arm battle grip, but I do have Clutch here from 1983, who shared the same arms, and you can see his swivel arm here. That's it would have been basically the same thing for the 1983 Breaker. But another thing that changed were the backpacks. Um, the pegs in the backpacks were different, and I'll, I have an example from the actual 1982 Grunt. Let me pull your backpack out, Grunt. And let's look at these uh, look at these backpack pegs. You can see that the actual 1982 uh, pegs are a bit um, bigger, kind of thicker, a little shorter, and have they have a flattened uh, top on them, whereas the 1983 ones were a bit rounded, so I, I and, and a bit longer and a bit thinner, and so that, I think that this is a 1983 backpack, not 1982. Um, an additional problem with that, though, is that it, it fits pretty well in this back, uh, in the uh, the hole that is supposed to hold the backpacks, whereas the actual 1982 backpack. Does not does not fit well at all. It, it, I can kind of force it in there, but but it doesn't stay, um, which is weird. Um, so that's another reason why I think that this chest piece comes from something else, and I don't know what. Um, but th like I said, this backpack I'm, I'm pretty certain is a 1983. So in order to complete this figure, first of all I need to figure out what's up with this uh, chest and back piece. Uh, and I need to get an actual 1983 backpack, so I will eventually do that. For the time being, anyway, I want to uh, point out a couple of things that I don't care for about our breaker here. Um, I do like him with the Ram motorcycle, as I said. I don't mind that he doesn't have uh, any handheld weapons. I just dropped Grunt's backpack. Um, I'll pick that up in a minute. Um, but one thing that I that does bother me about this setup here with his his headset and, and the wire is that the the hole for the wire is over here on one side, um, and it tends to pull his head he, um, that direction or the opposite direction. I you know if you try to have him look straight forward, um, the the wire ma tends to make him you know look to the I guess his right, um, uh, or his, yeah, his left, I mean. Um, so th I think these wires, uh, uh, several of the figures had accessories that had this kind of wire that plugged into the backpack. I really wish they had done something different with them, uh, perhaps made them more rubbery, uh, perhaps um, uh, made them longer, I don't know. But, um, but I had a... A hard time with that as a kid and I still have a hard time with it. Some people just keep it unplugged and that's fine. Uh, sometimes you know it kind of use it as an antenna or something but I don't think it actually looks very good as an antenna even when it's straight and not curved like this. Um, plus I, I think it's just it just looks right plugged into the backpack. Um, but as I said um, yeah we've got He's less posable with the thing on and with it uh, plugged in. He he wants to wants to look off in one direction. Um, as all of the nineteen or all of really the eighties GI Joe action figures, except for one, uh, the nineteen eighty two and eighty three Scarlet had uh, foot pegs uh, or holes for foot pegs, uh, so that you could uh, stand them up and I've. Uh, uh, Put him on his figure stand here. Um, oh, there's Grunt's backpack. Uh, put him on this figure stand. Uh, they did not come with figure stands at the time. Um, you, we got figure stands with the um, accessory packs that came out. I think they first came out in '83. Um, but that's how you got the, the figure stands. And we, when playing with them, we didn't generally use the figure stands, but 
Um, occasionally they were nice to have if we were going to have a figure that was just going to be standing up and we didn't want to prop him up against something. They certainly do stand better. I mean, you can stand them up without the figure stand, um, but they're a little bit precarious, especially when you're a kid and, you know, you're doing an action scene. They get knocked over pretty easily. Um, but I can tell you that the figure stands got lost uh, frequently. Um, and, I, and, I, and I can tell you that, like, this, um, this headset probably... Uh, as a kid, I probably lost that pretty quickly. Um, if, if you hear a, a howling in the background, that is not a werewolf. That is the large dog in my backyard that is uh, howling at the neighbors, I guess. Um, anyway, I think that's where I'm going to wrap it up. Um, 1982 Straight Arm Breaker, uh, my first G.I. Joe action figure. Um, we have some things to learn about him. Uh, and we have some things to get uh, for him in order to make him complete. But I wanted to make this my first ever action figure review. There's, this, is the, this is the first one for me. Um, the first one as a kid, and when I started collecting again, it's the first one I got as an adult. Uh, thank you for watching. Um, I look forward to reading your comments. Um, and if any of you have any knowledge about uh, the 1982 Straight Arm Breaker that would help me answer some of my questions, I would appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'm picking up a Cobra plane on radar. Attack! Cobra! We got no cover here, rock and roll. We've got to bail. I'll get us some cover. We've captured the G.I. Joe anti-aircraft gun. Cobra bombers can take out their command center. Flash to breaker, flash to breaker. Cobra has taken the flak. We need some help over here. Copy that, Flash. I'm on my way.
Scratch one. That's why you don't wear blue for a jungle op, dummy. This is the XMLR-1A shoulder-fired laser rifle. It is the most powerful handheld laser currently in existence. It is powered by a high-density battery in the backpack. As you've seen from the demonstration, it takes about one second of focus on a single spot in order to get a full burn. That is hard to do on close-range targets and impossible to do on long-range targets. But the laser oh, is quieter yeah, than conventional baby. firearms nice. and it can slip through shot. armor plate. So it will give us some advantages in the field. To get the kind of instant destructive power you see in the movies, a laser would need a power source far larger than a man could carry. For that kind of laser, I direct you to my buddy Grand Slam and the HAL. The heavy artillery laser is capable of instant lacing through armor plate. The radar control can track the movement of vehicles and take out aircraft in flight. It is designed to be towed behind a vehicle, and it has the kind of massive power source that is impossible to miniaturize in the handheld laser. It is about 100 times more powerful than Flash's laser rifle. Attention, Joes. Colonel Hawk, I hate to interrupt the demonstration of the new equipment, but I just got a top-secret communication from General Flagg at the Pentagon. The G.I. Joe team has its first mission. I want to see everyone in the briefing room in five minutes. Yo, Joe. Yo, Joe! Easy does it now. You're gonna be... Uh, all right. Joe's. Poor devils. They, they must have got caught in one of Cobra's weapons test. Steinberg L? Well, that, that's Clutch's name. Graves? R.W.? <laughs> Graves? That's you, Grunt! Yeah, well, I know I ain't dead. Hey, these guys must have been the Joe team from this world. Yeah. That's it. That one. Who's that one? Pulaski. It's me. Me! thermal arrow no further if you shoot you'll hit your friend step into the clear destro if you've got the guts <laughs> i have no time for childish games i intend to deliver a healthy supply of the meteorite to cobra and scarlet 
Women can't serve in combat. Their menstruations will attract bears. Now that that's over, this guy is going right back in a case. Makes me nervous just touching this. There he is, where he will probably be entombed for all time.
fight for freedom wherever there's trouble. G.I. Joe is there. G.I. Joe. He'll stay till the fight's won. Get 